Good afternoon, Salt Lake City. We have we have a quorum, and the rest are tri trickling in from the back room. Um, today is May twenty third. Our we are a work session only today. Uh, welcome to our council meeting. These are all public meetings, and the public is welcome to join us in person or by watching from the council's agenda page, Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. So please continue to join in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. Today is work session only. There is no public comment. Our next opportunity for public comment will be on June 6th during our 7 p.m. formal meeting. Um, you can al also always, of course, share your feedback by mail at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah, 84114, or emailing council.comments at slcgov.com, or via our 24-hour phone comment line, 801-535-7654. Any written comments that we receive with anything related to the agenda is shared and recorded, shared with the whole council and recorded on our website at slccouncil.com. So that starts our work session. Our first item is informational updates from the administration. I see Weston, Andrew. Um, are you first, Weston? I am, I think. Hey. Yes. Weston yeah. Clark with Mayor's office. Thanks, Council. Um, very quick update for you all on the uh, engagement in the city. Um, next slide. Um, of course, we are going to drill this into every head in the city that go to the feedback page. But if you would like to engage on any uh, engagement projects that the city is working on, we are constantly trying to collect all of them there. Um, if anyone ever sees one that's not there, let me know. We'll get it on there. Next slide. Um, this is just a quick reminder that the voting for Ballpark Next ends on May 25th. So we have a couple days left in order to vote for your favorites. Uh, so don't forget to do that. Next slide. Is it midnight on May 25th? May 25th. What did, I, did I say May 9th? Uh, midnight, I mean. Oh, at midnight. Yes, it is at midnight. Okay. Yes. 11.59, oh. I think, on the 25th. 11.59. Yeah. Okay. Get your votes in, people. <laughs> and 59 seconds, if they're probably being <laughs> precise. Which they probably are, because they're... Because it's a computer. Uh, yeah. Um, and then uh, the community office hours for my team, the, the last left are uh, today, uh, Jollies, um, which I don't know if we ever clarified, Councilmember Mana, that it was... You did uh, last oh, week. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you for... Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Glendale Library on May 24th. Next slide. Um, summer is heating up. Uh, this is just through the first weekend of uh, June. And uh, of course... This is not all inclusive. Uh, I always want to give that caveat. Uh, we try to collect the ones that are city sponsored ACE uh, events and publicly permitted events, but obviously there's a ton of private events that happen all the time. Um, uh, Pride Festival is uh, June 1st through 4th. Downtown Farmers Market starts, International Market. This is the second event, the African American Heritage on the third. Um, so there's lots to do in the city. Um, so it is exciting. We'll keep bringing those to you through the summer. So you'll be updated. And that is it for me. Thank you, Weston. Next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't change winter overflow again. I apologize. The resource centers are still running at very high capacity, 100% the last week, uh, again, second week in a row, uh, to be anticipated since the, the closure of the other beds uh, from the winter time. Uh, the encampment impact mitigation work this week is going to be in the western industrial areas and rental Rio Tinto property and also the lower elevation of Victory Road, which is a pretty standard thing in the springtime for us there. And then still a lot of camps in the city, as you can see, and in ongoing engagement at a lot of those camps. Uh, the bottom one, which seems to be a cut off there, I apologize. Um, bicycle court was on the May 19th at Guadalupe Bridge, which is really fifth west in North Temple um, area and uh, 12. I wanna give you a verbal update as well about the uh, process for next winter overflow and some ongoing work there. Uh, the first meeting of that task group though, to, which is formed with the legislation uh, this year, met last week. Yes, last week. And they've got several things they're working on. One is a physical location, second is the funding, and third is the operations uh, plans for that. Again, the goal is to have 600 uh, beds for next winter available, plus 
another 200 beds, which are able to be stood up in case of code blue emergencies. So we're basically 800 beds total. Uh, there's going to need to be a lot of work done on that, obviously, and a short amount of time since the deadline is August 1st to that, have that submitted to the state. And at that point, the state Office of Homeless Services also has the ability to uh, accept or reject whatever plan is provided. Um, if it's not feasible in their view, they could reject it and go to state preemption, uh, which would change the process slightly, just like this year. Uh, we'll have more updates as we go forward in the next few weeks for you all on that. Thank you, Andrew. That's all. All right, appreciate that. Any more administrative updates for today? Thank you so much for being here every week and for sharing all of those that great information with the public. Um, oh, yes. Oh, technical issues. We are on a two minute break, but redo that. Did we? You. Oh, I don't know. I don't think so. Like it never happened. If they have to redo that based on the technical issues. I could do it better. You want to redo? <laughs> do they need to redo their presentation? You want to swap? Yeah, that'd be helpful. Okay. Sorry, I'll be more clear. The technical issues are that the audio is coming chopped and that we don't have YouTube running. So we're just correcting those two issues. I don't believe you'd need to redo it as the recording went through clearly on Zoom. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Andrew. Andrew. Just to let you know that I'm on that winter task force overflow, uh, winter overflow task force with the COG and Mayor Hall from Bluffdale is the chair of it. So I'll keep Thanks. you informed on what we're doing. Thanks, Councilmember Dugan. We have to have a decision by the end of July for that first of October, uh, August uh, due date deadline. Okay, great. Well, let us keep, yeah, keep us informed. Yeah. Thank you for your work with the COG. We work on some technical difficulties and we will be back. We've just lost full audio. So if I could have five minutes, I'm sorry. Thank you. I think we can continue so we don't get too far behind. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, oh, no, Victoria is joining virtually. So uh, Councilmember Petro needed to step out for an appointment. So she is joining virtually. Um, I actually need to be recused from item number two because uh, my business has a relationship with this project. So, and since Count Vice Chair Vic, uh, Victoria Petro is not here, Councilmember Wharton will chair this item. Ooh. Hello. Glad to be here. Um, I, hold on, let me just, uh, um, find where we're at on the script here. Okay, so item number two is a rezone at approximately 1350, 1358, and 1370 Southwest Temple. And um, with us at the table for this briefing are Brian Fulmer, uh, Council Policy Analyst, and Annette Larson, the Principal Planner. Um, if you want to give us an introduction to this issue, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's a proposal to amend the zoning map for the property you mentioned from their current RB or residential business zoning designation to TSA UCC or Transit Station Area Urban Center Core. The petitioner's stated objective is to consolidate the parcels, remove the current structures and construct a multi-use, I'm sorry, a mixed use development with residential units above ground floor retail. The petitioner is joining us online and is available for questions the council may have. And with that, I will turn it over to Nanette Larson. From planning. Right. Thank you, Brian, and uh, thank you, Council. 
The planning commission, or excuse me, the planning division received a request for a zoning map amendment from the property owner, Sitar uh, Tabriz, on the three subject sites located at 1350, 1358, and 1370 Southwest Temple. Uh, next slide, please. The three sites are presently within the residential business district. The applicant is requesting to amend the sites to the transit station area urban center core zoning district. The proposed amendment was reviewed against the applicable master plans of the central community ballpark station area in Plan Salt Lake. Planning Commission heard the requested amendments on January 11th earlier this year and forwarded a recommendation to the council to approve the rezone with one condition. Uh, that recommended condition of approval is that a development agreement is recorded on the 1350 South site that ensures the replacement of a residential dwelling within two years of demolition. Uh, after the Planning Commission's recommended uh, recommendation, the applicant informs city staff that the type of construction, th because the type of construction that they're proposing, um, the replacement unit wouldn't be possible within that two-year time frame. Uh, so they're proposing eventually a stick on podium, which takes about 30 months uh, to construct. Um, so instead, attached to the transmittal uh, that was sent to council is a development agreement that would ensure the replacement of the housing unit um, when the site is developed, but a time frame is not set in that development agreement. So it's a little bit different than what the condition, the recommended condition, um, the planning commission forwarded. And next slide, please. The existing zoning map reflects an area around the ballpark stadium that's in transition to the north of the subject site is also a residential um, residential business district across West Temple Street is the stadium, of course, uh, to the west is General Commercial and to the south is RMU that houses a seven story multifamily residential structure and next slide. While the sites are located within both the central community and the recently adopted ballpark station area plan, the station area plan will take precedence as the ballpark plan is a small, small area plan that addresses the ballpark community more directly than the larger central community master plan. The ballpark station area plans future land use map designates the three properties as part of the heart of the neighborhood. Um, yeah, we're on the right slide. As part of the right, uh, heart of the neighborhood and ballpark entertainment district, this designation describes this area as appropriate for a transit station area zoning district and an area that's appropriate for higher density redevelopment due to its proximity to the light rail station and the stadium. And next slide. As part of the ballpark station area is the creation of the Festival Street on West Temple. This Festival Street will extend from 1300 South to Albemarle Avenue. Um, all of the subjects properties front along this Festival Street designation. And next slide. The planning division is working on zoning map amendments in the larger area to begin implementing this station area plan. As part of the recent approval of the bar ballpark station area plan, which occurred in December, uh, updating the zoning map is ongoing. Late January, a recommended zoning district for the properties surrounding the stadium was determined to be what is shown on this slide. Um, the subject sites are included in this and are expected um, or at least proposed at this time uh, to be within the transit station area urban neighborhood core zoning district. Staff is still rec uh, working on these amendments um, and the specific zoning district may change. There may be updates to the zoning text as far as building height um, where there could be other amendments as we continue to work on this proposal. Um, the major difference between the TSA UCC and the TSA UNC is the maximum building height. The TSA UCC, which is what the applicant is requesting um, and which the planning commission heard, the maximum building height is 90 feet. 
the TSA UNC um, has a maximum building height of 75 feet. And next slide. Now this request went to the Ballpark Community Council um, late last year, um, and it received a number of comments from the community uh, for the proposed rezone. Most of the discussion centered around preservation of these two structures that are shown on this slide. Uh, these structures are the 1350 and 1358 South properties. While both of these structures are over 100 years old, neither are um, protected through a either a preservation easement or through a local historic district. Uh, because neither historic structure is protected, we can't require that the property owner uh, keep them due to their historic nature. Um, and retaining the existing zoning district residential business wouldn't ensure their preservation anyway. And next slide. So I can take any questions uh, that the council may have for me and the applicant, uh, Sitar Tabriz, and I believe Brian Scott are also um, available through Zoom for any questions. Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Just, just a question on the uh, activation of the ground floor. What's the specifics on the activation? So I know we've had some discussions on what that actually entails as far as businesses on that ground floor of the of the, the, the business structure. What's, what is allowed or, uh, or what is permitted? I believe the ground floor, the active ground floor use in the TSA district is 80%. So 80%, so small businesses, but also a leasing office or other things that are not really uh, street activated, is that also allowed? Right now that's what's allowed is an active ground floor use. Okay. Yeah, because I think we wanted businesses more than just like, I'm looking at Councilman Puglia on the business side of the house of small business activation of the street level by say leasing office or of a, an office built spot. Yes, Councilman Puglia. Thank you, ahead. Mr. Chair. I Yeah, I was kind of disappointed to see uh, that uh, being uh, street activation because it isn't. And uh, um, I, I'm disappointed to see that even though they're allowed to do that, um, it's, it's not what, uh, it, it doesn't activate the street at all. So as an amenity for the, for the tenants, but not for anybody else in the community. So, yeah. Mr. Chair, go ahead. So Nanette, um, one of the houses right now is used as a private library and the other house is vacant or is it still used as a residence for someone? Um, at the time I talked to the applicant about it um, late last year, there was still, I believe there was still someone living there. Okay. Um, I, and it, it was the property owner that had owned it before the applicant. Um, my understanding was that she was in the process of moving out. Of moving out, okay. Um, and we, so obviously I think we have a few, I have a few issues here. One would be if we're displacing somebody um, um, that might be paying somewhat of an affordable price. Um, I don't know. Um, but if that's the case, I would like to see some um, affordable housing in the project to replace that. The other thing that I don't want to happen that was mentioned already, uh, two things I don't want to happen. One, that is not as active as it could be because we're working really hard for a ballpark to to you know to make it happen and so i am not sure what the method is or if it has to be in a development agreement we've done it with other projects where we ask them to have a plan for some sort of an economic development um activation component for the bottom floor and then second what's happened also and i don't want it to happen is that we rezone this we say yes and then they maybe demolish or not demolish. They, you know, everybody moves out from these two units and then they're vacant for a long time. And then we have issues and then we have fires and then we have um, 
you know all of the all of the bad activities that may happen in that in that area and so um i would like to see some sort of a time limit for the for the development of this um and if not i'm not sure what i don't sure what we can do but um I'm not sure. I'm not sure what could be in the development agreement or where else we can do. Maybe we need to check with the attorney's office. But I don't. I, again, I don't want this two properties be sitting there vacant, and then council member Mano and all of us have a million emails, uh, you know, about issues that we applied for. And, I mean, that we approved, and now it's not happening. So, three things: activation, um, time limit, and. Um, the affordable housing unit, if we're displacing anybody, can we check on that? Thank you. So maybe I just wanted, uh, Mr. Chair, on the uh, activation side of the house, if there would be something in the a development agreement about the activation of the street levels so that it would be more uh, local business activated advice. Um, I, I keep on using the word leasing office activation, but um, more local business street activation on the, on the ground level of the floor. Um, instead of saying an office where someone just goes, walks into an office and it's just a small office, but something that's activating the street level. I'm sorry, I missed the beginning no, of that. that. Did you want to ask the applicant yeah, maybe or we, are you asking me if that's possible? If we could put that part in a, a development agreement with the, with the applicant, if um, that is possible. I know that we can ask for a um, specific types of uses yes. uh, through a development agreement. And we can also place a time limit on development as well through a development agreement, um, whether that's something the applicant is willing to do. Um, I haven't asked him yet. Um, well, he'll be, he'll be on here in a second so we can ask. And then the same things about the mix of department sizes and AMI. So we'll ask him that also. He'll probably give it to us. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay, um, let's go ahead and hear then from the applicant. Yes. So, um, um, under our um, rules, we typically give the applicant five minutes um, to comment. So, um, let me know when you're ready, and we'll we will start the timer. Um, you're, I think you're on mute still, sir. Am I good now? Yes, you can hear you now. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Satar Tabriz. Uh, I am the developer, but I also have a partner that who is not present here. We like to take notes on all the suggestions. We welcome those suggestions. And we'll go back to the drawing board with my architect who is here next door to me. Uh, Brian Scott, I'd like to have him to explain some of the concerns and questions that have been raised. Okay. Hi, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, so I think um, we are, like Sitar mentioned, we're definitely open to all of those possibilities. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say, um, no, one's, no one's being displaced. Um, the, the woman who previously lived there actually left because of the issues of, of crime and kind of the neighborhood. Um, at, she was an older woman and she just you know, there were there were those kinds of issues already, and that's what has um, that's why she has decided to move somewhere else. And so um, we're really hoping to get something in there that will help and fix that. Um, and we're definitely open to doing some kind of um, more interactive, public facing um, activation along that street. Um, we know that it's part of the ballpark plan that that uh that that becomes the festival street and that's part of what we're kind of planning to design in there for and so um we'd be happy to to look at that as well um i think those were the main um main concerns i heard um sorry 
<clears throat> council, it appears there we have audio. Thank you. Uh, did I get lost for a second or? Yeah, we've been having some audio issues today. So if you want to just go back about 15 seconds. Uh, uh, I think the last 15 seconds was just me thinking if there was anything else. So I don't, I don't think I missed anything. <laughs> okay, great. Just back to the, the, the house and the condition of it. Uh, Miss Sandra Tanner, who has already left the house, but he is just in the process of packing the bookstore and being out of there. Uh, we're obviously going to have all the security system in place, the utilities and all that. I've uh, uh, been very fortunate to have a neighbor who is on the south side of the apartment building. He's a real estate agent and his son just came from mission. He's willing to do the house sitting for me for a year or two, as long as it takes, and just have some presence there taking care of the yard and being present there. As for the bookstore, it's a beautiful space for something. So we're looking for a short term lease just to keep that place occupied and active until we get the building underway, which takes a little bit. And uh, obviously at some point, both buildings and the 1370 South would be need to be taken out to allow the construction. But until then, we'll do our best to keep it as safe as possible for us and for the neighbor. And could you tell us the mix of the apartments, sizes, apartment sizes? Um, I, let me see if I can pull that up quickly. One second. Mr. Chair? Yes. While we're waiting, I think there was also a question about whether there would be affordable units in the proposed development, and I'm not sure that question was answered, so maybe the applicant could address that yes, once please. he gets the mix of units. Yes, please. Thank you. So um, we were looking at um, studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms. I don't have the exact you're asking like the percentages for each kind of split? Yeah, just just numbers in general on the size that, you know, between studios and three bedrooms and, and uh, if there's any affordable units, affordable housing units there at different AMIs. Gotcha. Um, so the two bedrooms that we were looking at were about 900 square feet and the studios um, ranged down to about, uh, we had one stack of the smallest studios was 400. Um, so that's kind of the range that the size was in. And it's mostly one and two bedrooms and then some studios. Um, and then Sitar can speak to affordability. I know it's something that we're definitely open to. We've talked about with other developer development partners. So, And that's exactly right. And in fact, we are in the process of conversation with some developers who are going to be partners with us or independent from us, we, we just we working those out. And they're only, you know, that's big for them. The affordable housing side of the things is very big for them. And if there's something that we could agree on and to make the council comfortable that it, it will be considered and perhaps even taken care of, we are happy to do. Uh, we, we, ju we just want to have a, a project that it's just not good for one or the other. It's good for the community and the area. I've office there for almost 30 years in the, that corner office, and I've run an engineering company there, and I have a very great fund of the area, and I want to do something which is going to be good for the community. And eyes on the, you know, we used to have a lot of, burglary on the cars and stuff because after the hour you know everybody goes home and there are no eyes on the 
neighborhood. And I think projects like this, we hope it's going to help. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions for the applicant? Um, I'll just state that I um, had the same thoughts um, as all my colleagues have expressed and um, continue to have those concerns. Um, we have a lot of um, plans, well, I wouldn't say firm plans, but um, we've just, there's been a lot of discussion about that street being a festival street um, and that being integral to um, the transformation of that neighborhood. And um, I'm concerned that that this particular project might not be adding to that um, with the, the, without the activation on the street and um, without a little bit more um, adding a little bit more to the type of housing stock that we need. I'm not saying that I've made a decision yet, but those are major concerns for me. All right, anything else on this? Council Member Wharton, I want to add my voice to that too. Particularly Council Member Baltimore since we're trying to come around this length of time. I can't. Um, until I we activation. Council Member Petro. Yes. I apologize. We just couldn't hear you very clearly. There was some background noise. better now? A little. Um, yeah, I'll <laughs> elevate the volume in the room. Yeah, my concern, uh, I just want to emphasize particularly something that there's all the more as it stands oh, around okay. um, and making sure that we activate in a timely manner. Council Member Petro, I apologize. The room audio is just not going loud enough for us to clearly hear your comment. If, if there's another way where I may be able to provide that through a message of sorts or anything. My apologies. Okay. Um, so any other um, issues on this item? Okay, then, oh, go ahead. Uh, what we can do since we're not at a final spot in any way on this item and so we can get council member petro's feedback and get that out um to everyone so that it can be incorporated in your future deliberations okay great thank you cindy mr chair yes we did receive word that council member petro would like to amplify concerns around council member valdemoris's suggestion okay. that the activation be in a timely manner the activation of the area. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Um, so unless there are any more thoughts on this, we'll go ahead and move on to um, item number four and bring um, Council, uh, Council Member Mono back in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Wharton. We are on to item number three, which is the 2023-24 annual budget for the Community and Neighborhoods Department. We have um, with us Allison Rowland, Council Policy Analyst, Blake Thomas, uh, Tammy Hunsaker, and Orion Goff, Director, and the two Deputy Directors of the Community and Neighborhoods Department. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll start with a brief introduction and then turn over the large share of the time to the department. Um, the Department of Community and Neighborhoods budget would increase for FY24 to over $32 million. That's a $2.8 million increase, and that is 9% higher than FY23. I apologize. There was a uh, typo in my staff report that said 10, but it's 9. Um, the housing stability budget would be the would see the biggest increase that would be nearly 1.2 million or over 15%. And this mostly reflects additional support for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness and the services that are related to mitigating the effects of homelessness more broadly. 
full funding for the specialized sanitation team, sorry, the specialized sanitation provided by Advantage Services uh, citywide would increase. And then also there would be increases in the ambassadors team. Youth and Family Services Division would also increase by $780,000, which is a 31% increase from FY23. But this is a little bit tricky. Basically, most of the increase is for four new, F or sorry, four existing FTEs, and their salaries would be considered one-time funding. Basically, they are awaiting the uh, awaiting word from federal grant uh, on a federal grant that it's a TANF temporary assistance to needy families grant, and that will be it. Uh, announced in June. So if this, uh, if they do receive this money, then the grant fund, then 447,000 would go back to fund balance. And just quickly on staffing levels, the net number of CAN FTEs would grow by five or 3% 3 to 195. That would include one business systems analyst to provide system administration, technical support data, and business analysis and reporting for the director's office. It would also include two civil enforcement officers for short-term rentals in the building services division. And that is in response to a recent council member legislative intent related to ADU enforcement. Some of the costs listed for the FTEs are for 10 months rather than 12, uh, but I've listed those in the staff report as well. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Blake? Are you up? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, next slide, please. And good afternoon, council members, and thank you for the opportunity to present the Department of Community and Neighborhoods portion of the mayor's recommended budget for your consideration. Um, our icon there is the beautiful little mixed use community node. Um, the Department of Community and Neighborhoods, or CAN, has just under 200 full time employees which includes the Office of the Director and Real Estate Services, Building Services, Housing Stability, Planning, Transportation, and Youth and Family Services. We pride ourselves in utilizing data to inform our decisions. So I will only share one anecdote today, which is the last point on this slide about just maybe being the best department in the city. I know it's a bold claim, I apologize to my fellow department directors in the room, but I do How'd you get that approved to be in, <laughs> in writing. I do, I do have an immense amount of gratitude for the hardworking staff that often serve as the first touch point um, for residents and their city government. So now we'll jump right in. Next slide, please. <laughs> this slide is the same data from the previous slide, but broken out by division. Next slide, please. Okay, the first request is for two civil enforcement officers to handle the increased demand for the enforcement of illegal short-term rental units. A positive council straw poll was taken a little over two months ago, and it's much appreciated. Um, as you can see, the workload of short-term rentals has been trending upward alongside total civil enforcement cases across the city. Um, I'll also note that this is a recommendation in the draft of thriving in place, the city's gentrification and anti-displacement plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so drafts of thriving in place and housing SLC, the state mandated five-year housing plan have been published and transmitted for public and council input and direction. The draft of housing SLC found that between 2020 and 2022, Median rents in Salt Lake County, that is regional rents, increased 11% annually, and 71% of Utah, that is statewide households, were priced out of a median priced home at $535,000. Salt Lake City is not exempt from this regional, state, and even nationwide issue. And thanks to the mayor's and your vision, our plan calls for funding to support a tenant resource and navigation service that connects residents at risk of displacement with resources and support. It is proposed for one individual, whether it be a city full-time employee in the community and neighborhoods department or with funding competitively awarded to a community organization uh, to be a knowledgeable lifeline in support of those who need it the most. The plans also call for pilot funding to support tenants facing direct displacement 
This funding would serve as a resource for the tenant resource and navigation service that I just mentioned uh, to be used for those needing to relocate due to demolition, rent increases, or other reasons. I'd also like to note that I'm aware of um, several council member interests and in projects or programs that also support the goals outlined in Thriving in Place and Housing SLC. And we have a transmittal forthcoming with an outline of eligible uses of dormant program income and other sources that we'd like to bring forward for your consideration. Next slide, please. Okay, the next request is funding for a neighborhood amenities and analysis report, which would allow the planning division to hire a consultant to complete a data analysis identifying city neighborhoods where a resident is within a 15 minute walk, bike ride or public transit service of daily needs. The findings will inform the planning division of zoning barriers to be removed or mitigated in our goal of increasing access to opportunity for all residents. Next slide, please. Uh, the next request is in response to the incredible growth that has occurred since the launch of the West Side On Demand Ride Service Pilot Project. It's hard to believe that this program didn't exist two years ago, but as you can see on the slide, there's so much demand that our biggest concern right now is the high rejection rate, which peaks at upwards of 40% for those seeking a ride, but there not being enough drivers or vehicles available to provide that service. Next slide, please. This request is to meet inflationary increases for bus routes 1, 2, 9, and 21, which are known as the frequent transit network, uh, providing 15-minute frequency Monday through Saturday and 30 minutes on Sunday. Next slide, please. This request is for a youth and family strategic plan to ensure the city is effectively serving our youth and um, not duplicating other city or community programs. As you can see on the slide, the division provides a multitude of services and the entirety of our programming will be included in the analysis and report. We hope that this report will also align with the prior council legislative intent regarding youth programming. Next slide, please. And a great photo on that slide. Um, this request is for the continuation of funding for four youth city employees at the Fair Park location. This site opened in November 2021, and the Youth and Family Division, as Allison mentioned, has applied for a renewal of the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, grant funding, but will not know if we are awarded until after Council adopts the annual budget. If we're awarded, we'd recommend this funding going to the general fund. Um, we also intend in the future, uh, since this was a new site, um, to put this uh, site potentially in alignment with our Department of Workforce Services grant funding that funds the other six sites across the city, um, so we don't have to have this timing issue that we're presenting today. Next slide, please. All right, this final request is for a business systems analyst too, um, at the support and prompting of IMS, as CAN is one of, if not the only departments in the city that does not have a dedicated technology liaison for the software programs that we use. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a summary of our budget requests and actuals over the past few fiscal years. Um, as Allison pointed out, I think it's important to note that this year's request now includes transportation funding our future dollars, uh, as well as shoring up homeless services expenses that have historically been addressed through budget amendments. So um, that would I would point to that as a, a part of those increases. And the next slide, please. This, si this slide gives a quick glance um, at the totality of our request that I just presented. In summary, we're requesting three new full-time employees, two of which we appreciate that recommendation, the civil enforcement officers. The four youth and family full-time employees are currently our current employees and grant-funded, and we certainly hope continue to be so. 
Um, thank you for your time, attention, and partnership, and we welcome any questions that you might have. Thanks, Blake. Mm -hmm. That's the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. Council members, questions on this department's budget? Yeah, I would like an update. Valdemar Olson, then Dugan. Sorry. Go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and, and I don't think we talked about it, but I would like to get an update a little bit on the on the council added items that we wanted to talk to you guys, what we've been talking to you guys about the naturally affordable, naturally occurring affordable housing and the um, ADUs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those uh, programs, as I mentioned, those both align really well with the recommendations in Thriving in Place and Housing SLC. Um, so what we have forthcoming over the next couple of weeks is a transmittal as a follow-up to our um, housing stability best practices and dormant program income conversations. And what we hope is to bring that forward to you because of the nuances of each of the different funding sources and eligibility is presenting to you options for what programs best align with which source. So today is primarily focused on funding our future general fund as the source of the request for the, the tenant resource service and then the uh, relocation assistance. Whereas we would love to have a conversation too about these other funding sources we have. Yeah, um, yes. Cindy has an update on, I think, some of those. Yeah, just a little logistics thing um, based on what Councilmember Valdemoros asked. Uh, I think there are about five um, council member ideas, recommendations that relate to housing um, and community stability type things. And we haven't reviewed all of them with the administration yet. We mentioned them as council members have mentioned to them to us, but today, hopefully in our unresolved issues segment, uh, you'll have a chance to at least each um, share with your peers what more detail about what those are. And then we can um, work more with the administration on fleshing those out. Great. And just to add, those are listed in the staff report if anyone needs to refresh their memories. Thank you, Allison. I have two more two more questions. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Thank you, guys. I'm excited to talk about it later then. Um, with the with the advantage services um, cost, I don't know if you I think we I think we've mentioned in the past if there was any chance or if you guys have been looking at um, combining, because basically right now what we're paying is a private company to go clean up certain areas, but maybe it's something that the city cleanup team already does. And maybe instead of hiring somebody, you know, a private company, we hire within or we add this program within what we already do. It's just for cost savings. Sure. But if, if you have, yeah, do you have any do yeah. you guys look into it or? Yeah, I think uh, one point that... Um... I'm proud of related to that funding is the the service area and requests have grown. The service time turnaround has decreased. One thing that we've considered there is there's a lot of very technical bio waste training and risk associated with that. Also, we really appreciate Advantage Services for hiring individuals that have previously uh, or are have previously experienced homelessness. Um, so that's something that we think provides value and outsourcing that funding and feel okay. there's efficiencies but again we're we're welcome to thoughts ideas and any other input did i miss anything no, i think you covered it okay, okay. so it's more Thanks. cost effective to hire a private company than do it ourselves yeah i mean we that's the general sense or feeling that we have if we really want to dig into that we're more than happy to and then and because i because i hear like the what you got like the the um it's a recurring issue. So I'm thinking, well, if we have to hire, you know, from that side, maybe we need to incorporate ourselves and then train our people and then do it ourselves because it's recurring, you know, it's, a, it's so often. And then the second thing is, um, I mean, uh, is there somewhere in your budget where you're also um, budgeting for cleanup of our city owned properties? Because we have some vacant properties, especially in my district that need yeah. the help and, um, I get calls from the community, uh, from the, you know, from my constituents, and then I intervene and then we go clean up, but then there's not like a continuous, hey, every month we're going to go clean this building and every month we're going to clean that other building because we know there are issues in yeah. some of those buildings. So is that something in your budget or 
Are you guys planning on it? Um, or do you need a, you know, is there a budget request for that to make it a systematic going to clean up our own property so that we are the example in the community mm -hmm. of like clean uh, properties? Yeah, we, we've started that. Um, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, there's um, funding in the base budget. It actually was increased in the current fiscal year. And um, we would be happy to chat about a, a better way to address problems as they arise in the community. There are scheduled maintenance of properties, but um, we do hear complaints time to time and work to address those in a timely manner. Um, and I'm sure there's room for improvement there. So we can chat offline and um, we, we recently staffed up our real estate services staff. Okay. So hopefully there's more resources available to deal with issues as they arise. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Dugan and then Councilmember Petro has some comments that she has sent in. And then I have a couple cool. as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And and thanks, Councilmember Valdemar, for those questions. I appreciate all those. That's very nice. So on the, uh, uh, on the transportation side of the house, I uh, appreciate the uh, additional engineers we got recently uh, this past year, and I, I noticed that there's there's no additional engineers on the uh, FTS on the budget this year. Uh, but taking what we've learned and what we've accomplished on the livable streets this past year, can you give us an update on that and how we see that program moving forward? Because uh, across the city, there's a lot of uh, request and a lot of. Uh, 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 focus on the livable street side of the house and just want to make sure that we have enough engineers to handle all the uh, projects that they probably have. I know they, that they probably come down a bit, but they're, they're still at that teetering level of over too many projects and not enough uh, yeah. FTs. Yeah. Well, thank you for that question. We appreciate it over. We appreciate those FTEs. We, we hired them over the last year. We do have four positions filled um, engineers are hard to come by in our market, uh, and the competition, but we have filled those. We're grateful for it. I think real briefly, um, in the past year, we, we worked with you and, and with the mayor to update our speed limit to 20 miles per hour. Um, we have livable streets and transportation safety web pages. Um, we in zone one, we have a traffic calming project for the Capitol Hill area um, that's been awarded and will be under construction this summer. Uh, we've had public meetings for zones two, three, and four. Um, we've had speed bumps installed on 21st East and 13th South. Uh, and we have the project's been awarded and will be constructed this summer. Slow down West Sugar House project. Um, temporary traffic calming devices were installed in the Sugar House Safe Side Streets project. Um, we have an Emory Street livability uh, pilot project with temporary traffic calming. Um, we've updated and done extensive work on the crosswalk uh, flag program. Um, we've done enhancements in a crossing at 2150 East Westminster, uh, and our roundabout has been designated for 7th South and 10th West. Um, in addition to road uh, in-road um, crosswalk warning signs at multiple locations. So we're really proud of what uh, we've accomplished with those four employees um, over the past year and continue to keep chipping away at that. Um, I would look to John. I believe that right now we're comfortable with the four FTEs that are fulfilling those duties and are going to closely track um, how much we're able to chip away. And um, I'm proud to report that we accomplished what we hope to based on that funding that you provided last year. Thank you, because I know there's still a lot more projects to go on. I just want to make sure we have the budget and the, and the uh, uh, workforce to continue on and, and keep in the trajectory of going forward. Yeah. Now taking that along with the vision zero, is there, uh, again, do we have the, the staffing and the funds to implement some of that vision zero stuff? And is there been ideas of getting grant money to implement uh, that program or? I would look to John. I, from our discussions, we feel good about the staffing that we have, uh, where we're able to tap into some of the Vision Zero efforts with our, as it overlaps so much with our our traffic calming engineers and planners. Okay, I appreciate it. Yeah, I just want to make sure you. that we we don't uh, we we keep yeah. that on the on a on a on the vision, so that if we are seeing that we need money or more bodies, we yeah yes. Um, I will say, 
the transportation division is really good at asking for money. Um, so we will we will put that together in writing or a proposal um, as needed. I feel very grateful for your question and concern about that. Thank you. I don't know what that asking exactly for grant meant, money. <laughs> asking for grant money. Asking for grant money. Yeah. Yes, they're very good at all We're levels. Hustlers. Asking for money from all levels. Yes, we try to diversify our portfolio. So, okay, Cindy Lou, you have some comments from Councilmember Petro that have come in. Correct. Just so everyone's clear, Councilmember Petro is attending via phone and has sent in two questions on with relation to the budget just due to the audio issues we're having. I'm going to read them. Given the happenings in the most recent legislative session, are we clear for the enforcement on short-term rentals to be effective? And, or are there still a significant barriers we need to address? I think that um, the request that we have, and we appreciate your support, I think right now that we've talked internally and think that the two FTEs will be sufficient for the workload um, that we anticipate with the enforcement of short-term rentals. Um, I'd look to Angela regarding the policy updates. Can I call Angela to the stand? Yes, you may. I don't want to misspeak about that. Angela Price, CAN policy director, who is a lot sharper than me on. Thank you. Do you mind repeating the question? Cindy Lou kind of was hard to hear you in the back of the room. My mic wasn't it's on. The, oh, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it was really hard to hear you back there. Given the happenings in the most legislative recent legislative session, are we clear for the enforcement on short-term rentals to be effective, or are there still significant barriers we need to address? Yeah, thank you. So we actually didn't um, run any legislation this session on short-term rentals. We had um, a working group that was led by Representative Musselman. And um, we couldn't get to consensus on short-term rental policy. And so we that is slated again to be considered during interim. I think some of the um, biggest concerns that we have is that we aren't able to use the most efficient means possible to enforce short-term rentals. And so um, that's something that we're going to have to keep kind of chipping away at. I think adding the two FTEs right now, the city's very reactive on our short-term rentals, so we aren't able to proactively um, uh, do any enforcement on our short-term rentals, but we do, if we have residents that complain, there's about 75 a year, um, our team does go out and, and do those enforcements. So I think having additional staffing will be helpful. I think looking at our what we can do in the city. Um, this is one of the initiatives for thriving in place. One of our policy areas that we wanna consider is um, how we can utilize those short-term rentals that are taking up housing stock for home ownership opportunities and um, maybe incentivizing um, those property owners to not have short-term rentals, but to use those properties for rental units or for sale products. So I think we have some work to do within the city of how we look at our fines and how we look at enforcement. So I think this is a really good first step, both for the city and also to set a stage for some of the work that we're going to do at the state level. So okay. that, that help. Thanks, Angela. Member, Council members. I think that does answer the question. Mr. Terry, she just has one more. So the strategic plan mentioned for youth and family is also including a needs assessment. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. I have a question related to planning division. Um, I noticed in the budget and your presentation that there was $100,000 for the 15-minute city neighborhoods study. I think that's great. I am, however, we in the, our council retreat and in previous conversations, I've been really interested in zoning reform, citywide zoning reform. And I know that that can take a lot of different, um, that can look at a lot of different ways, but I'm wondering, to me, it would be uh, more expedient to use that $100,000 to at least do a scoping study to figure out what direction we can take with citywide zoning reform, um, whether it be consolidating zones or a anything from just consolidating zones to a full zoning text rewrite. Um, and so I'm... I would, I guess, ask a little more information about the 15 minute study survey, 15 minute city study. And um, if that money can't be better used towards uh, focusing on zoning reform. 
Do we have more information on? Yeah, I mean, I'd invite Nick up as well to weigh in on anything I'm missing, but the the hope and intention of this study was to be able to kind of have this be a first entry point in that process as an iterative step where we're able to identify those parts of our community that are um, outside of that 15 minute window. And then that would inform and recommend to us the future zoning changes that we need to make to accomplish that, which would really be complementary and overlap with that. Yeah, and I, I, I would add to that that our, our intent with this proposal um, really is to establish not just an analysis, but parameters for future planning of what makes a livable neighborhood and what are those uses? How does our zoning align with that? So zoning reform is part of that, um, particularly when it comes to recommendations on where zoning is creating barriers. Um, in terms of um, doing zoning reform that includes things like reducing zoning districts and things like that, um, because of how nuanced our code is, I don't know that there really is going to be a for a hundred thousand dollars. I don't think we're going to get a consultant who understands those nuances enough that it wouldn't be mostly driven by planning staff anyway. And so I would actually like to take a crack at putting together a work plan on what that might look like and how we'd go about figuring that out before we seek any kind of budget money for that. And we haven't done that yet. Okay. And I think the reason why I'm asking is because of how exactly what you said, our zoning ordinance is so nuanced. And I think nuanced can be a nice way of saying that it's complex. Um, and so I think a lot of the time that staff is spending processing applications could be reduced if we simplify the code. And I'm just wondering if what what's the horse and what's the cart, right? Like if we simplify the code, do we then have more staff availability to do things like 15 minute city? Or if we do all these other new studies or new ideas, will that get in the way of staff's time to simplify the code? Um, and I maybe it's that's a, a theoretical question. I don't know if there is an answer to that, but I um, I guess some assurance that you're able to do the simplification of the code even with these additional studies yeah. being funded. Yeah, we, we believe we can. Um, and that's partly because of various steps that we've taken to reduce the number of applications that we're actually getting. And that's that's continuing. Um, and so I think that, you know, we're already seeing us being able to shift staff hours to more city initiative types of things. One of the things that we're finding from that is that we're starting to overwhelm the community with proposals. We're starting to overwhelm all of the other departments and review comments for those and even you know the attorney's office producing ordinances and getting us their review of those and then ultimately the planning commission and to some degree the city council i think we have 20 plus zoning changes coming your way over the next several months Can't wait so there's a lot there <laughs> <laughs> and and so we can do all of those zoning reform things, but we also have to be cognizant of what it means for everybody else who has fingers in that process. Um, so I would much rather put together a more comprehensive plan that looks at how we would accomplish that so that we can collectively prioritize what that means and, and where we're directing those staff um, hours. The What's community the, input hours and every everything else so that it's as effect, most as effective as possible at achieving city goals. What's a reasonable timeline when we can expect that kind of a plan to look at? Uh, probably in the realistically in the next like 60 days, I would think oh, wow. that we'll have something. Um, so we have a lot of things on our plate that we are either obligated to do. You know, one of those is a whole new subdivision chapter to comply with state code, which has been kind of a beast. But um, we have a bunch of other things. We have some thriving in place amendments related to finally defining what a general what our general plan is in the city and establishing processes for those um, and including community benefits same thing with zoning amendments so some pretty big things that we want to move but we've already kind of started thinking in the planning office about what that um, particularly like consolidation of zoning districts looks looks like and which ones we think make sense to do and then we'll start putting in the pieces of what we have to do in order to do that. 
um, so that we understand the resource need for that. Okay, I appreciate that. I think it's um, it just feels really urgent to me because of it, how many amazing things the division is doing, but at the same time is dealing with this, what I would call an antiquated code that results in many, many hours of unnecessary staff time. If we were able to simplify that, I know I'm not, I'm like, I know you will completely understand <laughs> the issue, but I just want to offer my support to help getting that done as quickly as possible so that we're moving forward, not digging ourselves out of the hole of the past. So appreciate that. Uh, Councilman sure. Valdemaros. No, I second that. Councilman Pui. Oh, yes, thank you. I, you know, I'm just trying to remember uh, what happened with uh, the audit. Um, and it's almost a year last week since uh, really I heard back from the building services audit. Um, and uh, it will be appreciated to have an update about that. Uh, many of those things were very concerning to me. Uh, this audit started in, if I remember right, 2017. Here we are in 2023, still talking about this audit very frustrating, especially because this council has been adding more emphasis on auditing our city. Um, and uh, I still hear from uh, the community partners that are trying to apply for permitting and uh, some other issues related to the city. And I still hear about uh, problems. Uh, so I would like to go back to the audit, priority one through five as urgent priorities and how where we are through those through each of those. Uh, we're working closely with uh, Nick Tarbett on the response to the audit. And uh, many of the things that were suggested in the audit were implemented before it was actually formalized. Um, and as always, uh, Councilmember Pui, we, we really appreciate having feedback when you have a customer citizen come up to you and give you a horror story about their permitting process. If you could just ask for an address and send that to us, we have a really uh, detail-oriented workflow history report that we can get with just a few clicks um, in the database that'll give a complete workflow history on any project if we could just get the address or permit number, but usually it's just the address. And uh, we'll continue to work closely with uh, Nick Tarbett on the formal response to the uh, audit. Okay, and do we have an estimated time for this? It will be very nice to not have to be in, uh, in May 2024 to talk about this. It will be nice to have even an update, a faster update, since mm -hmm. I brought up, trying to remember what I brought up last year, but it, this for sure was one of those things I did brought up. Um, I will definitely tell you when I hear about an address. I understand that, you know, our, our city employees are working very hard, and I uh, you know, I, I trust the work that they put on, but sometimes we do have uh, an image uh, problem or, you sure. know, the, yeah. so I, but again, I cannot go back to an audit in my book, it's unfinished, uh, even though they may have been finished. If I don't know, in my book, it is unfinished. So, uh, and say we have resolved that issue and this is how, uh, so it will, it will be very important for me to know. Good. But good. Yeah. We, we have, we have made our responses. So. I think it'll be moving forward pretty quickly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Cindy Gus Jensen has some more information. So, the um, director. We do, council members have a response from the administration uh, on this and I have reviewed it in detail. Nick has reviewed it in detail um, and we'll get back to the department on it. Um, they have responded to a lot of the items. There are still uh, many that are uh, as of the writing of this, which has been quite a while ago, um, they were not um, addressed yet. They may have made progress. They have some um, barriers uh, with existing rules, ordinances, things like that, that we can work with them on. Um, but there are a couple of fundamental things that that the auditors were trying to work with us on and they were kind of like next steps and one of them is what um orian is describing is the workflow issues that uh or list of that he and his staff can access uh we're looking for a way for that to be easily available to 
um, the council and the public in terms of how long is a um, is a permit with the city versus how long is something awaiting an architect or a designer or things like that. And so, um, so I, I don't know that we've ever been able to establish a path forward on that, that refining that measurement system. So um, as soon as the budget gets over with, we can get together with you guys, but they, they have given us a response and it's, um, we can go over it with you. I, I don't, I don't think it addresses all of the issues that are concerning to you. And it's not, um, not that they haven't tried. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll and, work on and, it together. So and if I could just, oh yeah, go ahead. Blake. Oh, I was just going to add to that. I appreciate that comment and know that I, I, you can fact check me if I'm wrong. I know I've received emails from staff announcing the time with applicant time with city and a few of these things. So I think, um, it would be great to get together to talk about what finalizing that looks like. And the other thing I would add is the building services uh, division has a liaison, a full-time employee. And I want to make sure you've got his contact information because we use him as a resource for all small businesses, anyone who's having a permit issue. Um, his name is Jim. And we just say, get in touch with him and he's essentially there to hold your hand through the process and is a troubleshooter. So for the record, it's James McCormick, who's the business services and economic development liaison. But I want to make sure you've got that so you can just quickly make that transfer. And that um, this is a model, uh, an issue I think we have to address for the council's auditing program, um, because during this audit, the administration uh, um, had so many other priorities going on and that they were so flooded with permits that they really weren't able to get us information during the audit time uh, in a timely manner. And, and we understood that, so we tried to work with it. But, it, but the result of that is that we haven't um, achieved what we had hoped to with the audit. So we'll try to learn from this and we'll get the feedback of the department. I have a related question, but also um, about the FTE that's requested, the business systems analyst level two. Is that when I heard that, that it, my first thought was maybe they can help sort through some of these building services permitting question issues. Is it, Am I understanding that position correctly, that they'll help create the IT systems that will help it help that's correct. All of community neighborhoods, but of which building services could be included. Yeah, this role would be department wide. So from project docs to Acela to open counter, um, there'll be a resource to help us with all of those programs and be that direct link uh, to IMS. Okay, great. I appreciate that. And I think that that is one of, from the perspective of someone that submits. Mm -hmm building permit applications, I think even there can be some really small technical things that could really mm -hmm. help the process. Yeah. And hopefully this person can help do that. And we're always so, open for feedback. Okay. So yeah. yes, thanks. I have yeah, Councilman Valdemoros. I have the question of the, the re removal of the temporary traffic calming $100,000. Is that being replaced somewhere else so that we continue to fund the low cost quick action project? Yeah, I think um, we that was helpful seed funding, and we also have CIP sources. Um, we feel like that was a comfortable amount. We certainly, I mean, as much of that money as we get, we can deploy, but um, to the point of staffing, we feel like that's kind of a good equilibrium a year into the program. But wait, but you're removing it. The It, it was 200. It was 200, yeah. and yeah. then you're returning 100. Uh, it's the 200 was into the base budget. And so now the request is 100 ongoing each year. But the CIP has 750,000 in it. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, I'm, two, I'm confused. So the 200 is what we funded in this current fiscal year. Correct. And that was to get a quick action sort of low barrier traffic calming program off the ground. And the 100,000 will be ongoing to maintain that program, mm, yeah, it, as long as it okay. continues yeah. to be funded. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Okay. Yeah, so the hope and intention is that's in perpetuity. Right, and that 
that goes just back to my questions to make sure we have enough money to, to and I agree do all with that. This. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah. I, I, no, great. I, I think this is uh, something important. And I think you probably remember last year's comments on this issue, and we were we added even people to to, to, yeah. to make this happen. We, we yeah. just talked about that, but we added more money. Um, I I still, and again, it might be because of, there is a communication situation. I still haven't seen those, and I would love to visit those, sure. the, the ones that you have implemented, those rapid, uh, quick ones. I would love to. I remember seeing one, and uh, this is before last year, uh, uh, near Councilmember Wharton's uh, uh, mm -hmm. house. Uh, but uh, but I, I still would like to see this uh, a little more often uh, and, and and test them all those out. But I, it would be nice if you know yeah. whenever you are deploying one of those uh, that you know yeah. I would like to know. Yeah, we always welcome additional resources for that program, and I think a field trip is in order, and we can go check out some of those projects. And 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 if uh, and I would like to add, like I I feel like we have more requests, like and, and we have requests at least in District Four, we have requests for this type of quick action project. So. Once we look at the unresolved items or um, or somewhere else in the budget, maybe I rather keep two hundred thousand dollars for that purpose instead of removing a hundred and only having a hundred thousand, because of the amount of requests I think we all have in each of our districts. At least in District Four, I have a bunch, so we ha we might have to look somewhere else. But I I'm throwing that idea out there that I would like to see two hundred thousand instead of the hundred that is proposed. So I think that's a good question for yeah. transportation yeah. and and Blake's team to kind of chew on for us during this budget process. Um, would you propose that like the permanent traffic calming number be reduced and that temporary quick one be increased? Um, just because I think with all the council member requests that we're that we have on this list that we'll we'll talk about in a couple hours that um but I, I think the so does that sound like? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so if that's the request, then I would ask um, if maybe John Larson could give us like a quick idea of $100,000 does yeah. this many yeah. fast things yeah. versus what percentage of a big thing? Yeah. And my sense is that it would do a lot of fast things that could be there for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And I I would, if that's true, I would, I would yeah. tend to agree that like, let's get this out throughout the city, get traffic safety under control and then start replacing those with the permanent right. things sure yeah that, we, uh, we could bring john up if you want because that was under the impression yeah. that 750 was for a lot of those quick actions not just 100 grand mm -hmm. i thought the 750 was for the quick actions he's okay. coming up john larson and that's helpful because i know i remember last year when we kind of gave tiers of employees and dollar amounts we quantified what that looks like yeah hi john um, so we're we're still learning and calibrating. Um, we hired the four new FTEs in the fall, and so there's been a lot of work prep work kind of over the winter. And then really, it's just been in the last month that we've really been able to really dig in on um, seeing what quick action what these quick action projects look like. Uh, there's one that just probably went in on on Emory Street, um, and then uh, we did some uh, in. Sugar House, uh, just north of 21st South, just west of 11th East. Uh, we've been doing those uh, in in street crosswalk signs. So we actually got some of those out in the fall. They didn't last very long. Um, these are the the signs that they they're kind of on a sp spring mounted. They're they're this is probably the lowest cost intervention we've been doing, um, in order to increase the their uh, lifespan. We've been putting those on some yellow bolt curbing that we can bolt down. That's, um, I'd call it semi-permanent. Um, in theory, they can last indefinitely. And so um, tentatively, those look like they're gonna last quite a bit longer. Um, even though the upfront cost is a little bit more, we can do a lot of those. Um, so, and then we're also, so like what we did on Emory Street, and we're also looking at doing some of these um, so like I said, kind of like Hollywood Avenue area, and then we're looking maybe on fourth East down, um, on the South end of the city. Uh, these, these big, it was an idea we got from concrete Portland things, the big concrete, uh, rings. Um, and those are relatively cost-effective. Um, and so 
but this is our first year using them. So we want to see how they, see how they look and get the, you know, some feedback. Um, so I guess we're, we're still calibrating, but as far as that discussion about the, the quick action versus the permanent, I really feel like that's a policy decision and however you want to fund it, we are more than happy to just keep, keep running full steam ahead. It sounds like there's some interest from the council on the quick action items. Um, and I would also add uh, communicating that to the public, what we're doing with those, whether that be there's a website that just lists all the small projects that are going on. Um, maybe they're all painted like Salt Lake blue. And so everyone drives by and knows, oh, that's one of those things that happened. And I, that's not necessary, but like some way that the community can be like, here's the inventory of things that we can get that the council has funded. And we think this one will work great in our street and then have a way to, to like, Put that in the request. I think what we we want to be able to respond to these questions about people worried about their children and their dogs on their street as fast as possible. So getting it's not just being able to do it quickly, which it sounds like you're starting to do, but being able to communicate to the public so they know what to ask for. Mm -hmm. I think is is what's important. Councilor Dugan, did I cut you off? No, 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 exactly right. And I think that was, goes back to my the first questions. You know, we had the funding and we had the manpower, not manpower, the workforce to handle the projects that we have because you have a lot out there and there are a lot across this, across the city uh, to handle what we need. And if we, if we don't, we need, we need to ask for the money. Thank you. Council member, did you also want to ask about the 750,000 in CIP? Yes, because I think that 750 in CIP was, is that for, I thought that was for the quick action stuff, street calming. Maybe I was wrong on that 750 on the CIP. Yeah, we're trying to recall the 750. Sounds like we'll have to do a little bit of yeah. communicating back and forth to figure out which one we're we're asking right, about. Right. Do you have a? Oh, excuse me, that might have been for the. Uh, I got the uh, street it, side of the house. Was it the two million seed? Yeah. And then the, yeah. yeah. Okay. So what, that was street reconstruction. Yes, I was looking at the street okay. reconstruction okay. vice okay. street calming. So. Okay. All right. I, I, both of them happen to do with streets. So, yeah. Council members, any more questions for community and neighborhood at this time? Council member Wharton. Yes, thanks. Um, so, regarding transportation, I mean, I have I've, I've asked for a lot from transportation over the recent years, and I really appreciate all of the work that you've done working with my constituents and um, the CIP um, request that we had a couple of years ago. Um, at, but it is really difficult to communicate um, to residents um, like um, what is coming in a way that um, that sounds meaningful to them. Um, you know, I can tell them we allocated this and we allocated that, but um, it unless there's like some sort of visual something that they notice in their neighborhood, it doesn't, it's just noise. Um, and I, uh, I also feel like I don't want to put you and staff in a weird position by giving people timelines or saying like, expect to see this then, because I feel like that can just set it, people up for disappointment. Um, but, um, yeah, I think we're, all I can keep saying is that I feel like we as a council are probably as interested as we've ever been, certainly as as long as I've ever, ever been involved in city politics, which is about you know 16 years, than we've ever been in traffic calming. Um, and it's getting hard to translate that to residents as to what sort of differences they're actually seeing. Um, I'm not saying there aren't any. Um, there certainly are, but I... Uh, I think the expectation level, um, I don't know how to how to meet that. So traffic calming. Yeah. We, want, uh, we like it. We want it. Yeah, I know. Thank you. Uh, I, sorry, I have another. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Go, go ahead. And then Councilman Valdemar, then we should probably move on to the um, next department. Okay. Um, I, I'll try to be quick. Um, also, like the landscaping ordinance, um, I think at our last... I don't remember if it was last year or the year before. I think that was one of the one of the things that all seven of us agreed we wanted to have as a priority. 
um, I think it was the year before, because then we were going to do it last year and then, and we're still waiting on it. What is the status on imp- on making those changes? You're talking about the water wise landscaping. Yes. Um, Nick Norris either. looks like he's got yeah. some information for us. Yeah, it was uh, last September that we briefed the council on that. And that has been uh, through the planning commission and it's in the transmittal phase. So you should be getting it as soon as we can get that transmit all wrapped up. Okay. Um, and then I, I had some other questions about, um, about compliance. Um, I mean, what, thanks, Nick, what do we need to do? Is there any funding allocations that, that we need from this council to ensure that work that we can stop work that's being done without a permit or that we can stop work that's creating a hazardous situation or work that's happening outside of the permit. Um, it, you know, there, I, I'm, I, I have one specific project that you all know about that's, you know, at the forefront of my mind, but it, it seems like to say that we don't have the ability to address these issues and that, that we, um, the path to like fixing these changes or improving these changes in our code is, is a years long process is, is just really frustrating. Is there more resources that we can allocate to expedite that process? Um, Cause we're, we're two years, the one I'm thinking of is two years in and we, we haven't made the changes to the ordinance and we haven't been able to stop what's happening. Yeah, I mean, we're really familiar with that case. And, and in fact, that case has actually gone to the district attorney. It's been to the police department. It's been screened for charges and criminal. Mm-hmm. One of the things that's, you know, that can be frustrating in the state of Utah is that the, the state controls the building codes. Yeah. And, and they control those uh, so much so that they add their own amendments. Mm-hmm. Um, and being uh, highly skewed towards property rights. And uh, and so when when you get in a situation like the one that you're, you're addressing, we're going to have another meeting, another briefing on that for you that would include the attorney's office and also the police department and the DA's office possibly um, to talk about that case specifically. But we we are rewriting some of that ordinance, yeah. But mindful that there's only so much we can do in a, in a statewide code. And, you know, specifically, it's very difficult to make it more restrictive than what mm-hmm. the amendments and that code is at the state level. Sure. Are you saying we can make it less restrictive, but we cannot make it more? Well, it's it, there are some nuances with that language. And there is a commission that is statewide commission that does that work. But one of the things that happened in the last... 10 years is that that commission became an oversight committee of legislators. And, and so it's difficult. It's about a nine month process to take something through the building code or fire code commission. Uh, But because that's very political now, it's difficult to get technical things changed. Um, We have done some things with the fire code that were successful that are specific to the city. And, uh, you know, we're happy to, to take that through that process um and i think that we're well we're well along the way in some recommended changes to title 18 that might be helpful but i don't know in that condition that you're talking about that we're discussing um i don't know if they would have been that helpful in that condition um because of the situation between neighbors right i i guess i i totally empathize um because you know, if you feel hamstrung, you can imagine how, how as the administration, how I feel even more hamstrung as as one uh, of seven council members. But um, it's because of that that even though we have this little narrow area where we can make these improvements, and I, and that it is a lot a, a months long process for me. If that's the only thing that we have to work on like that has to be the priority it has to be and it it, we have to have like I have to be able to tell people that you know every couple months that we're advancing as opposed to you know two 
two years in and me saying like, we're still looking at this and still looking at that. So this is an ordinance change, Councilman Wharton? Yes. I, I have no clue what you're talking about. Okay. Right now, so maybe we could it's, chat, but it sounds like, yeah, it's something is you brought there up at the retreat. a budget request that is needed for this item or is this just the Well, that's kind of what I'm asking is like, do we, is, do we, it, are there delays that we can help overcome um, with staffing or with more funding to, to show that this is a priority? I don't believe so. Not in the near term. Okay. I think that we're far enough along with that um, recommendation for the changes to Title 18 to get that to you pretty quickly. Thank you. It's in draft form. Great. Councilman Volmer, Morris, did you have something? No, I'm going to leave the last. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We okay. can move on. I can. All right. Can... Let's um, move on to the next item. We are about 20 minutes behind. Um, but we also had some technical difficulties. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you thank for you. answering all of our questions. Uh, the next item is the fiscal year 2023-2024 budget for the Department of Public Lands. We have Allison Rowland still with us from the council office, Kristen Riker and Greg Evans. Kristen Riker is the director of public lands and Greg is the financial manager of public lands. Did I get the correct people at the table? I see Kristen, but I don't know who Greg is, so, okay. Hi, Kristen. Hi, hey, everyone. How are you? Very good. So while people are getting settled, um, we have quite a few of our public lands management staff here that I brought in today. Um, and uh, I just wanted to share um, just very briefly. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'll, I'll do that after Allison goes. I'm jumping ahead of you. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, I will go. I will go, and then you can do your We're thing without me interrupting. <laughs> so, um, this is the Department of Public Lands. Um, as you probably remember, the Gulf Division is briefed separately from public lands um, just because of the size of the two of the department and the division. Um, public lands is also one of the newest departments, if not the newest department. Um, dates from 2022 when public services department was split into two and there are five existing divisions in public lands including the golf enterprise fund the 2024 budget would continue to expand public lands uh, a lot um, and it the total size of the budget would reach over 27 million dollars that's 12 percent higher than in fy12 i'm sorry fy23 this means the ongoing budget would grow by 8.1 million or 43% since the uh, department's founding. Uh, like other departments, there's a lot of money that needs to go to higher personal services costs. Um, and then in addition, the parks division, which receives 57% of the total budget uh, minus golf, would receive 15.5 million. Um, which is 1.4 million more, and Trails and Natural Lands Division would continue to grow rapidly, adding 869,000 to reach $4.8 million. There are also a, a large number of new positions. The proposed budget would add 14.5 new FTEs to the Public Lands Department on an ongoing basis. Most of these would come from shifting FOF funding from capital expenditures to ongoing. The department has many, many capital projects in the pipeline, and uh, they have stated that they can better use the funds from FOF on maintenance staff, equipment, and supplies. Um, as you'll recall, the GO bond, for example, with $85 million is working its way through the system. And finally, because uh, it wouldn't be an introduction from me without a correction to the staff report. <laughs> um, sorry about that. This time it was, uh, I'll just read the correct sentence um, for the funding, the FOF funding from a capital account to operational accounts. Um, there would be an ongoing change with 1.3 million of the amount to cover maintenance costs and 793,000 in one-time purchases for FY24. So there would be a larger amount in one-time purchases than I had. I got the wrong number in there, um, but it's about 110,000 more. You're good to catch them at least. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll credit these guys for that. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. 
Thanks everyone for having us today. Um, like I was, I was starting out here. We have several public lands um, folks in the audience today, and um, most of them you probably recognize, but possibly a few you may not. Um, Tyler Murdoch is our deputy director over planning and um, trails and natural lands is um, here in the audience, and Carmen Bailey over operations. She oversees parks, golf, and urban forestry. Um, and Mark Evans is at the table here with me. Um, also, you probably recognize Tony Glyatt, our urban forester, and Matt Kammeyer, our golf director. Um, you may not recognize Nick, Nick Frederick. He is our park ranger manager. Nick, raise your hand. And Toby Hazelbaker is um, your parks division director, if you haven't met him yet. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you for hosting us today. Uh, you can go on to the next slide next go to ahead please there we go um, when identifying our department's needs we use program-based budgeting this year this was the first time we did this and this helped us prioritize our insights for you today uh, before we ever present our insights to the mayor's budget committee or the mayor or council uh, our requests are reviewed and also prioritized by the uh, parks, natural lands, urban forestry and trails peanut board. Um, and we have tried very hard to match the board's priorities with our priorities. So they're familiar with our budget. Next slide, please. The Department of Public Lands uh, consists of five divisions with 122 full-time employees. And in the summer months, 250, if we're successful at hiring all of our seasonals, seasonal staff. Um, so that includes parks, trails and natural lands, urban forestry, and our administrative division. Public lands also oversees city-sponsored special events, special events permitting. Additionally, we oversee the cemetery, the greenhouses, park rangers, the regional athletic complex, and graffiti removal. Next slide, please. This slide is a department summary of the past three years budget in each division of public lands and this year's total request by division. I will go into each request in more depth uh, as we talk through each of the insights and we can come back to this if you like. Next slide, please. This is our budget insight overview. Our budget request this year includes 12.5 FTEs and corresponding vehicles and supplies. 11.5 of those FTEs is a reallocation of funding from funding our future that was allocated to CIP dollars to the general fund in operations dollars. The, the last FTE is a request from the general fund in coordination with the mayor's office and economic development to expand citywide events in historically underserved neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Our first budget insight is inflationary and contractual increases. This slide shows the percentages and dollar amounts associated with these expenses with a total request of $649,500 in inflationary increases. Next slide. This slide includes insights number two and three, as they both relate to our request for the reallocation of public lands funding our future or FOF budget from CIP account to operations budget. In fiscal year 23, Mayor Mendenhall proposed funding parks maintenance using funding our future sales tax dollars as a response to the increased usage of our public spaces during the pandemic and an understanding that Salt Lake City's public spaces have growing maintenance needs. This created another funding bucket to FOF dollars and was announced by the administration as a way to help us keep parks clean, safe, and beautiful for all residents and visitors to enjoy. City Council also agreed uh, to the administration's request that parks maintenance become eligible for a portion of the annual Funding Our Future sales tax revenue, and $1.995 million was approved and added to the department's CIP budget. This fiscal year in 22-23, uh, public lands use the $1.995 million on several maintenance projects. Some of those projects included cemetery maintenance, irrigation wiring, asphalt, excuse me, parks, asphalt, resurfacing and repair, 
parks irrigation repairs and re improvements, and Jordan River tree removal. These projects helped us complete much needed infrastructure maintenance through contracted services. However, with the approval of the sales tax bond last August, the GO bond last November, and growing impact fees and CIP projects, Spending that nearly $2 million in capital has become increasingly difficult for our department. Despite our capital maintenance needs in our parks, this year we are proposing to move that entire nearly $2 million in funding into operations to cover our immediate operational needs for existing and new property maintenance. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graph from the resident survey report conducted by the city in 2021. It emphasizes the community's interest in taking care of what we have. In the first red bubble, you can see that 71% of Salt Lake City residents say that increasing investment in current parks is a priority um, and trails and natural lands is a high priority. In the second red circle, 63% of residents said increasing the amount of parks, trails, and open space is a high priority. And another interesting fact from that survey showed that 90% of residents are excited or very excited to visit city parks and natural lands in the near future. These resident surveys shine a spotlight on the importance of taking care of what we have and the strong support and use for Salt Lake City parks, trails and natural lands by the public. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so we'll start with parks. We placed this insight in the should category and it received a 22 score in the decision matrix and has very strong ties to our reimagine nature goals and strategies. Each year, Salt Lake City Public Lands acquires new property and or amenities through the CIP process. Budgeting for ongoing maintenance, including supplies and staff of these facilities is requested once the division understands the date, the project will be turned over to that division for maintenance. Between last fiscal year and this fiscal year, Parks has received the four properties listed at the top in the left-hand corner. This part of the reallocation includes one FTE, which is a park maintenance position, and 3.5 seasonal staff to maintain the four newly acquired properties. Second, this insight will improve the timeliness of our repairs in parks. Vandalism, including broken electrical and irrigation boxes, stolen electrical wire, restroom, concrete, paint, and structure vandalism, all leave regular maintenance of parks facilities falling behind. To keep up, we're asking for an additional electrician and an additional maintenance, general maintenance worker. The third component of this insight, less water waste, adds a central control irrigation specialist to our current team of two. These staff staff program are 234 controllers every time we have a festival, a farmer's market, a soccer game, a, bur a burial at the cemetery, or any other special event that's happening in the park, we have to fix the irrigation. They monitor our system to alert our irrigation techs when there are leaks, broken lines and heads, or when the ground is oversaturated or overly dry. With this added oversight, we need another irrigation tech to add to our existing eight techs to repair the heads, lines, and valves that feed our over 42,000 sprinkler heads and irrigate the 2,400 acres of land that we oversee. And lastly, the 0.5 FTE requested is a warehouse operator. The remaining FTE would come from Gulf Enterprise Funds, and you'll hear more about that from Matt in the golf presentation. This point five of the position is in part funded by dissolving a part-time position and would support public lands to manage our increasing number of purchases, contracts, and warehouse demands of the department. The growth comes in part from added special events, new park ranger program, and more grant awards and our bonds. Next slide, please. This slide represents um, our third insight and is the second half of our request to reallocate the FOF funding from CIP to operations. The insight is scored as a 22 on the decision matrix and we prioritize this as a should. You can see that it is very tied to the reimagined nature general plan. The trails, trails and natural lands division currently maintains 2,100 acres of natural lands. Their team consists of one maintenance supervisor and 
two natural lands maintenance employees, which equates to approximately 1,050 acres per full-time employee. Like parks, TNL accepts new properties each year. Between last fiscal year and this, TNL has received five new properties listed in the left-hand corner, you can see there. The first bullet point under the community impact includes one natural, natural resource technician and 3.5 seasonal staff to maintain these five newly acquired properties. The second community impact is biodiversity restoration. This change would move our current part-time ecologist to a full-time restoration ecologist and add two additional natural, natural resource technicians and two seasonal staff to this team. And I'll just direct your attention to the photos. Um, that is Parley's Historic Nature Park. And the top photo is um, prior to restoration and it's the same sightline uh, photo after restoration has occurred. The last bullet is long-term care for the Foothills Trails. This portion of the insight adds three natural resource technicians and four part-time employees. I'm going to go into this one just a little bit more in depth on another slide. Uh, next slide, please. And just so you, that you understand what we mean by biodiversity restoration, um, this is another picture of a restoration site. On the left is a picture of Mary Spring in Parley's Historic Nature Park before seeding, native planting, and restoration work. And the photo to the right shows the post-restoration work. In the past five years, the team has completed and now maintains five biodiversity habitat projects within natural lands throughout the city. This expansion of the restoration ecology team would implement two additional biodiversity habitat projects each year within Salt Lake City public lands. It would allow us to improve our weed control in natural areas, do more native planting and seeding, add fencing, more attention to irrigation maintenance and trash removal. Next slide, please. Okay, this is um, the request for a soft surface trails maintenance crew in the foothills, um, but it would also include include other soft surface trails, including Rose Park trails in District 1, natural trails in D6 include Wasatch Hollow and Mil Miller Bird Refugee, and proposing um, we are proposing a new soft surface trail in the Glendale Regional Park, and this team would also take care of that. Salt Lake City has never had a trails crew. We've learned over the past two years, in particular with the passage of the Foothill Trails General Plan, that the community has a huge interest in us taking care of our foothill trails. This team will work on the nearly 100 miles of trails in the foothills doing trail sculpting, repairs, and weed management. It would provide general maintenance of 25 miles of trail each year so that all system trails would receive general maintenance every four years. This team would also allow us to re-engage the foothill trails stewards and this is a group that we um, have had previously. Um, it's a group of regular volunteers who are passionate about the foothills, providing additional maintenance to our trails. Um, for that volunteer group to really function well, public land staff is needed to provide the tools, the maintenance, and the oversight. Um, these allocations can grow that volunteer program, leveraging city, city dollars with these community efforts. Kristen, can we ask on this table, two FTEs, 2,080 hours part-time, what does that mean? Is it actually four individuals that are working part-time for 2,080? All right. Yeah, those are, those are seasonal hours. So not every seasonal hour, seasonal employee is going to work 20 hours. So it's the equivalent of two FTEs. But it could be six people. It could be 10 people. 10 yeah. people, okay. Yeah. Got Thanks. it. No worries. Okay, but next. Actually, yeah. sorry. Yep. Two FTEs would be 4,160 hours typically, wouldn't it? So is this actually one FT or is it two hour, two FTEs and so 4,000 hours? Two full-time employees plus 2,080 part-time hours. Oh, those are those separate are yeah. things. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anything else on that one? Next slide. Okay, so this is just an, uh, this is the overview of these two insights. This slide shows the details for both parks and trails and natural lands requests for the reallocation. 
Parks is requesting six vehicles and 5.5 full-time employees with seasonal hours. TNL Insight includes four vehicles, six full-time employees with seasonal hours. In the first yellow row near the right side, you'll see the total FY24 operations and one-time costs combined for both insights is $1,995,000. In the light yellow row near the bottom of the page, you'll see the existing FOF funds. And the last show, row shows we're requesting that move from CIP to operations. In the second to the last column on the right, you'll see the annualized cost would be $1,316,000. And that leaves $678,152 to put back into the CIP account in fiscal year 25 for public lands capital maintenance. And we think that putting that funding back into capital maintenance in the following year will provide future opportunities for us to make critical capital repairs to our system. Next slide. Can I ask a question yeah. about that? So. Okay, 1.995 million is being moved from this fiscal year's what would have been in CIP into the this maintenance. Where is the 678 coming from? That's last fiscal year's capital? No, so that is what's remaining after we spend the one-time funding. So we're asking for vehicles and that's one-time funding. And the number is different. Oh, out of because... the 1.995. Yes. There's some there will be some remaining staff and then some one-time funding. And then there's still a little bit remaining. That... So yeah, it's confusing. So we'll have our staff and our staff are budgeted for 10 months. And then we also have vehicles and all of that equals the exact amount, the one nine nine five um, million, right? Once you annualize the costs of the staff for a full 12 months, that number changes just a little bit. And the remainder is that 600. But the cost uh, of the vehicle does not happen again next year. So that's what we would ask I, to take yeah. from the operating budget and put that back into CIP in fiscal year 25. Okay. But at but, some point, those vehicles will need to be replaced. So that needs to be planned for. At in some the point. future, yes. And where's maintenance cost of those vehicles? Is it in an that is here? in fleet, is that right? Fleet? What's the present? In the fleet fund. The, yeah, sorry, it's in the fleet fund. fund. The yeah. fleet fund, yeah. Councilmember Puig. So I, uh, and I know I we're not done to... with your slides. So, oh, sorry. That's okay. Like you have a few slides to go. Yes, a couple more. When you're talking about vehicles, and we're talking about adding some new vehicles. Um, when we, I, I wonder if uh, the plan is to have fuel efficient and clean energy vehicles. And I know that some of them are larger trucks yeah. and I get that, right. although we just came back from Denver and there was some garbage uh, trucks and some other larger vehicles that were natural gas powered. Uh, and uh, I wish nice. you know, we were going that direction too. Um, but as far as uh, smaller vehicles, there are federal grants that make the the cost of those, uh, the, the federal government is trying to make the cost equal uh, to to a, a fuel, a fossil fuel uh, powered vehicle. So I wonder if we are going to do that. If not, how do we do that? I know that it might take some work to apply for those grants, right. but we need to, I, you know, it is my view and I believe that many, many of us are, is that we need to show the example too uh, with, our, with our fleet. So that's one of the questions, and I hope uh, we can get there. Uh, and when you mentioned, and I'm going to stay on the topics that you already covered, may, I may have some questions later, but when we were talking about events and the irrigation to be, to be fixed after events, uh, uh, after a park is used for an event or a concert, and sometimes there is a call for irrigation to be fixed, which yes. is logical um, right. when you have maybe thousands of people and equipment over and trucks over um, I keep on breaking my irrigation lines and I don't have yes. any equipment going over it. I don't know how it happens, but um, so uh, do we have, when we are permitting those uh, events, uh, is there any way to re, you know, uh, pass these fees or at least part of them to uh, maybe in the front end to some of these uh, events? Some of those events are large enough that, right. you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars or, or, you know, will not make a big difference to them, but it could make a big difference to us uh, in addition. 
um, and you do, did mention restrooms at some point, or I read restrooms through the mm -hmm. through the slides that you were going through. Um, I keep receiving questions about the restrooms and the status of our restrooms in our parks. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that there is some sort of uh, a tracking mechanism about, you know, when were they uh, last remodeled, which ones are functioning, which ones are not. Uh, which ones are welded uh, and, and not functional if there are some still those. Um, and I, the concern from many of the neighbors, uh, children or not, um, is that, you know, they need to access the restrooms. And, uh, but the restrooms also need to be locked after hours. Yep. Uh, so which requires personnel. And I understand that. So I wonder if we have a, uh, a plan for that. Um, you know, the, the opposite, the, the alternative to that, as you probably know, is people will go in places they shouldn't go. Um, so having restrooms is a positive thing and functioning restrooms and high quality restrooms in our parks is great. So I'm going to stay on those three topics. Right okay, now. let me make sure I can remember all three of them. Let's start with the restrooms. Um, so yes, in the winter, we, we do weld the restrooms shut. And that's because um, we have troubles with people breaking into them in the middle of winter and living there and um, destroying uh, a lot of the amenities inside the restroom. Uh, this year, we were slow to open our restrooms, slower than usual. And um, that was in part because of the cold weather. We can't open our restrooms in the wintertime because they're not winterized. So if, if there is a threat of freeze, we can't open our restrooms. Um, another cause for us being a little bit delayed this year is uh, we, we sent many of our staff um, to assist with the removal of debris in City Creek. And that took um, several of our staff more than a week uh, to assist with public utilities on that. Um, and um, and it's, you know, it's early season and we're not used to this, this weather having snow on the ground uh, through March. And so it really did delay a lot of our maintenance this year. So we like to have them open. Um, we have worked with, um, and we will be working with Pal American to lock our restrooms at night. Uh, they have had, they started and they have had some issues with staffing as well. Um, but that is our intent to have Pal American close them at night. They should all be functioning. If the door is locked and somebody complains to you that um, Parks has their doors locked for the restrooms, we can't get in there, it's probably because there's somebody in there and they're not coming out. Um, and we are happy to um, to ask our, our park rangers to just give a friendly little knock on the door to see if there's somebody in there. Um, or we also have our um, Salt Lake City Police Department working overtime from 11 p.m. Um, until about 2 a.m. And they go in and they also do park clearings. So um, hopefully that answers your questions on the restrooms. Uh, regarding fleet, um, we agree with you. We love our, our green vehicles. In fact, we just put two new mowers, green mowers in our fleet that we are kind of piloting right now, um, but we're, we're using them. They're ours and we will continue to use them. With any of these new vehicles, we will work with um, our fleet group to use green vehicles whenever we can, electric vehicles or hybrid. Um, we rely on their expertise to help us uh, select some of those vehicles and our staff uh, is more than happy to go out and you know test drive or, or check out new vehicles for electric. And then regarding the events, um, yes, there is a cost recovery system and um, our events organizers do not pay that ahead um, of time that is collected after the fact. We hope that they will not put a stake through one of our irrigation systems or break it ahead during their event. But uh, we definitely have a system for cost recovery and we will build them after the fact if there is maintenance work that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. So member Valdemar has had a follow-up. Thanks, thanks, Kristen. Um, I, I think it's a follow-up to the events because I was looking at your funding sources and it says general fund, single fund, but I, is there any way we can know how much your group is getting from events as you rent out parks to different groups um, and then those recovery costs? So we, I would like to understand where that 
money, how much it is that we get so to kind of to leverage or to know where, how to pay for your departments to, so that we know what we're missing or if there's opportunities to change fees and stuff like that to kind of um, help with the cost of this department. So Mary Beth can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, when we charge for events, we only charge for the cost of our events. Um, so if it um, if we're doing trash removal, if public lands is doing trash removal or um, has to do something specific for, the, for that event, have people on site, we charge for our costs only. And um, it's not just public lands, but there's building permits police department may have costs if they have to have somebody there. Um, facilities may have costs. There are several different agencies that um, have costs associated with a specific event, depending on the size and, and, um, and the activities that are happening in that event. So we only pay for, we only collect what our staff time is anticipated to be for that event. Okay. And I believe that's related to state law. Okay. Which limits it to actual costs. Okay. All right. So basically you don't, you don't, um, we don't charge to use the actual real estate or the, let's say a park. It is somebody else or we don't charge for that. We just charge for a cost that might, you know, for your staff to come over and, or whoever to you're, pick up. You're saying the there. value of using the space. It's just the cost. That, is that what you're asking, Councilman Valdemar? Right. Well, so maybe if, to illustrate, we had the, you know, we had the, um, what you call the, the climbing competition this weekend at Pioneer Park, and it took pretty much almost all park. Like, it, I mean, it was a huge event, and it's, it's exciting and awesome. And I was just wondering if we can have more of those. Do we charge these type of events so that we can recover some of the cost of the maintenance of the park and the staff time and all of the things. Right. And Greg just reminded me that's real estate services that okay. charges for that. Um, okay. The rental of that space. All right. Great. Right. Thank you, Lisa. Thank Lisa you. Lisa Schaefer, Kristen. Chief Administrative Officer. Hi, Council. Yeah. Thank you very much for the question. I think that um, the special events function or the, the permitting of special events is housed within uh, public lands. But like uh, Director Riker just said, there are so many different departments that have a piece in us <laughs> um, issuing a permit for a special event. And one of those is real estate services. So there is a lease of public space. And then there is a true cost recovery for multiple departments, waste and recycling, police department, um, security, um, public lands, if there's any repairs that need to be done, um, you'll, you'll notice public lands will come out here starting today and mow and start to restore the grass. All of that cost that's associated with that will be part of the recovery that we bill the event holder for. So it's, it's not, there is a lease involved with the space, uh, but I don't think Kristen would be involved in any of that um, development of those costs. Right. And is there anywhere in the budget where we can see like the list of events in a year and all the, you know, from real estate or whoever to see how much it comes in for events and then how much it comes out for police? All like like a, balance, a balance sheet yeah, on, I, on whether or not we actually did collect the true cost for the recovery yeah. okay <laughs> or if we, you know. i don't i don't think that there is okay. that 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 exists but i think that we could probably get close for you we, we certainly have a list of the events in public spaces and we certainly can uh kind of true up the invoices that are charged to those events that would be nice to know because i you know we have a bunch of events we have a lot of nice real estate that we can capitalize on certainly you know and okay. also offset some of these high costs Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I would like to mention also, and probably the more important uh, piece of me coming to the table is that uh, that is ordinance based and that ordinance was changed several years ago to be true cost recovery. Uh, the city has undertaken a pretty extensive study on what it would take to possibly change that up. And uh, it's really sort of a policy and philosophical conversation about what events are in the city. And so your question is timely, and maybe we could resurrect that and have a conversation. So I appreciate the questions, Councilman Valdemaros. I'll just add that I, 
I do want to have this conversation. I'm not sure that I want to make events harder to do in the city because I think the events add a, a sort of intangible cultural element to our community. So I think that's some of the things we need away when we decide if we are trying to charge 100% of the true cost or if we're trying to what what we charge. For which event is fine. Permits. It's timely. Yeah. I mean, which is fine, but it, I would like to have like a clearer view of what's happening and then say, okay, we we value this what so, you said so we're going to subsidize some of this out of our and maybe staff process. can help us is this something we should be considering with a consolidated fee schedule or is this an ordinance that would need to take place after budget process or after because it it will be quite um complicated the new the city's new um accounting system will help us a lot if you asked us for this two years ago it probably we would just melt in our chairs, but um, we'll work with the administration, okay. but it would be after budget. All right. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Wharton. Uh, just that. Um, and then we should let them finish their presentation. <laughs> uh, no, it's okay. Uh, I just want to add, uh, add though about um, what Councilmember Voldemort is saying is that do, do the, does the user get a breakdown of of like what they were charged and why okay because because i've heard concerns from other like some of the nonprofits that are doing these events saying that they feel like they're being overcharged in some areas and that that is a hindrance to their ability to be able to make the event profitable and and work for salt lake city and um so when we're doing these and when we're getting the information that Councilmember Valdemoros is asking for, I think it's important to look at what the estimate estimate is for, like the arts festival and the pride festival, and how much um, revenue that generates for private businesses in the city, which translates into sales tax that we collect. Because you know these are major events that that we we you know we get money paid directly from the event organizer to the city but then there's all of the you know less more difficult to calculate um advantage that it puts into our economy for that weekend which we also reap the benefits of i appreciate that yeah and um we have um so ryan schlegel is over our special events permitting and he's working very hard with all the different departments to try to come to try to consolidate some of those fees mm -hmm. so that when somebody comes to the city and says, I want to run this event, what's it going to cost? Right now they have to go to several different departments and some of those costs are somewhat unknown. And so Ryan is working really hard with all the different um, departments mm -hmm. to try to come up with a way that we can consolidate those so that we could tell somebody, you want this event, it's going to be this large, here's the parameters. This is going to be the cost, and then there'll be some truing up at the end. In particular, if there is some cost recovery, if irrigation heads broken, or or there was more people there than they said they would be, and the trash removal was greater, or something like that. So we are working on that to try to make it easier for our, our event organizers. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, like the rest of your slides are about events, so. Yes, so the next <laughs> slide is about yeah, events. Yes. So if there's any other questions on this, I, we can go to the next slide. Okay. Um, our third and last budget insight is expanded citywide events. Um, Public Lands is re requesting one special events assistance, assistant, more funding for July holiday events and event funding for nine new events. Next slide, please. We place this insight in the want category. However, if the city intends for us to add the drone show and add these additional events, the funding and the FTE become a must in order for us to run these additional events. This insight received a 16 in the decision matrix and has close ties with Reimagine Nature. Uh, in this insight, in collaboration with the mayor, we are requesting funding to cover the additional costs of two drone shows in July of 2022 Salt Lake City Council suspended firework shows for Independence and Pioneer Day celebrations out of concern for air quality. In response, Public Lands hosted Laser Light Nights, which was received with very warm approval from the community. 
Drone shows throughout the country, who are, however, are received with overwhelming popularity, increasingly replacing firework and laser shows for safer, more exciting, and environmentally friendlier drone events. Also in collaboration with the Mayor's Office and Department of Economic Development, we are requesting to add nine new city events. This requires the addition of one special projects assistant and event-related funding with the intent to activate historically underserved neighborhoods and to contribute to the economic well-being of these neighborhoods. Constituent-led and, constituent and implemented festivals and events like the ones we're proposing are less expensive option than policing these areas to reduce crime and promote a sense of safety and neighborhood cohesion. Next slide. Sorry, did you say there's an FTE associated with the there drone shows? There is one FTE associated. With just the drone shows? This is, no, this is for the nine additional events. Okay. That makes so sense. let's talk about those a little bit in this next slide. This is a list of our current events in white and new events in blue and the expanded events in yellow. Um, the events uh, proposal will allow our city to have activated events on 46 different days throughout our year. Next slide. This slide shows the unfunded new event location and costs. The rows highlighted in green are the increased cost of the drone shows. And that just has um, the dates and the locations. Next slide, please. As I said, this insight will have a direct impact on historically underserved areas in districts one, two, and four. The first number is, is the existing number of events on the map. Um, and the second number is the added number of events in each district. Next slide. And this last slide <clears throat> just shows the number of events activated um, by days by council district. Next slide. And that is it for the presentation. We're happy to take more questions if you have them. And just to be clear, these numbers are just city sponsored events, not private events. That's right. <clears throat> the ones we run. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Chris and council members. Any more questions? Quick. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, boy, I'd love to hear again. about drones and uh, fireworks. And uh, it's uh, fun to see the administration embracing this. Uh, um, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, so uh, park rangers, uh, and uh, I would love to see, I, I see that, you know, the, the program is evolving and, and growing, and I see quite a bit of people seeing them and, and, and positive feedback from that. Um, I would love to see more <laughs> metrics about, you know, what, are what, what is being tracked, maybe a metric that could be added if it's not already there. It will be about the status of water fountains. I keep hearing about, about water fountains that are broken or leaking. Okay. Uh, if they're walking by, maybe the park, the park rangers, I actually discover a, uh, a water fountain that I never seen. And I walked by it like 40 times. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, so maybe if they knew where the water fountains are, they could actually check on them. So you guys know, and we know that they need repair. Yeah. Bathrooms, as you mentioned, adding the bathrooms uh, as part of the rotation. Um, and maybe asking more of feedback to uh, the neighbors. And I know that the, there is some of that happening, but what is uh, happening good and what could be improved, uh, that will be very important to me. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, those are great suggestions for park rangers. And um, that's how they spend most of their day is talking to the people who are visiting the parks. Um, we do have them um, do some site checks on uh, in different areas and they fill doggy bags and they, they do some things like that. Um, we are working on um, a park ranger metrics uh, dashboard that will be available all the time. And um, Nick Frederick here behind me is um, going to be putting together a quarterly report on their, their metrics. And um, we will likely be sending that to all of you through um, your council staff, just as kind of some information that if you want to put it in your newsletter, that would be great about what the park rangers are do, doing. It's such a new program. People don't really understand. And this is truly our first summer of, you know, being fully staffed and 
um, their planning programs, they're going to be doing educational um, uh, sp speech, uh, not speeches, but um, programs for the public. Um, they're doing uh, programs with elementary schools and with youth city. So there, there's a lot of really cool things that are going on with the park rangers this summer. And you said and uh, uh, that we probably don't know Nick, but I do know Nick for you know oh, maybe 10 years. Excellent. Uh, so yes, yeah, a good choice. Thank you. We're very happy. Uh, Councilor Dugan and then Petro. <clears throat> Great question, the park rangers, because I appreciate all that the program there, but I'm also curious and I'm, I'm not sure I wrote it down in my notes about the animal control uh, contract with the uh, county. Yeah. We talked about having two additional uh, FTEs were pretty much working for the city on animal control. Uh, are they going to report to parks, the rangers, or how are they going to coordinate with the rangers and on their enforcement of their work? And who's going to direct them on, on uh, where they should be uh, focusing some of their time? So that is not included with this budget this year. That was um, a proposal that we had um, in our legislative intent for how we can improve the maintenance of our parks. Two new animal control officers would greatly um, have an, a huge impact on, on our parks, um, but that was not part of the budget this year. So when that um, comes forward if that's approved. We will um, work with animal control on what that looks like, and um, they will. They would still be supervised by the county, although um, they would be directed by us in where we want them to go and what activities we want them to do. Okay. And what was it? Did you remember what the uh, uh, the cost? Yeah, it was, was two two fifty. Yeah, two hundred and fifty thousand per year. Well, two hundred and fifty thousand a year plus vehicle. Sorry, just a so, reminder that oh, yeah. We, yeah. we can't hear it in the there's, recording. There is a vehicle cost. Um, uh, it's a one-time cost. Right, it's going to have to have to house a house a, uh, a pet or a has to house the animal pets, yes. in the back. Right. Okay. So two hundred fifty dollars plus vehicle fees. Yeah. That's not included in the budget. That's why I didn't see it. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Okay. I was thinking it was. All right. Uh, and then on change of subject on back to the uh, deferred maintenance. We have a long list of deferred maintenance uh, and the plan moving forward to uh, handle and you know stop the bleeding and also starting uh, attacking some of those deferred maintenance. Is there? A, could you kind of walk us through again the plan to to uh, to handle that deferred maintenance going forward? Because I know there's like 14 million over 12 parks or 12 million over 14 parks for irrigation systems. Uh, and how right. are we going to close that gap? Well, we're hoping to close the gap in part through the geo bond with um, some of the reimagined nature, uh, reimagined parks um, will include the um, irrigation, updating of irrigation. And I can send you a list. I have a list of um, the active projects. Right now we have eight irrigation um, projects in process, Nine Line Community Orchard, Allen Park, Bachman Community Open Space, Cemetery Irrigation, Fisher Mansion, Hidden Hollow, um, Memorial Tree Groves is in design and infrastructure right now phase, and the Peace Labyrinth. We have four that are requested for 2024 from public lands, and three that are requested through constituent applications. All those include irrigation up, upgrades. Currently, we get $250,000 a year in deferred maintenance that we have used for to you know tackle some of those smaller pro, um, projects. And I'm hoping that um, in 2025, with this added 675, 678 that I was talking about remaining from this 2 million, that going back into FOF, that would be used for maintenance of um, our, our facilities as problems come up and arise. So so we're looking at a few years out to kind of pretty much uh, <clears throat> correct all those deferred maintenance and get it back to a more reasonable level of deferred maintenance. There is a lot of deferred maintenance in our park system, and um, it will be an ongoing 
ongoing thing for, for a long time. And as, as we um, put money into our parks through capital projects, we try to upgrade um, those systems wherever we can, our irrigation systems, but um, they're very expensive. And so it's a, um, it's a costly fix yeah, for irrigation. There's also, I'll just add, um, there is a CIP application that wasn't approved for funding um, for an irrigation maintenance plan that we um, put forward, um, but that wasn't advanced by the CDCIP board. Council member Wharton and the council member Peter also had a comment, right? But is your follow up on council member Dukins? No, it is not. So, okay, go council member Peter and then. Councilman Wharton. Um, I know that there are foothills discussions coming, and I'm going to amplify in advance what what is said probably with him. Amplify. <laughs> I'm going to pre-amplify, but I'm going to go ahead and let you handle that one since that's your wheelhouse. But can we talk about the special events? Yeah. Is this a new function? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> can we have a more guided discussion directly responsive to concerns I have around them? Thank you. <laughs> um, is this a new function for you all? Yes, okay. or public lands it is. So um, when we became a department and split from public services, we took on that special events coordinator. And so yappy hours and bike to work with the mayor, um, those kind of things are um, is what our special events person is doing right now. And so currently our staffing is we have one special events dedicated person and we're asking for an assistant. Yes. Now I know by design and by statute, we're not a parks and rec um, in that department. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like this is an organic fit for you or do you feel like maybe there's a realignment? Because I know so much of this overlap, I'm thinking of how much overlaps with like what the arts council does for so many of our events and things like that. And I'm wondering if there are efficiencies and ways for us to help streamline the process so that you all can do what you do really well and we can maybe potentially improve customer service or am I missing something? Is this very organic to what you all do? Um, it, so recreation used to be in, um, in with our um, group of people. It wasn't even a division back then. Um, and the Salt Lake County has taken over that role. Um, all of the special events that are happening through our events coordinator are um, happening in public lands spaces. There might be a few like the bike to work. There could be some street Is festivals. North Temple one of those? Uh, yeah. And that's an example of one that's not, okay. but most of them are. Um, and our special events person works very closely with our park staff um, on those events. Um, it, it could go to a, a different division, um, but I think there is a lot of um, um, efficiencies gained by having our special event person um, running those events in our in our parks um, and just knowing all the park staff. I mean, our park staff generally, when we have like yappy hours in our parks, they will adjust their hours and work later. Um, we as I said, adjust irrigation systems, which all that could be done somewhere else as well. Um, that's my background is recreation. I spent 20 years running recreation programs for the city or for the county. And so um, I'm very comfortable with it in our group and um, and they, they work well with, we, we also run um, a lot of volunteer programs. So we have a volunteer coordinator and those two work very closely together um, because Sometimes a volunteer activity is also like a big special event, like purge the spurge or get in the river, those kind of things. And our volunteer coordinator works very closely with our events coordinator as well. But in any case, we're not starting this this time. We're just no. enhancing what you think. We're adding nine more events to okay. our, our portfolio of events. Thank yeah. you. Councilor Warden. Okay. So um, I couldn't quite tell from this budget proposal, but you're asking us to um, lift the contingent appropriation for the trails, right? Or are you asking for that to stay in place? No, we are not asking for that at this time. Um, we are continuing to do maintenance um, on the trails. 
Um, and we are, this summer, we will finish the trails evaluation plan and environmental study, and we will present that to you. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, we will ask for that to be lifted. Um, so that is not coming with this budget unless that's something that has to come with the budget season. Oh, well, no, I just meant because you had talked a lot about trails maintenance, and I didn't know if that was was contemplating using some of that money that we had put on hold. Um, so are you able to do the trails maintenance that you're planning in this budget without any of that money? That's right. Okay. And this that, is for ongoing uh -huh. maintenance staff. And like through the, this team, the trails maintenance yes. team. Yeah. Okay. And this, um, the trails maintenance team, this is, these are going to be, are we going to be using, what kind of machinery is going to be involved? <laughs> You want to come talk this about this, team. Tyler? Thanks. Hello. Uh, yes. So with regards to our trails maintenance team, we're requesting two full-time positions that would also work with uh, four seasonal staff that would work in maintenance in the foothills. Mm -hmm. We do not have any machinery uh, that we use for our internal maintenance. Uh, and we don't anticipate using that at this time. Um, we do, we are excited to have uh, four on-call trail contractors that we're utilizing for maintenance as well. And they often will use machinery uh, for trail maintenance, but we're not requesting any specific trail maintenance machinery as part of our internal request. Okay, how, how much do you think that you'll, that they will be relying on machinery like i'm talking more heavy heavy machinery for maintenance i think that's a hard question to answer right now as part of the foothill trails addendum that will come with our uh, evaluation we're developing a maintenance plan that will be uh, attached to the foothill trails master plan and i i think we could probably outline within that when machinery would be required i think there's a lot of opportunity for hand uh, work, but there are certain trails that were constructed with machines dating back to the 1970s that we're going to have to have machines maintain these trails. Um, and so I think we could we could uh, look at guidelines for when machines may be used as part of our evaluation, but I, I can't answer a percentage right now. Okay. Um, and then could you? I don't want to. I don't want to ruin the surprise of the of the presentation that you're going to give later. Um, but can you kind of recap what is being done now to comply with um, the requirements of the contingent appropriation and where you are in that process so far? Happy to. And uh, we held meetings last week that council was invited to that shared the executive summary from our evaluation report. Uh, and that was shared last week. So a video recording, if you haven't seen that, you all should have that now. Uh, we have essentially three consultants that are working on the Foothill Trails evaluation. One uh, is focusing on how implementation was done and the Foothill Trails master plan. We have five areas that they're focusing on. Assess the 2020 Foothill Trails master plan, evaluate the quality and impacts of phase one implementation, evaluate proposed future development with attention towards recognized best practices, provide recommendations for all future trail development in the foothills, engage with all city departments, external stakeholders, and members of the public about the future of the Foothill Trail system, and develop a maintenance plan to guide Salt Lake City public lands through ongoing maintenance and management of the Foothill Trails. I believe each of those bullet points addresses the budget contingency that was passed in June 21 by city council. We have an executive summary right now uh, that outlines the initial findings of that evaluation. And we look by, we anticipate by August having complete uh, evaluation report completed. Is the executive summary, is that public facing? Uh, I believe the executive summary was shared last week uh, as part of the presentation, but if it's not, we could share that with with city council, certainly. Okay. Yeah, I would be, I, I would like to see it. And then if, you know, if we can share it with members of the public, let me know. Um, I understand if it's not ready yet, then, you know, I would respect that. But um, yeah, I would like to know, because um, I thought the meeting that we had recently was really helpful. i would like to see it was a lot to digest though so i'd like to see it in written form so that i can kind of work through it 
Um, and, and can I just share that? Um, I, I think Cindy Gus Jensen also has the copy of that executive report and that email I sent so she could send it to all of you. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right. Thanks. That's all I have for now then. Thanks. All right, council members, any more questions for public lands? All right, thank you, appreciate thank you. your presentation. Thank you for giving us some, a lot to think about with how to use the funding of future dollars. And we are now on item five, which is a break. Break was supposed to be scheduled until four, till 325, it's 341 right now. <laughs> But we don't have a, we have only a special limited formal meeting tonight. And so I think we're okay to be a little bit behind the time if everyone's okay staying a little past seven. Um, we will take a 20 minute break. I think we deserve it. I think we are on well we i know that we are on item number six and i think we can get started because we have everyone in the room and the council policy analyst on this item this is the fiscal year 2023-24 budget for the department of public services and kira luke is with us hi kira i haven't seen you in a long time it's been a little over a year i believe <laughs> it's good to be back well Welcome, and it uh, sounds like you might have an introduction to this item, and then we'll have Jorge Chamorro and Julie Crookston from the Department of Public Services, as well as Mary Beth Thompson available for questions if necessary. But Kira, go ahead and give us an introduction. Okay, so just to give a quick overview orientation, the Public Services Department manages a lot of public facing services through its streets and compliance divisions. They also provide support for a lot of internal city functions through the facility services, which manages a lot of the city owned assets, um, engineering, which does like rights of way and mapping and permits, um, administrative services and the fleet enterprise fund. That one is briefed separately, um, I believe later today. Well, this briefing covers the rest of the divisions which receive their funding through the general fund. Um, the proposed budget for FY24 is $43,105,409, which is 9% or $3.7 million more than the adopted budget from fiscal year 23. This budget includes funding for nine new FTEs since FY23 was adopted, one of which received funding in Budget Amendment 4, and four of those are full-time positions through the city's apprenticeship program. Some of the policy topics that council members may wish to consider during the briefing are listed on page three of the staff report and include considerations about recruitment and retention of hard to fill positions, funding for city owned assets that are overdue for maintenance or replacement, um, plans for new parking pay stations and how best to provide electric vehicle charging. Um, a couple of other pertinent topics to keep in mind that have been in recent discussions are funding and staffing levels for street maintenance and balancing current service levels with the proposed overlay pilot program that's in this year's budget, or the FY24 proposal. Um, one more thing worth noting is recent years increase in need support for compliance for RV encampment mitigation, which has affected the compliance divisions call response times and ability to enforce other parking violations across the city. Those are the things that I wanted to highlight. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to the department. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Kara. Hi, Jorge. Hello. Um, do you have slides? Oh, looks like they're coming yep. up. Oh, perfect. OK, before I start, I would like to introduce uh, Julie Crookson here uh, deputy director of public services and i believe online we have uh, jp goats who is joining from uh, portland he's out on a conference but um, Jorge. hello jp excuse me if you could just pull the microphone a little bit closer to sure you thank thing. you is that much better yeah all right excellent well um thank you for the opportunity to present this uh, budget related to the public services department thank you kira for the introduction 
The Public Services Department has in its mission, next slide, please, uh, to provide essential municipal services in an effective, efficient, and fiscally sustainable way. Next slide, please. As Kira mentioned, we have um, technically six divisions, including the administrative services in this building. Uh, the fleet division will have its own uh, presentation time later today. But um, how do we accomplish this municipal service providing? Um, this is a breakdown. We have about 270 full-time employees. And I would like to take a moment to also mention that we have many part-time employees and seasonal employees that are crucial, a crucial part of our operations. Uh, next slide, please. This is the first request in our budget. Um, we experience every year a series of contractual increases that are built in in, in many of our contracts, uh, price escalation that is allowed. Um, this request for 1.2 million also includes uh, some price escalation on utility cost. Um, there is an overtime equalization. Every year we uh, increase by the recommended uh, cost of living adjustment salaries. However, overtime needs to catch up. And so this year we are putting about 11,000 to make sure that we equalize the overtime allocation that we have in our budget. The biggest um, part of this pie that is not contractual increases is natural gas and power increase. Next slide, please. All right. The second request here is to allocate $45,000 that historically have been uh, allocated to the sustainability department for public facing electric vehicle charging stations. We have 20 public facing stations across the city. That is a total of 40 ports for charging. Uh, we, we have a contract for maintenance. We don't perform it in-house. We haven't reached that point where it makes sense to do it in-house. Um, in the future, if more charging stations are installed in the public right-of-way or even in-house for internal purposes, uh, we may move this to a, a maintenance program in-house. For now, $45,000 will pay for um, the subscription, the yearly subscription for, uh, for these charging stations to keep them live and be able to record those, those uh, sessions, as well as um, incidental maintenance that um, happens when people report something is, is, is wrong with the charging station. We go, double check, call the contractor, and they, they fix it for us. All right, next slide, please. All right. This request is after identifying a gap in our operations citywide. The request is for a new FTE. As safety and security director, this is going to provide an internal services citywide. Oh, yeah, there is Richard. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, this position will coordinate closely with risk management, uh, PD, facilities and emergency management will develop safety trainings for employees across the city, those that not currently have a safety manager, as well as serve as a subject matter expert overseeing security management of contracted services, access control to our buildings, building security needs assessments, among other functions. All right, next slide. All right. This is another request for an FTE. This is an environmental engineer. In coordination with uh, the sustainability department, we have identified another gap in our operation. As part owner of the landfill, the city is responsible to provide engineering services for capital projects. There are several projects of large magnitude that are already lined up for the next five to 10 years to be built. That includes a new gas capture system, a perimeter road, and the expansion of the unloading facility. 
Additionally, this employee will work closely with the sustainability department to develop a soils management plan for the city, as well as facilitate environmental site assessments. All right, next slide, please. All right, we have one more FTE in our requests. This is for a building administrator. The needs of this building, City Hall, as a mixed use building that is open to the public are diverse in nature and demanding in time and attention. Um, from space rental requests, special event coordination, office space, and reconfiguration needs, this employee will provide the customer service and coordination for the occupants of this building. Next slide, please. All right, this is a very exciting one. The facilities division has put together a, an apprenticeship program, a full-time apprenticeship program. The city and city council approve $1 million to be non-departmental to promote uh, apprenticeships. These apprenticeships were uh, on a part-time basis. We are requesting the creation of four FTEs using that allocation of money, about $332,000 to support four new FTEs with minimal barriers to enter a career in the city and develop them all the way to um, a master person that could um, fill the needs in any department of the city. Right now, as you may be aware, trades are really hard to recruit, tradespeople. So with this, with this program, we will bring anyone from entry level to their master certification. And then um, once they graduate from this program, they can fill any need in, in, in the city, not just in facilities. Next slide, please. All right, this one is also very exciting. As you may have heard, the city has two approaches to improving the condition of the roads. One is reconstruction and the other one is maintenance. The approach for reconstruction is worst condition first. We're gonna reconstruct those roads that are, as you can see in this table, are on the fail or serious condition. Whereas on the other and the opposite side of the spectrum, maintenance goes best first to preserve that road for as long as possible. In the middle category, we have a gap. We haven't been able to implement a surface treatment that is effective enough to prevent those roads from dropping into the, the, the lowest category and, and be candidates for reconstruction. Reconstruction is the most expensive um, solution here. So what we're proposing is a mill and overlay program. It's another surface treatment to the roads that is localized that addresses this middle category and prevents them from dropping into the poor category and needing reconstruction. This approach is twofold. We have um, $130,000 in this request, but CIP also includes $750,000 for equipment. Next slide, please. This is our last slide with the summary of our requests, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Jorge. Councilman Dugan. Sure. Thank you very much for the explanation, the, the mill overwork uh, overlay, and, and I appreciate that because you're right. It's too expensive. You can't just do the top and have a chip seal over it, and, and you, you, know, you got to wait until it gets really in bad conditions. And that's not good too, because then it takes forever and it's in bad, and then it requires a lot of potholes. Mm -hmm. And those two two fundings are also different, right? There's got potholes, and then you have the uh, street reconstruction money, right? Correct. Uh, but we also had we always had a goal of 155 miles on the reconstruction, and the, that that goal is also reduced with this mill overwork overlay. Uh, but is the intention that this mill overlay in the long term will be less expensive and also do more miles or at least keep the miles uh, in better shape for longer? 
Okay. First, I would like to clarify that the 155 miles that is currently our goal is not for reconstruction, but for surface treatments. Okay. So maintenance, right? right. Okay. Uh, chip seal, um, crack sealing. Yeah, yeah. All of that. Yes, we are reducing the, the goal slightly to be able to use the same staff that we currently have to incorporate five miles of overlays, mill and overlays. In this first year, piloting that program will, will put us in a better position at the end of the year to know how much we need to bring back the 155 and expand the overlay program. Because as I mentioned in CIP, we have uh, a request to purchase equipment. So by the end of the year, we will have the equipment and we will have better knowledge of what it takes to expand that mill and overlay program. So you're saying this, the CIP request for the equipment and the $130,000 for the staff, that's for staffing? No, the 150 is for materials. Oh, for the materials, the, for the mill and overlay program. This, the staff is coming from the ship seal. The it's current, yes. Yeah. Current staff. So no new staff, mm -hmm. but we will reduce the number that we do the surface treatment to, but increase, but you're saying we're, we're only going to get five lane miles yes. this year. Oh. Yes. So it's a very conservative approach, but also it's, it's the first time we're introducing this as, as a surface treatment. And the most important thing here is once you do a mill and overlay, you bring them up to enough of a good condition that you can preserve them now with the surface treatment. Right. Right. Because they're no, they're no longer getting, because they can't get treated right now because it's too expensive to do a chip seal because it's not doesn't work. And they're, you're, they're waiting to get the really bad conditions, which we don't want to get to because we want to extend their life. Back so, one slide to slide 10. That and, was a question for staff oh, or whoever's right. On, on that now, on the pothole side, those are two different teams, two different groups of, of workers. Because the potholes, you don't really have a set budget. You just fill in potholes. And I know we've filled out a lot more potholes this year than we have last year. Correct. For the full years. And we will continue doing that. Um, yes. But that's two different teams. Or yes. Yes. They, 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 let's, let's put a pothole response will not be impacted by in, introducing this, this pilot program. Okay. And, but the, ultimate goal would be that the roads are going to get better conditioned and our bond money will go further and get better, uh, go further and w with more lay miles than the current system we have right now without the military. We're basically broadening the, the number of lane miles that are eligible for a treatment. We're introducing another um, tool to the, to the toolbox. And I, I, can I, on this slide, so we're going from good all the way down to failed. Mm -hmm. And you're saying the complete reconstruction is for failed. Is it also serious? Like which of these categories will the mill and overlay hit? They have on this slide. Highlighted ones. Oh, okay. The fair and the poor. So Correct. good and satisfactory is what is currently happening. Currently happening with the chip seal and the crack seal. So once we get to very poor, serious, or failed, then even the mill and overlay is not possible. You must do reconstruction. Am I understanding that right? Yes. However, there is there is one 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 thing. It's a partial depth reconstruction, which is uh, the mill and overlay that we are proposing here. And I didn't want to get into the details, but I'm I'm glad that you're curious. <laughs> um, so this maintenance uh, piece that we are proposing here goes to two inches of depth. There are certain segments of roads that will need more than two inches, but that is considered partial depth reconstruction. So it's on the reconstruction side of things for which we have engineering and, and CIP budget class C funds that are, that are directed to that. Uh, Pui and then Petro. Thank you for the presentation. I, okay. I have a few questions and I'm going to go back to mill and overlay, uh, but I want to start with the building administrator. All right. Um, and I'm still, you know, would you go back again to, uh, you know, tell me a little more about this new FTE and what it will do? Yeah, as I mentioned, um, that would be a slide number eight, if you want to display that, please. So this FTE will be dedicated to this building. 
as you all know, this is a mixed use building. We have board meetings, we have employees working here, we have um, a leased space, special events. And so the coordination of all of those has been handled by multiple staff and sometimes wrangle those and, and ensure that the communication is, is appropriate, timely, it's a challenge. Coordinating with our contracted services, such as janitorial and security is, is another piece. So this person will be your building administrator. If you have a need in your office, such as I would like to reconfigure this office and have two desks instead of one, that person will be able to put you in, in touch with the vendor for, for that furniture need, as well as a sp space planner. So you have um, a design for your office. So all the needs of this building will be addressed by this individual. Okay, that, that's interesting. I, you know, I'm sure that uh, it says can should, uh, and I, I, I feel like it probably we should. Uh, but I, uh, I, I keep on hearing so much, and I know probably the only one who hears a lot about the, our roads. Uh, you know, and uh, from uh, the perspective of, you know, a neighbor that doesn't know what's, you know, what, what the city is doing and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like as, as far as priorities go, uh, we probably should um, fund more in our roads than, you know, an administrator. And I know that I'm not saying and I'm not diminishing the, the, the challenges that you probably, you know, seen uh, as, you know, in your position trying to coordinate this building and the many departments and the many mm -hmm. people. I can not even imagine how complex that is, but you know when we're asking for one hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars, um, and you're asking for one hundred and thirty thousand for this uh, mill and overlay pilot program, I tend to feel like maybe we should hunt a little longer for that building administrator mm -hmm. and put you know you know more money into your pilot program and see if we can actually like do double than we can that you are proposing. And I don't know if that's even possible. So my question is, and I know that that mm -hmm. I'm asking you uh, to give me an answer to change your proposed budget, uh, which might put you in an awkward position. But let's say you do have two hundred and sixty thousand dollars for your mill and overlay pilot program. Could you do double the work on your pilot program if you do have the double amount of money, or 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 more? I think Julie will agree with me, but we will be stretching the current staffing. And doubling the amount of materials wouldn't get us to double the number of miles. We will we we are stretching to the point of what can we do with the current staff, and we are diverting from from other maintenance right. functions. That let me tell you, the more the more we do maintenance on those good condition roads, we reach a point where we are running out of candidates. We already treated this road; it doesn't make sense to come back the next year and do it again. So we're, we're dialing down a little bit on that for the first year only, right? To, to, to answer your question, in the long term, we would like to come back next year and say, this was successful. We would like to implement a mill and overlay program that will address not only five miles, but potentially 20 and, and present you uh, um, a chart that says, with this amount of money, we can do this many could, miles. Could we, instead of then giving you more money for the mill and overlay pilot program, give you more FTEs to actually work on the roads. Um, they're not for the mile and overlay program. I still will argue that, you know, yes, we have done, covered more potholes than we have ever, but mm -hmm. the neighbors, I see more pothole than, than, than has ever seen uh, probably in history. At least the general feeling is that we're full of potholes. And uh, and I feel like that is a priority. And I, will, I, I don't know if we really need 131,000 building administrator when we have so much in the streets. I mean, I'm listening to the neighbors and I'm getting mm -hmm. so many complaints about our roads. So, uh, and then really quick on the environmental engineer. Can uh, we clarify something on the building administrator yeah. first? Uh, Councilman Petro has a question. So if we were to cut it, it appears from the notes in our budget that we, it would only be about a $51,000 savings since in the notes you say we're already spending $80,000 a year on these coordinations. So if we were to cut it, it wouldn't be the full 131 that we would be cutting. It looks like it would be 51750 which which you still might want to add to it, but 
it felt like a clarification worth making that we would be able to double through that the 80,000 that we're currently spending is now taken out of this and being replaced by the 133 for the new FTE. It is, it is an, an overall savings. Yes. Because we wouldn't be using your, um, space planner in, in as much because you have now a coordinator on site that will be able to take care of that. But it's not an overall savings. We are adding money to fill, to, to, to pay, right? Correct. But we're, yeah, we're streamlining and taking this 80, this ad hoc $80,000 and putting it into one place that then I'm imagining where the cost savings come in, comes in is it streamlines all the other departments and everyone else's work into one yeah. workflow. Uh, maybe Mary Beth or Kira or someone to, to clarify, does that 80,000 come out of this budget or if we were to cut this building administrator, do we have to find 80,000 to put back in, in order to do the base level of service that we're currently doing? Yes. So, so, the, so Councilman Petro is correct. We have taken $80,000 out, put 130 back in. So taking this away would be a net savings of, of about $51,750. Okay. And just, just roughly, um, okay, sorry. <laughs> I think that answers the question. Yeah question right I think okay. that was yeah. important. Yeah. Go, go on to the uh, then the, the the question about the environmental engineer you you touched on and on uh a little bit more on that um you said if i remember right you mentioned uh some big projects to catch some uh gas uh you know and, and these projects haven't been funded is that correct these potential projects that this engineer will be working on or have they correct and i failed to mention that um we will be able to build a county. So we provide the service of engin the engineering service for, for these capital projects. But the county is responsible for paying for those projects because they collect the revenue from, from the landfill. And so we will be able to build a county and recoup some of this money for some of this $178,000 for those services that we're providing. So at the end uh, of the month, if we are uh, managing a project, we will be able to send a bill to the county and say for engineering services, here is the bill, and we recoup that money as, as revenue to the city. That's important. Thank you. I appreciate that clarification. Yep. All right. Council Petro. Councilman Petro? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. First, I want to voice incredible support for the safety and security manager. We've kind of been doing this ad hoc, even causing consternation among ourselves, what the security priorities should be and how to allocate money towards them. And we are not keeping pace with the threats and the concerns that I have coming into work every day. So I really want to voice support for that position. Um, the second thing is on the apprentice. We have this phrase in there that says once they're um, once they're done with this position, they'll be they'll be able to do anything. Do we have, first of all, any projections for how long that will take? Will, will they be employed with us four years for that to happen? And then once that happens, do we have any ways to incentivize them staying with us? I love my community, mm -hmm. but I really don't feel like it's our calling to train workers for them. I would like to, I would like to train to fill our gaps. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the first question, how long will it take to reach that level of um, mastery? So there are, we will rely on, on the state path to certification, the, uh, the registered apprenticeships with the state, which could take anywhere from two to four years, depending on the trade. But once they reach that level, again, they, can, they, they may be able to take any position uh, in the city that requires that certification, a plumber, an electrician, um, the, the incentive to, to stay with the city, the level of pay that they, they will get as, a, as an apprentice is, is limited compared to what they can make as, um, as a certified plumber, for example. But the reality is that in this economy, a certified plumber is making even more money in the private sector. So we are hoping that in, in two to four years, the tide turns and they are better off staying with the city, right? But uh, the idea is, is, is build that, that um, from, from, from scratch, right? We are removing as many barriers as possible. And so with the development of this, this individual, not just in the technical side, 
but also on on you know incentivizing to to stay with the city as a, as a career path for them as a long term career path it's it's part of a, you know we we will like to ensure that they like the city and they stay with us and so it'll be four people at any given time if someone has a two year path according to the trajectory that one gets filled after two and the other ones yes the, the, the four position will, will always remain as okay, as so it won't be like a cohort of four every year it's just four at any given time right I would be interested, and I don't know if this is a legislative intent or what it is, in looking at ways to incentivize them, saying that maybe um, our creative and outside budget, maybe like, well, I guess it's not outside of budget, but like maybe say they can start at a more advanced uh, pay grade or something if they stay with, you know, things that we can control, maybe from an HR standpoint mm -hmm. to I, incentivize them staying with us. That feels like a really deep investment we're making, and I'd like to make sure we get good ROI on it. Mm -hmm. Council member Wharton and then Dugan. Is there any way that the, maybe I'm not understanding the positions, but the building administrator and the building security specialist can be combined? Because isn't that similar or isn't there some overlap there? There, there is a little bit of overlap and I'm, I'm sure they're going to be collaborating for this building specifically. The safety and security director is a is an internal service for all the buildings oh, you see. see. Whereas okay. the building administrator is just okay. Just this this building, special events. Again, we have a least space in the in the first floor. We have special um, reservations for this building for special events as well. So all of that coordination that's the building administrator, just localized. Okay. I mean, I I, I tend to agree with. What Councilmember Pui was saying that I think this is probably something that we should have, but I um, have some reservations about moving forward with it right now and given some of the other needs, but maybe I need to understand more. So, yeah. Thanks. Councilman Dugan. Uh, Sorry, I'm going right back to the mill and overlay. <laughs> if you 750,000 for the, uh, the equipment is on the CAP. Uh, is that equipment working two shifts? And if you had $1.5 million to buy additional equipment, would you be able to, you know, uh, use that equipment on two different shifts and, you know, 24 hours a day over the five months that we have a season to do this? Is that, it, I think it's, it's, it's a little bit too, too preliminary to, to give that assessment. Yeah. We would love to uh, introduce more. And again, um, I am hopeful that, before the end of this coming fiscal year, we are ready to make a proposal to expand that and say, yes, we can run this. What what months of the year make sense to do Milan overlays, right? Um, how many people do we need? And again, make a proposal to say, we can start now a long-term plan for this program um, that goes beyond the five miles that we're proposing now. Yes. So, uh, I mean, I, I know we keep talking about this one thing, but I do think this is a good program. I'm excited that you're doing it. I'm interested in the, what did you say, slightly deeper yes. scrape and fill that's not a mill. I don't know what that means. But um, I'm interested in those things because I do think um, my ultimate goal is that we are reconstructing all of our streets to be more complete streets and to be safer and all of those things. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're going, that is a program that we, need to do that takes more time we need transportation to help design that program we need there's like community input and all sorts of things that need to happen so the longer we can keep our the less we can spend to keep our current streets lasting a little bit longer what i don't want to do is reconstruct a street and have it look the same as it currently does and not have safe bike lanes and and pedestrian paths and things like that so um, i think it's good for us to be able to keep sort of putting band-aids on our streets until we have time to completely reconstruct the them in, in meaning completely better landscaping at all of those things. So um so appreciate that we're looking at at that. Councilor Gui. On on the streets, uh that, that graph uh as uh, on the overall condition. Um 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there is not enough manpower or, or workload hours, uh, uh, you know, to, to fix all this. Uh, but I'm sure that I would like to hear a little more about what uh, your department is doing to work on those uh, poor, very poor and serious roads uh, that don't involve reconstructing it. But like, you know, you know, do we need more? Uh, do we need more staff to go fill them, fill potholes? Do we need, what do you need from us? Because it really is such a pressing issue right now. And we're getting flooded with comments about this. Uh, I mean, at least I am. And, you know, every time I go to a community council, every time I go to uh, a community event and receiving some phone calls and emails about our condition of our roads, mm -hmm. and I, I would like to know what I'm telling them. I would want to know what the administration is doing uh, to address the issue. But this may be more a question for transportation, actually, but I, I'm wondering if some of those ones that we we just reduce the width of the street, will that mean that we have we can get further more <laughs> neighborhoods done with the same lane miles because we're not repaving the entire enormous right of way that we don't need? <laughs> or just put some planters in or put those concrete things that John was talking about. But um, put a green loop. A, gr a green loop. <laughs> these, all, these are all not <laughs> easier to maintain. But but I do think uh, what, what we should not be doing is repaving these overly wide streets that are unnecessary. So right, right. And 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 again, that really, again, there, there is the always an opportunity when when we do surface treatments and, and we coordinate closely with transportation when there is a chip seal, which is a great opportunity to uh, restripe the road and and um, implement some of those complete streets elements, right? The soft ones, not the hard tape, but um, there is always an opportunity to do that. Even with this uh, uh, mill and overlay program, there is there is an opportunity to do that. And this we we are not limited to to what we are proposing here. CIP includes also uh, uh, additional funding for reconstruction of roads. So, in in a little bit to answer your question, Councilmember Pui, um, we are. First, we are reaching the end of, of this uh, bond with one of the biggest, two of the biggest projects in the city, 200 South and 2100 South, right? And that presents an opportunity to look at what is next. And I would like to leave that conversation for another opportunity, but yes, there is already uh, forethought of what is coming next and how are we going to address what you, if, if you go back to um, slide number 10, Perfect. As you can see in this chart, as of October 2021, we have a good understanding of what our roads are in terms of condition. So the planning will incorporate this latest assessment, its uh, latest survey to, to plan the investment that the city will put towards uh, improving the condition of the road. That in some cases is reconstruction and in some cases is, is a different type of maintenance. You do reconstruction, you take a couple feet off each side and you have that many more lane miles going. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a natural street uh, calming mechanism. Reduce the urban we do not island. endorse okay. any ad hoc modifications to the city. <laughs> <laughs> and all right. One strategy. I would just like to add that some of the maintenance we do, we do to all roads, like potholes, no matter the condition of the road, if there's a pothole, we repair it. So sure. some of the maintenance we're doing isn't dependent on if it's fair or failed. We're not all maintenance, but we are addressing maintenance on all the roads as we're able. And I hope that at least for myself, I, I hope it doesn't sound like we're saying you're not doing your job because you are doing your job very well. It's just something that also, your job is incredibly important, and our constituents care very, very much about what you do. So, thank you for what you're doing, and please continue to uh, bring us ideas like Mill and Phil for how we can serve the community better. On that, I, I think what what I'm hearing, and I think what we're all trying to say is how important this what you're doing is. Um, council members, are we okay to move on to golf fund? Okay. Thank you so right. much. Well, thank Let's you. move on to item number seven, which is the fiscal year 2023-24 budget for the golf fund. Uh, Jennifer Bruno, Deputy Director of the City Council Office, and Mary Beth Thompson are here, and I see Matt, um, Kamire, 
I always pronounce it wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. And Kristen Riker from Public Lands. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just do a really quick intro before I turn it over to these guys. Um, the Gulf Fund is an enterprise fund contained within the Department of Public Lands, but because it's an enterprise fund, it's briefed separately. Um, this is a little bit of a unique enterprise fund in that it does receive an annual subsidy from the general fund and has for a couple of years. That's detailed in the non-departmental budget. Um, that subsidy is a little bit less this year than it was in the previous fiscal years, so that's important to note. Um, also, I wanted to make a, a typo correction on my staff report. I said it would be increasing by $635 million for fiscal year 2024, which is not true. It's increasing. The operational budget is increasing by $635,000 um, for a total of $10.8 million and 34.2 full-time FTEs. That does not include $7.1 million in capital projects, which are funded with a separate $2 per nine hole round CIP fee that's dedicated to uh, capital projects in the Gulf Fund. And that was a fee established by the city a couple of years ago to help the Gulf Fund catch up on some of their needed um, deferred capital projects. Those um, specific projects can be found on page six of the staff report. So with that, I'll turn it over to these guys. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jennifer. So thank you, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, giving you an overview of our budget, which we're, um, we're, we're you hearing him do. okay. Can you, Can you hear me all right? A little, yeah, sorry, just got it. All right, thank get you. Get real close. Okay, so if I can have whoever's controlling the slideshow get us to uh, slide number three. Thank you. I just wanted to briefly um, restate this. This is something that uh, we've really tried to focus on as a division for the last the last four years, but our our kind of four areas of focus. Um, one being to grow the game so that it continues to bring people in and that we can have a, uh, a healthy player base that continues to support uh, this activity. Um, we want to be able to focus on, on developing and retaining our, our staff and employees uh, so that we can preserve these assets. Um, the third item there is to improve the assets. Uh, most of our golf facilities uh, are, are well beyond where they, where they should be. They're, they've not been updated deferred maintenance issues and whatnot, but there are things that we can do ourselves, painting facilities, making sure that things are, are kept tidy and 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 run as efficient as, as possible and to try to find ways to to be able to improve these assets, so hopefully within the next within the next decade or so. And finally is to be a, a community partner. We recognize that we are an enterprise fund, but these are public spaces as well. And we try to find other activities that that can bring value to the community as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. One thing that we look at, and I always make a point to, to present here as part of our presentation, is, is our, our fiscal year tracking of, of golf rounds. Um, these rounds are what we refer to as nine-hole equivalent rounds. So if somebody plays a nine-hole round, that counts as one. If somebody plays 18 holes, that counts as two and whatnot. So this lines up with our within our budget. Uh, so this is a slide that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. So you can see in fiscal year 22, we had 441,000 rounds. These would be nine hole equivalent rounds. As you can see, those are, those are more rounds than we've done in the last 10 years, even back when we had nine golf courses. So it, it shows you that, um, you know, we've definitely had an increase over the last uh, two to three years. But the next slide, I think, gives you a, a better picture of what actually is happening. This this is where I track rounds on an annual basis, so from a from a, a golf season. So we would typically raise our fees within a calendar year rather than the, within the fiscal year. And I track these as a start rather than a, I don't need to go into all this, but it's so sometimes whenever somebody shows up to play a round of golf, they're counted as one. So it gives me an idea how I can compare a nine hole course to an 18 hole course. But you can look at the last five years, the increase that we've had in not only total starts, but there's a there's a metric here that, that gives you a little bit more, a better understanding of what our capacity is. So capacity is kind of like our inventory. On a golf course, an inventory changes on a daily basis. So you have sunrise and sunset that changes daily. So the, the number amount, the amount of play that we get during any given day changes. So I needed to have something that I can look at that I'm able to compare one year to the next and 
And I have some weather-based data that I use to determine a playable day. So this playable day row that you're looking at here gives you an idea of, of you know, what weather did to, to our inventory. So in 2022, you'll see two, 208 playable days. And that's as low as I've ever seen as far as I'm able to track this with the weather data that I have. So what impact did that to have so few day, playable days? We had a very hot summer. It was a record hot summer. Um, it was a very windy summer. So those two, those two things kind of combined to make a day maybe not as playable as it might otherwise be. So when you compare it to other other years that we've had, that's uh, that's not a lot of not a lot of available play. However, when you look at the total starts, you can come up with a, a utilization percentage. You'll see that we're at one hundred and five percent. So that shows you that we're we're extremely busy, even on a very hot day or a wet day or even a cold day. So that you compare that to previous years, 2017, our average utilization was 58 percent. So you can see over the last the, the, the following uh, five years after that, what's really been happening in golf. So I think this is what excites me more than anything else, because it demonstrates what the market demand is. And, and it shows that, that we're moving in a, in a good direction. It helps to inform us on our pricing um, and, and it goes into our revenue. So if you can see on this chart again, the total revenue as it tracks out in 2022, we had our highest revenue producing year that we've ever had at just over $10 million. So if you look at what does that revenue per start come out to be in 2022, that was $32.12. And compare that to where we were in 2017, you can see that that's, uh, that's a lot healthier than we were in previous years. So I, I hope you know giving you this in additional information gives you an appreciation for kind of what's, what's been happening over the last couple of years at our golf courses from a demand standpoint. So needless to say, we're, we're very busy. Uh, this year is is a new challenge for us. We, we've had a very late start because of the the, the late winter and the, the all the spring storms that we've had. In fact, we only we opened our last course this past weekend at Mountain Dell, the Canyon Course. Uh, the Lake Course has only been open for a couple of weeks. Most of our other courses didn't get open until April, so we're we're delayed. But I think with the demand that we have, we're gonna we're hopefully gonna catch up over the next few months in the summer. Next slide, please. One of the obvious challenges that we've been dealing with is, is water. And I probably get more questions about water um, than anything else. Uh, and, and obviously being in a drought situation, uh, it's really impacted um, the, what we charge and, and the, the product that we provide to the, the public um, obviously needs water, but we still want it to be responsible and and, this picture here was taken last summer, and it's it's indicative of what our other courses would have looked like in the summer. We, as part of this, because the city was in phase two of its drought plan, we dialed back a significant amount of our water use. So you can see in this picture, uh, out of play areas, uh, driving ranges, uh, transition areas did not receive irrigation at all, and which allowed us to receive uh, some significant savings over the, this last year. Next slide, please. What this slide shows is our is the last five years of our golf course water use, and these numbers are converted to to gallons per irrigated acre. And you can see that uh, each year there's there's a number of factors that influence um, the 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 final number. We may have a leak in in one of our systems. A meter may not be reading correctly or whatnot. But generally, this shows the 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 trend of our use over the last five years. Uh, Fiscal year 22, uh, when you compare it to where we were in fiscal year 21, which we were coming off a very another dry summer where we did exceed our, our water budget that year, um, we dialed back quite a bit last year. In fact, fiscal year 22 reflects a 37.5% reduction in water use. So that was significant. We hope to continue to, you know, we've learned a lot of things as far as how to run our systems a little more efficiently, which for most of our systems, which are 50 to 60 years old, is not an easy thing to do. Um, but we learned some things and we're gonna to continue to try to cut back in areas where we can. Um, we're gonna to try to catch up a little bit this year, but we're still gonna stay within our, within our budgeted areas. Next slide. 
this is a summary of our of our fiscal year 24 uh, request. Um, and bottom line here is we're we're asking for for a half of of an FTE. Uh, public lands during their presentation mentioned that we would be filling in the other half of that description, and I'll I'll be getting into that in one of our budget insights. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. This is a, just a breakdown to give you an idea of where our, our operational expenses go. Our, our biggest expense being personal services, the cost of our, our labor that being 48% of our budget. 24% uh, of the budget is for charges and services. That's uh, any number of things, uh, interdepartmental charges that we receive um, from the city. Uh, and water represents 9% of our, of our overall operational expense. Next slide, please. And we can go to the next slide too. This is just a summary of uh, some of our insights. I'll be going into each one of these insights individually. So the, there are five insights uh, for, our, for our budget that we're focusing in on. Um, number one is our uh, increases in revenue. And this, this outlines the areas that we're projecting to have revenue increases uh, for fiscal year 24 totaling $1.1 million, uh, broken down between green fees, driving range fees, golf cart rental fees, pass sales, concessions, and retail sales. So these are our main uh, revenue producing areas. We have a just a couple of fee increases that we've already implemented this to start this season would be golf cart rental fees. Uh, we have three new uh, fleets at our, three of our courses at Bonneville, Mountaindale, and Glendale. That offsets the cost there, but we've also increased the uh, the rental fee at our other courses as well. We've also increased the, the cost of some of our annual passes. And our retail sales continue to do strong. The, the previous two years have been difficult because of supply chain issues in the golf retail market. So it's been difficult for us to have uh, to be able to have enough retail items within, within our shops, but we've been able to catch up this past year and, and uh, we hope to have a good year based upon our continued um, growth in, in demand. Next slide, please. This is insight number two, which has to do with our, our request for a half of an FTE. It's a shared uh, position within public lands as a senior warehouse, warehouse operator position, a pay grade 15. And what this position is, uh, why we're covering half the cost of it is being part of the Department of in, in Public Lands. There's a lot of kind of uh, duplicate um, uh, procedures that we go through in the procurement uh, and, and the warehousing um, areas. And so we felt that this was a, a good way to be able to, to get some, uh, some consistency of, of operations and some, some efficiencies there as well. Next slide, please. This insight has to do with a seasonal wage increase. Uh, we are uh, beginning in July one. We'll be moving uh, all of our golf, our, our, sorry, our beginning wage for golf staff from thirteen dollars and fifteen cents to fifteen dollars. This one hundred eighty-six thousand dollar impact will be covered by the golf fee. In previous years, that has that increased when we've had a cost of living increase or a living wage increase. Sorry, that has been funded. Uh, partially through the general fund. This this increase will be funded entirely th through the Gulf Fund. Next slide, please. This details some inflation impacts that, that we're projecting as part of this budget um, and as part of our uh, some of our contractual um, arrangements as well. So for instance, in water, uh, Public Utilities has, has an 18% uh, rate increase, which would amount to $138,000 increase. Stormwater is up 10%. Uh, power, it's up uh, $16,000. Uh, fuel costs, 21570 And other equipment supplies, 4462 Next slide. This slide details uh, reinvestments that we're making back into the golf properties. And, and this is what it's, it feels good to be able to, to present this in a way. It's been a long time coming where golf in the past seems like we're always asking for something. This is an opportunity now through this budget where we're starting to be able to reinvest back into these properties. 
And so I've list, listed out here a number of the projects that we're continuing to do, our T-Box leveling projects. We spent 60,000 in fiscal year 23, and also we'll be doing that in fiscal year 24, and also the, the subsequent two years after that. This is a project to try to level out all of our, our hitting T areas on our courses. Uh, we prioritize those and, and probably do about anywhere from six to eight per course per year. That's, that's also over the course of four years, we should be able to hit all of them. That's what probably the biggest thing that customers complain about is an unlevel uh, hitting surface when they tee off. The next item would be the, another thing that we get complaints about are the condition of our cart paths that uh, the carts are, are on. Um, most of what we have need to be resurfaced. So this is more of a maintenance than new construction. And so we have uh, an amount for fiscal year 24, 525,000. The 950,000 that was located in fiscal year 23 is uh, that we've not had a contract finalized for that yet. So that's gonna be moved into fiscal year 24. Um, there's a parking lot at Mountain Dell that's that's just, was just replaced. Uh, we're looking at an opportunity to invest in a, a driving range at the Glendale Golf Course. This would be, we already have a driving range there, but this would be an enclosed. Your slides turned off. Are you? Was that the last slide though? Um, there's one more after this. Okay. I wonder if keep, um, keep we're having going, technical though. difficulties. <laughs> I'm just messaging. <laughs> We have them on our computer, so you can keep going. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I, I see me here, and that's always disturbing. <laughs> so to go back to the, the driving range uh, improvements at Glendale would be, a, would be a covered hitting area. We're looking at possibly doing a double-decker hitting area. Uh, as you know, with the increase in, in popularity in golf over the last few years, driving ranges do very well. And to be able to continue those operations throughout the winter months by having a heated, covered uh, area, I think, um, would bring some additional business to golf, and we feel like that would be uh, a good investment for us to be able to make with with some of these CIP funds. Is that double decker similar to that thing in uh, golf. Bell? I was not top, golf. not like that. No, but it's it's but it's, it's more it's it's would be two. One end would be open. And the sides are closed and the back is closed, but from it's, a ten thousand square foot level, it would be it would be more like mullet. Ten thousand yes. foot level, it is similar. Yes, but yeah, golf in the round. Um, I don't know if you've been that yesterday, and it was very embarrassing, but uh, <laughs> it was it was fun. It's it's a it's a somewhat dialed down version of that. We'll just say that we there's not live music and 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 our, and our food's not quite to that no level. Angry but, birds. but what it does is it provides again an, an entertaining environment where people can go and 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 hit balls and 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 do so in even in inclement weather days that we would normally be closed and not be able to receive revenue so our our projected payback period on this would be 5 to 7 years based on our projected revenue wow and the final one there is the rose park irrigation project which we've been talking about the last couple of budget cycles and so we we were able to put aside money in the last budget, uh, 1.8 million is a matching uh, is a matching part of a, a federal grant that we had applied for. We did not receive that grant, and the project has not started yet. So we are moving the funds that we'd set aside uh, into fiscal year 24, plus the additional funds that we're um, putting in here and taking from the CIP fund to complete this project. We hope to have this started by the end of this year. There is a a public utilities um, project that's going on that's planned on the back nine. Uh, it's, it's a sewer line project that would intersect four of the holes and disrupt what we're doing. And so we're trying to time that with that project as well so they don't rip up what we just put into the ground. So that's that's where we're coming from there. So that's why this uh, this you're looking at that amount. It looks so high is because we're actually taking the money we set aside last year and moving it ahead. Do we have any scholarship or discount programs for Salt Lake City residents with limited incomes? We do not. Golf? We do not. I think with the investments that we're showing here in the Glendale and Rose Park um, areas, it would be great if we can start to, to make that more available to some of the residents that live in that neighborhood that otherwise couldn't afford it. So I, I think the, that's just an idea to throw out there. No, I think that's a, that's a great idea. Something that the uh, city council several years in a row advocated for was it a um, one rate for city residents especially since the city is subsidizing with the general taxpayer funds and another rate for people who are living outside of the city but there 
there could be something in that mix that addresses that addresses people. The, yeah, the, it's golf is, it, you know, there's a lot of debate about golf and water and all that kind of stuff. To the extent that we believe golf is empowering communities, it's it, it isn't available to everybody. It's a thing you need to pay for in order to do. No one has a golf course in their backyard. Well, no one owns the golf courses in their backyard. Some people have them, but um, it, it, I think if, if it is something that the general fund is going to continue to subsidize and that we're going to continue to use our public lands for, it should be something that's available to residents at every income level. So it would we produce Tony that. Fee now. So I'm going to go ahead and say that the ROI, when you make it accessible to all of us is yes. proven pretty high. Yes. <laughs> but something to say about that. We do, I, at least we were invited to go cross country skiing in the, in the winter, yeah. um, in January or February, I can remember Dugan and I went and that group that I'm not sure if we rent to them or we land the tuna group, um, they do bring over a hundred kids from the West side or, or of low income, um, of low income, uh, families to come and learn how to cross country ski and get them started. I've seen the U of U skiing team practice there. And I think they have some connection there to see if they could, uh, you know, get them started in that sport. So there are some good things that happen at least Mountainville, of course, with the community. Yes. Thank you. And, and one of our initiatives that's that we're funding throughout through this budget as well, uh, we have identified 15 different areas within our golf courses that we do not charge that would be considered free practice areas. So we're in the process of improving these areas to make them uh, not only um, more usable to the to players or people coming into the game, but also we're we're putting money aside to to create some content that we can push out on social media that would, you know, show other players here's here's how you use this. This is where you go, and so we we think that's a kind of fits within, you know, at least gives an opportunity that you don't have to. You can still go and enjoy the space without having to pay. And that's our, our hope is being able to at least have that coincide with people who are paying as well. And you all still facilitate a partnership with First Mine or what's the non- First T? First T, yeah. And you still, is that still active? It's a yes. nonprofit that offers after school golf instructions. I know Rose Park was one of their target golf courses. Um, yes, yes. We, we still work with the First T. Council members, other questions for the golf on the golf budget? Do again. Sure. sure. I know, I know in the past we've always had con, uh, difficulties with the concession side of the house. Have we been able to, I mean, when we look at six courses and not less than a hundred grand a year in concessions and you go, wow, that's, I mean, that's, you know, that's a thousand dollars a month. It's like, holy cow, they're, they're not making any money on the concession. We're not making any money on the concessions is, are we still fighting the, uh, finding concessionaires to want to take the contract on liquor sales and where are we on that type of, uh, I can, I can see that we should be making $500,000, not a hundred thousand dollars on concessions a year. Right. In fact, we've not made any money on concessions the last two years, the, right. the previous two contracted concessionaires um, defaulted on, on their part of the agreement to pay us their share of the revenue or even report it. Um, so we, we have our fourth, a contracted concessionaire in place this year. We we're able to get them in place uh, this spring. They're they're operating five of our courses. We have one other at our sixth course. Um, they're contracted. We received our first payment last uh, last week, which was which was very good to see. Um, they've been able to be there the hours that we've requested. That was one other issue that we had had before is that the previous concessionaires weren't there when uh, when we needed them to to be. So so far so good. And so we we have uh, full contracts at, at at all of our courses uh, with with full uh, beer licenses, as as well. So that's we're we're up and rolling. Are they open? Up? Are they only open during the season, or are they open up twelve months a year? Or does it really? We, I mean, we give them the ability to open up year round. They they elect to to generally stay, only stay open during the season when when the the, the golfers are there. So we don't charge them any rent or any other fees if they if they wanted to stay open during the off season, uh, but typically they they elect not not to be open. Okay. Yeah. Councilmember Baltimore. Thank you. And then did, did the administration already shy away from um, like a like a venue center or 
or a restaurant or any yeah an event center whatever that is uh, in Montendale golf course or are we are we talking about it are we not is that something that still well it's it's, it's of our minds I'll let, I'll let Kristen follow up yeah give her a minute think about it but um the Mountendale golf course obviously is uh their the, their biggest need there is their irrigation system the second biggest need is the clubhouse uh we we replaced uh the roof uh, the boiler went out last year and we were we're not actually able to put a new boiler in so we're having to do some workarounds with some other forced air uh heating solutions which aren't ideal um like i say the roof can the roof continues to leak uh the deck is in disrepair uh there's a we we continue to try to do our best to keep it going we're going to resurface the deck again but we don't have currently as it is right now a, a, a means to finance a new uh, a new center up there um we've discussed some other funding options we're looking at all of our funding options right now but it's it's definitely high on the list because i, I do think given the location out even outside of the the golf season uh, there could be year-round recreation for that facility up there i i just saw a very nice venue center at the at the South, um, is it South Draper? South Mountain. South Mountain Golf Course. And I was trying to figure out if, they, if that's county owned and I'm not sure if the venue is, but it's quite expensive and, and potentially profitable for them. And I'm not sure. Just just saying, maybe we could look at what happened there with their financing. Thanks. I, I can share a little bit because we we did specifically look at that um, facility. This was like five years ago when we were first evaluating golf's financial difficulties and the county essentially subsidized the construction of that facility and handed it over to their golf fund free of debt. And so it does make money for their golf fund, but it's because the county elected to pay to build the facility. So that way it would be equivalent to the general fund bonding to build the facility, okay. paying the bonds on the debt, not having the golf fund pay it. May I? Go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And Jen said just about everything that I was about to say. But I, I, I do want to say also that um, we have on my list of things to do once you all get through uh, your budget season, which is busy enough as it is, uh, you know, some time that I want to set aside with you all to talk about um, your priorities and, and goals around uh, that very thing. And we will be exploring, like uh, Matt mentioned, all uh, funding opportunities and and but the, I think the first step is just kind of testing uh, your your appetite for the conversation. So, but we will bring that to you when it's when it when you get through this, you get, you have enough on your plate right now, um, and we'll bring it back at another time. Thank you. Thanks. All right, council members. If there's no more questions, I think let's move on to the fleet fund. Okay. Last question, council member. What Petro? is the revenue per start that we would need to get to? to eliminate the need for subsidy. I know that's probably an unfair question because like your maintenance costs go up as your starts go up. Well, there's a lot of things that go that go into it as well. So uh, as an enterprise fund, we we try to contain our expenses as much as possible. And so I think that's I think that there's some area for some additional discussion on, you know, the role of the enterprise fund, how it fits within the general fund and whatnot. But I, I, again, I the revenue per start number that we're where we're currently at, uh, from a market perspective, I would be thrilled if we could maintain and hold this for a few years. I don't expect it to continue to climb. In fact, I'm was was very interested to see what would happen this year, and and last year, given given the inflationary impacts that I think everybody's kind of feeling and and experiencing right now, and and you know, golf is a discretionary expense, so I'm you know thrilled to see where we're at and if we're still holding this number i'll feel very good about it but again if you look at our our deferred cip needs list which is 27 million dollars i think is what we have in the staff report um that doesn't touch it so we we have to find some other um creative and innovative ways to try to 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 be able to reinvest you know and we're 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 trying to hit our priority items as we can again the lifeblood of our golf courses is water and how we deliver it so that's i'm focused on irrigation systems right now because without that it, it, 
it doesn't matter what how even if we have a nice clubhouse if the if the course if we lose the course because of a lack of irrigation that's it doesn't work so that's that's kind of what our priority levels are but we can we can obviously see the potential what would happen if we had better facility at a golf course like Mountain Dell uh, you know not only during the golf season uh, for other events but during during the winter the winter months it's a fantastic recreation area as well which is currently used uh, if you go up there in the winter any day of the week that parking lot is just as busy as it is in the summer so people finding various things to do up there and we're we're really not funded to support those activities as it is right now but it again it's a great area uh, the Bonneville Golf Course, their clubhouse, similarly old and falling apart. Um, we're, we're holding it together as, as best we can with with uh, with paint and <laughs> some other things. But at some point, that, again, that's an opportunity uh, to bring in some additional events to have there that could be new revenue streams. We just need to be able to to find the money uh, and, and the partnerships, which I, I do think we we're open to public private partnership opportunities, and we continue to to investigate those as as best we can. But um, so to answer your question, uh, I, it would be great to set that number above $32, but I'm, I'm, I'll be thrilled if we're still at 32 after another two years. I'll add to just the other challenge that, um, that the Gulf Fund has, has, has dealt with since I've been here is that we're not alone in the market. And um, the Salt Lake County, in fact, the whole Wasatch Front has, uh, is very saturated with public courses that have very reasonable prices. And so, um, I think the Salt Lake City golf system does a good job of trying to pay, trying to set the prices where people can afford them and attain them while at the same time trying to get, you know, the cost of actually maintaining it. But we're, we're hamstrung a little bit because if we um, increase prices too much, then people will just go to a county course or, you know, North Salt Lake or whatever. So. All right. Thank you, Kristen and Matt and thank Jennifer. You. Let's move on to the fleet fund. And this is our last item before our dinner break. Um, so we will be hearing from Sylvia Richards, Cal hi Sylvia, here in person, um, Jorge Chamorro, Julie Crookson, uh, Crookston, Nancy Bean, the fleet division, fleet management division director. Um, and is that everybody? I think so. Sylvia, go ahead and give us your introduction. Just quickly, the fleet fund provides repairs, maintenance, replacement, and fuel for approximately 1,600 city vehicles. It also maintains about 2,800 pieces of equipment, operates 15 fueling sites, two car washes. The fleet fund is, in, and is an internal service fund and operates with money paid out of other funds, including the general, general fund. The 2024 proposed budget is 32.5 million, which is 2.1 million or 6.8% more than last year. And I know that the fleet division has a presentation and I'd like to turn the time over to Jorge. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, hello again. Uh, this time uh, presenting the fleet budget for this coming fiscal year, we have Nancy Bean, Director of Fleet, and Julie Crookston, um, Deputy Director of Public Services. I will turn the time to them and let them present uh, the budget. Hello, as stated, Julie. I'm Julie Crookston. Um, if we could go to the next slide, we'll be talking about the fleet budget today as represented, yeah, so we can go to the next slide as well. Perfect, so this division um, in total, it manages over 4,000 assets. That includes the vehicles and equipment that um, Sylvia mentioned. And they're responsible for procuring those assets as well as maintaining the ongoing maintenance and um, repairs of those assets. So we wanna go to the next slide. We are not bringing any major new initiatives with this budget. We are mainly asking um, for a few insights to maintain our operations. So we were able to increase some efficiencies in the maintenance of our heavy duty wash bay. So we're asking for less funds to maintain that this year, which is a good thing. But due to the current inflationary pressures of the market, we are asking for a 650,000 increase in parts 
and then a 975,000 increase for fuel. And that is due purely to inflation. And then we can go to the next slide. We are also maintaining our same request as last year for funding our future. 1.7 million of those funds will go towards streets that will replace nine pieces of equipment and vehicles. And then 4 million of that will go towards public safety, replacing 55 vehicles um, with some fire equipment added in there as well. And then if we could go to our next slide, Nancy being the fleet division director will give you an update on our electrification of the fleet as a whole. So electrification is definitely important to all of us. And last year, looking at what we receive in budget replacement or in vehicle replacement, what we have available to replace and, and what's available technologically, we only figured we would be going up 11, uh, four vehicles, but we were able to go up 11 vehicles this last year. Um, we have worked with all of our departments. We have complete departmental buy-in to go electric. We just need the technology and the availability to receive it. So this is this graph on electrification is, is a very conservative view based on what we get for replacements and what's available in technology um, going forward. I do believe that this is going to change. It changes daily. Things, uh, vehicles, equipment are released. Uh, just this last year, I, I went to a conference and found backhoes and loaders and so much more that were electric, electric and I'm excited about that and, and the technology. So working hand in hand with sustainability, we are looking at the infrastructure as we are increasing our electric vehicles in our government fleet, we are also starting to see a squeeze on the infrastructure and charging stations. And along with that comes some education. And so if, at this time, if you have any questions, I'm- Yeah, and we can go to the next slide. Um, the last slide is just a summary of the fleet budget insights in general, and we'll take any questions. Uh, Councilmember Dugan, and then Pui. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I like the uh, the breakdown on the, the fuel types of the vehicles. And so when I look at, uh, and then I look at your fuel fuel uh, uh, costs. So the electric vehicles are, are still at a small number, which is fine. I think it's, you gotta be smart when you bring those on because there's, there's savings, you save you some money, but I think also I noticed that since I drive electric vehicle, you're, you use your tires, you go through tires quicker. So there's a there's a additional cost there, but there's a lot of savings in the maintenance side of the house and the fuel side. And, and we haven't had a lot of history because we're just introducing electric vehicles into the, the fleet. So I don't have a life cycle analysis, life cycle right. cost analysis or history, but we'll get yeah. there. Yeah. And then on the hybrid side of the house, our, I mean, our fuel gallons used is probably coming down the, the course that the price is going up but the gallons used is 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 should be significantly dropping also off and uh, are we seeing higher maintenance costs because of the hybrid cars if i see all gas or you drive a councilman please drives a gas electric right a hybrid electric yeah, plug in hybrid hybrid yeah yeah, yeah. Is that is that part of the hybrid, or do you guys are we looking at that type of a, a technology also when we were purchasing? I'm more like at vehicles, vice equipment. So, as far as hybrid vehicles, most of our uh, a lot of our patrol cars are hybrid. Gotcha. And uh, then the, in the last three four years, I think we have put hybrid in there. Um, so, but we still have quite a few that are pure gas and that we are trying to replace. Right. But but are you also looking at the uh, plug-in hybrids vehicles that are gas electric? For patrol, we oh, are. Or, uh, just, or, just, or just, just for the whole fleet, yeah, we yeah. will look. But right now, it's because I want to go electric. Okay. <laughs> I, I agree it. with that. <laughs> That's right, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so... Um, I have a few questions. Are we on the police uh, side of, of things? 
are we trying to retire some of those sedans and going to SUVs? Uh, because there's an overwhelming feeling that, uh, and consensus within the, you know, that the, the, the sedans are a problem more than the solution. So that I, by the nods, I say, I'm, I, Yes. Yeah, I, I've yeah. spoke to the chief and I've spoken yeah. and, and we have really built up a partnership with police yeah. and it's uh, don't, you know, I don't really care for the sedans because of the entrance and exit the patrol um, personnel need to make out of those vehicles. Um, more importantly, it's the platform you know, being very low to the ground to a platform that's higher. Yeah. So obviously we don't want to purchase any vehicles that are not going to work for them. Yeah. And we have, we just gave them or just sent them for electric vehicles for them to try out. Oh, good. I, you know, and I wasn't right along this last week and, uh, uh, and not too long ago, I went to another one and, you know, those sedans are even problematic for a normal I mean, a civilian like me, uh, and so I'm glad that we're moving away from them. Um, so if you have all this equipment the police officers carry with them, it's very hard to get in and get out of those vehicles. Also, that, that's very good news. Um, as far as the fleet, uh, when we went to uh, National League of Cities, they talked very much about additional funding from the feds to, for local uh, government grant money to update our fleets uh, with clean energy uh, vehicles. So I wonder if we are applying for that, if we have it in our radar, if not, I'm sure that we can find it. Uh, but apparently there is quite a bit of extra money, recent money, new money to upgrade fleet. Uh, so I just wanted to throw it out there. I don't have, you have to answer any of that, but. I just want you to know that uh, with sustainability and facilities, we are working with a consultant. And so we're looking at our infrastructure. We're also looking at the possibility of, of grant money as it becomes available. Okay, good. And they stress that a lot in the league, uh, the National League of Cities, you know, that there is like literally billions of dollars for upgrades on, on, the, on fleet. So I'm sure that we're not going to get billion dollars, but if we get some, I'll of it, take it. I will take whatever <laughs> we can get. And the third part of my question is about branding. Uh, I, you know, I guess it's, it's almost like when you buy a new car, you keep seeing that new car everywhere. Uh, I don't know if that happened to all of you. Um, now, since I joined the city, I keep seeing city vehicles uh, because never, I, I didn't notice them before. I mean, I will notice a garbage truck or a, a snow plow, but now I notice city vehicles everywhere, and I have noticed uh, some old ones, obviously, and all sorts of different uh, types of vehicles everywhere. Uh, and some of them, their branding is, you know, something peeling from the side of the car that looks burnt out, and probably because of the vehicle is old, and I get that. But I feel like as part of um, showing the neighbors that we're doing a lot of work and the city is doing a fantastic job in so many ways and there's so many vehicles and if you're paying attention you're going to see vehicles pretty much every day if you go out driving you're going to see a vehicle or multiple doing something else something different um, and I feel like it's very important to brand them even maybe older vehicles that, that might have still a couple of years to go um, with a new branding to make sure that the people actually see and acknowledge our work and the city's their money their their tax money so i wonder if there is a uh maybe a, an interest on you know branding some of those older vehicles no if they're gonna be replaced in a few months i get that it will be a waste of money um uh, but trying to create a little more consistency not only rebranding new vehicles but maybe going a little backwards uh or you know retroactive i guess maybe i don't know what the word but i think you're getting what i'm trying to say right yeah and so in in preventive maintenance when the vehicle comes in for preventive maintenance inspection which should be at least two three times a year we need to look at that if we don't if the vehicle doesn't come in we don't catch it but if if it does come in we are addressing that to make sure that we have uh, because there's going to be two different types of logos on city vehicles for the main logo. And we're trying to get those all updated to the last logo. Um, and then also, we're also making sure that we have the flag, the city's flag on there. And, and that the, the, our vehicles are, do look good, that they are in good condition. And so that is part of the PM where we, we take a look at that, address it. Right. 
thank you so much. Looks like that's all the questions from council members on the fleet fund. Thank you for your presentation. We are now at item number nine, which is our dinner breaks. So we will take the scheduled 30 minutes and come back just before six o'clock. We are back from our dinner break. It is um, May 23rd, what time is it? Anyway, it doesn't matter. We are on item number 10, fiscal year 2023-24 budget for the non-departmental fund, which is, as it sounds, a non not a department, but has a lot of things in it. So Jennifer Bruno, our deputy director, is going to walk us through the staff report. And the Thanks. And I think um, Mary Beth also has a presentation that she'll go through. So maybe first I'll just um, give a broad kind of contextual overview of the non-departmental budget. Um, you're correct. It's sort of where everything that doesn't fit perfectly into a department is accounted for. It's also where a lot of the transfers to either other funds or other departments go. So if the general fund is paying another department for something or um, the city's transfer to CIP is located there. So it is, uh, I think it is still the largest city department technically. Uh, it's 118 million in the general fund. And if you include all of the other funds that are passed through funds like CDBG and um, housing funds, debt service funds, the total funding is 203 million. Um, the best place to look for every single line item, if you're interested in knowing in detail what every single line item is uh, proposed for funding is pages 263 to 269 of the budget book. Um, that's where you'll get a line by line accounting of each item and what the proposal is for either change or not. The orientation of the staff report is, uh, I guess, big picture to uh, more detail. So if you're interested in more detail, read towards the end of the staff report. If you're, you just want a big picture, it's sort of the beginning of the staff report. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mary Beth. Thank you, Jennifer. So I'm going to go fairly quick. If you have any questions, just stop. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So Jennifer just stated this. It's non-departmental portion of the budget is for accounting for the general fund monies, transfers to other funds, as well as grants and other special revenue funds. Next slide, please. Um, the contractual increases inside non-departmental are 283,791. Um, this includes uh, City Hall Police Presence, uh, Salt Lake Chamber of Commerce, Sugar House Parking Authority, Utah League of Cities. Those are all of our contractual increases and they will be ongoing. Next slide, please. Um, we have, the mayor has put in, oh. <coughs> Go forward one slide, please. Thank you. Um, the mayor has put in a request for a water usage study. This $100,000 will be transferred to public utilities where they will, I believe, hire a consultant to do a water usage study. Next slide, please. Um, municipal elections are upon us, and this is for $284,000 for ranked choice voting, $30,000 for oath of office e event, and $20,000 for ongoing election officials events. This does not include transitional costs. We will be requesting those in a budget amendment when, after um, the elections have been completed, we will um, discuss transitional costs in the budget amendment. Is that because we don't, even though we know that there's an election, we don't know what the outcome will be, so we don't know what the transition will be? There Correct. Could, there could be as many as zero people. Right. Or more. So, yes. Next slide, please. Healthcare innovations and technology. Um, this is an additional request of $50,000 to be up to a total of $100,000. Next slide, please. Employee appreciation, um, mayor's office and council put on an employee appreciation at um, the Bees ballpark this last year. Um, that money was found at a whole bunch of places. 
um, but we are going to request the funding for the employee appreciation moving forward. So that's what's in the mayor's recommended budget of 150,000. Next slide, please. This amount is the racial equity in policing. This amount has been there since 2019, I think. Um, and this is just moving money forward. So the money that we didn't spend, we'll be moving it forward and requesting that additional funding. And then an increase for our mental health responders for their increase. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Transportation's total cost net increase is 690,000. 810 is the reduction in hive passes. Um, we looked at utilization for hive passes and that this is the reduction for that hive pass based on usage. 400,000 is an increase in transit plan services for key routes and 1.1 million for plan for on-demand ride services. And is, it, is the school bus passes, is that a different line item? Yes, the school bus classes are still in there. It's just the hive that was reduced based on utilization. Next slide, please. Transfer to CIP and debt service. This totals um, approximately $23 million. 10 million, 10.3 million goes to debt service and 12.8 million will go to CIP. Um, there are ongoing commitments, $600,000 for ongoing, three hundred and fifty dollars for capital facilities replacement, two fifty dollars for parks capital replacement, seven hundred dollars to maintain, yeah, it is raining, isn't it? Seven hundred dollars to maintain vacant building maintenance, $161,000 per percentage of art, two fifteen dollars for CIP contingency. Um, one of the things that I wanted to wanted to note is this year we did a little differently. Usually we give CIP a bucket of funding and they take percentage of art and cost overrun off of that. This year we did it opposite. We took it out first and then gave them the CIP number so that we could ensure that we always cover the percentage for art and the cost overrun funding. Is the $700,000, <clears> is that our buildings? That is wow. to maintain our vacant buildings. That's a lot. Yep, it's a lot. Next slide, please. Um, transfer to fleet. You just saw fleet's budget. Um, it'll be eleven million, eleven point seven million dollars for fleet replacement, replacement, and seven point <clears throat> six million for fleet maintenance. This includes five million of ongoing fleet, one point seven million of streets fleet, four million of public safety apparatus and vehicle replacement, and a million dollars for vehicles for new positions. Next slide, please. The transfer to golf. You also just did um, saw golf's presentation and it's $2 million. And you saw this in their presentation. So I'm not going to go through the details here. Next slide, please. IMS, we're, tw we're transferring $22 million, 592 thousand for their personnel costs, 1.3 million in contractual increases, 350,000 for the new capital asset planning software, 559,000 for new personnel. Next slide, please. Risk and insurance, risk and insurance and risk management. So there's salaries um, because there are people staffed in insurance and risk management. That salary adjustment's 143,000. There's a premium increase, the 2.9% of 142,000 and 500,000 for the life savings account. Next slide, please. Um, RDA's transfer is a pass-through. So we they are not a taxing entity. So we receive the revenue and then we have to transfer it out to the RDA. This works for the RDA, the Inland Port, and the Convention Hotel. So none of those are taxing entities. So we receive the funding in and then we pass it through to those entities. The 15.9 million is just the city's portion of the RDA's tax increment? That is just the city's portion. Next slide, please. Sustainability fund is $1.4 million. Um, among the changes are 419 reduction in one-time projects as the EV stations actually move to public services. Next slide, please. 
This is all the removal of one-time fund funding. We had a million dollars for grant match. That was for the um, federal grants. A million dollars for the NBA, um, a shooting range remediation of 500,000 and the others, and then city hall security improvements. Those, the others are small. Next slide, please. And this is a high level overview of significant non-departmental changes that we basically just discussed all of these. So um, next slide, please. <clears throat> that is my presentation. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, Council members, any questions? Councilmember Wharton. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I just wanted to raise the issue. Um, I, I think you mentioned it already in a previous meeting, but <clears throat> um, that um, the the county increased the amount, um, the county council increased the amount that they're paying towards the legal defenders to um, make sure that they're in parity with um, what their increase for the um, prosecutor's office, the district attorney's office. Um, and the mayor's budget raises our um, prosecutor's salary to meet that, but we didn't raise um, our contribution to the legal defenders um, by the same amount so that there's parity between those two. And I just think that that's, that's really important for a number of reasons um, that, you know, we have a lot of people um, that, um, especially new lawyers that, you know, come out and, and get really good trial experience um, in either a prosecutor's office or a defense office, um, a public defender's office. And um, I think it's important that we um, keep both of those sides competitive so that they're both recruiting good talent. Um, the other thing is um, the um, the DAs in particular, this is where a lot of people that, um, you know, for what, for, uh, for one reason or another, this is how their interactions with law enforcement and the court system ends up getting them access to treatment that they might not otherwise have known about or um, had an incentive to participate in. And um, public defenders are the people that are walking them through that and, get, and getting them connected to the right places and familiarizing them with the right program. So I think it's also really important when we think about all of the um, the, the, the feedback that we get from residents and the concerns about what we're doing about homelessness. This I think is a really translate, translatable place. I think if it's like an additional 200,000, we can, we can achieve parity with them um, because we're only contributing to the LDA that's in the justice court and the county is doing the LDA that's in justice courts and in district court. So we should be able to do it, I think, with, with 200,000 or less. Just a second. Uh, Jennifer, this is listed in unresolved issues as well, right? Uh, this, oh gosh, <laughs> I don't know this uh, Yes, you. this is listed in unresolved issues um, based on previous council members flagging it as an item of interest. Um, the reason it's in non-departmental is because that's where our contract with the LDA is paid. Okay. Um, our contract with the DA is in attorney's office. Right. Yeah. Okay. And that budget will be discussed on June 1st. Okay. So I, I think uh, I've heard a lot of interest in this item. If we can hold it until the next item when we discuss okay. all of the unresolved okay. issues, if you're all right with that. Yeah, of course. But that was a really good introduction. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I didn't mean to go into some. No, that's detail. okay. Um, I did want to ask about last year, we did one time branding for the um, city and county building, but I haven't seen anything happen on that. So I believe the the branding was, if you see on the sides, it says City Hall. On the ends, it says City Hall. That one I always did. And that one now does, does not. Oh, it does. From what I understand, um, the and administration, feel free to, the Conservancy Committee voice some thoughts about changes to the exterior stonework. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. If, yeah. it, it's not a thing. Yeah, it's not a thing. What's not a thing? Changing the changes the to the stonework. The stone etching, the carving. Oh, that. 
It's not that part. Yeah. Yeah. I thought we were talking just about the the lettering that's like on top of the stonework. It says like city hall on this end. And on this one, it used to say courts, municipal courts or something. And it says city hall. Okay, great. It it says city hall on both sides now. Okay. Um, and we have removed city and county building from the east and west side on the glass, but we have not removed anything that is touching the stone or is etched in the stone. Yeah, okay. And I'm fine with that. But I think, we, can we put like city hall above these entrances too? I think, I think we were, yes, maybe. <laughs> what if I, what if I look into that um, and see where we are? Our facilities group was working through that with the conservancy and use committee. So let me see where we are with that. Thank you. I mean, I think for me, it's not just the cosmetic thing. I think that it is a source of confusion because people might reasonably think that there are county services here and there are not. So I think shifting towards using City Hall is better for people who aren't sure what's going on. I mean, I already get, we already all get emails from people in South Jordan that think that they're represented by the Salt Lake City Council. So I think anything that we can do to help clarify that we are not the county council and that we aren't, the county government is that way um, would be good. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I have personally had to <laughs> redirect people who thought that they were at the county offices when they're in this building. So yes, couldn't agree. Let me follow up. Thanks. I showed up at this building for an event that was at the county office as well. <laughs> that was because I didn't look at my calendar, but. <laughs> and sorry, I had one more question. And I don't know if this is in non-departmental or CIP, but last year we funded historic street signs or historic sign, historic markers. Is that in non-departmental? I believe that, that was in the CIP. CIP. Oh, okay. um, and we'll ask for an update on that. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Ben did. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Pulver. Ben asked for an update. I'll, I'm working on it. Uh -huh. Thanks, Councilor Dugan. And this is more for the uh, the council ourselves. Our, uh, the bus passes for the kids is included in here on the non-departmental, and its uh, budget right now is a hundred thousand dollars. And this past year, we saw close to four hundred trips were uh, conducted on the, the school passes and the school passes were for kids from eight to K through 12 teachers and staff. And it was a, a big success across the board. And, um, they, they expect the ridership to go up another 10 or 30%. And that was just for the, the students, teachers, and the staff. And I would, I'm proposing, and I had a conversation with UTA and the school board fund school board foundation to include a, parent guardian pass also and that would do, that would increase it by uh, an additional $115,000 to add that parent and I really think it's a, a valuable asset keep teaching kids how to uh, ride the bus get them get them in that good habit also just basic transportation for for kids and families to go to events it's using for the bus the tracks the on-demand and uh, I think that's what it is that's for the local passing um, and the on-demand in the streetcar. So it, it's going to be an additional 115 grand, but I think we should be able to find some of that money in, in different uh, pockets uh, across the story. But it's kind of like for the unresolved budget side of the house. Okay, is that also listed in our unresolved? That is. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I had one more that I forgot about. Um, the CIP transfer from the building, um, that was for partial removal for one-time funding for restoration from the earthquake. So what what's the status of, I mean, because we still have some repairs. Um, so what's, what's, tell me about that. The status of the repairs? Well, or the I revenue mean, that's- They're not done. They're not done. And we're taking money away. So- The money sits in CIP. Huh? And we've also- We've received the money from FM Global to do the repairs. I do not know the timing on the repairs, but we can follow up with that unless Lisa Schaefer has information on that. Maybe the question is, is the funding after we've taken, we take this away still sufficient to yeah. complete the repairs? Yes. Okay. I believe that, that they went out to, to RFP contract with the money from FM Global and then the money from the general fund. 
Okay, so the, I, the building will be repaired. <laughs> the building will be repaired. We opened bids last week. Um, and the good news is the bids are coming in lower than the money we have already right. allocated. So some money will be coming back to the general fund. Excellent. Great. Thanks. Council members, any other non-departmental items? I think my oh I think all my issues are un unresolved, obviously. You have a lot of unresolved issues. <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, we all have a lot of issues. All right. Uh, with that, that I think it's good for us to move to unresolved issues. Thank you for allowing us to put a pin in some of those things because I think it's important for us to look at all of the unresolved issues together. Um, my understanding is that we have significantly more requests this year than we could possibly fund. Um it would take us below our 10% fund balance. It would take you below 10% or um, you would have to find uh, offsetting cuts to other or city programs or reprioritize. So um, what, I, what I'm what i hoping we can do today is get through the whole list. And how many are there? There's about 25 to 30 haven't counted since we've added a couple. Um, but um, can we take like a two minute yep. break? So because we're break. printing it out and um, we'll pass it out and make okay. sure you guys all have a two, two minute break. Thank you. Okay. Ben, that's the list we were waiting for, right? This is the unresolved issues list. Okay. So what I'm hoping we can do today is just get through the whole list so that we know the breadth of the requests from council members and from whomever. Um, and just keep in mind that we how many there are so we can get through them. I, I think what I'm actually asking is that we don't go into too much debate about each individual issue because we have this scheduled like three more times during the budget process. But I think it's good for us to get the idea there. The biggest question today is if there's an issue you've brought up or that you have wanted to bring up or forgot to bring up um, and want to get added to the list, tonight would be a good time to let staff know about those things. Um, and then we can know we have this rough idea um, of what things might cost. So um, I think if we can go, if we can have staff walk us through the list and if council members, there's a specific council member that um, advocated for this, if you can just give a really quick, like why this was important to you. And then um, we can, I think, come back to it in another meeting, but if, we can at least get through the whole list once tonight, I think would be ideal. Okay. Um, and just to um, provide a little context, we've listed some revenue items as kind of standard things that we look at in terms of uh, if council members have an idea, where can the money come from if it's not coming from a cut? So I won't go over the revenue items list because that may change depending on where the council ends up in terms of how much money you need to find and what eligible funding sources there are. Also, um, as a reminder, some of the items are would, in theory, be eligible for funding our future revenue. And so that's why we have a separate column for funding our future so we can keep track of that and keep that transparency. Um, the other uh, thing to know on this sheet is that um, I've marked the ongoing expenses in blue and the one-time expenses in orange to try and um, keep track of, to the extent that you're using fund balance to fund ongoing things, of course, that contributes to the structural deficit for next year. Um, the other item that is not on this list, because um, it was kind of, we kind of started talking about things today, were potential cut ideas. Um, and so if the council, if council members have any cut ideas that you want to add to this list, please let me know and we'll um, get that added. So those are not on this list today. Um, okay. So the, the first sort of segment, and I've grouped these by um, kind of general category. They are in no particular order of prioritization. So I'll just put that out there. <laughs> um, the first, the first kind of segment of ideas are housing ideas that have been raised by one or more council members and the chart in the stack report, which I will get an electronic version to the recorder's office. Sorry about that. And then can you give Lisa and, do you guys have a copy? Okay, great. Sorry. Thanks. <laughs> um, I listed out some potential funding sources, and this is these are just based on very preliminary conversations with um, finance and the administration. So I guess a big asterisk on these funding sources also. Um, 
So the first idea is a loan program for naturally occurring affordable housing um, for repairs to those uh, structures um, in exchange for guaranteeing affordability. Councilmember Valdemoros raised this um, in the amount of about $1 million. I don't know if you want to. And I think we sent, I sent you an email um, via Brian. I think I got a lot of positive feedback to move forward and meet with administration. And I have met with administration there were and with the mayor and um, they were really graceful because they thought as they have a similar vision with thriving in place um, document. So this would be something that they would support. So that's why it's here in this um, council idea list. Is yes? there any wiggle on the amount? If if we if we have to get to a place where we have to make concessions to find space, is there wiggle room on the amount for you? Well, I, yes, but remember that we also wanted to do ADU, so the ADU incentive program. So it would be one or the other. Like I'm so happy rather... to wiggle. Like I'm happy to entertain a wiggle room, either in this in the NOAA or in the ADU, but not both. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. I. Uh, I mean... Oh, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, there's a lot here. So I think we might all need to compromise and, and something. I think that's where So I think that the point here will be, we might need to get, so we're all somewhat happy uh, with the request to compromise a little bit and meet somewhere. Um, so I, I love, I think all of these things, if we could all do them, I will be voting right now. Let's go for yeah, it. This but... is like this, the CIP or the CDBG yeah. discussions where there's always a lot of good things we want to fund, but we have to decide which ones are the most important or if we're going to cut other things. Okay, so but it just for I, think that, I think this discussion we just had is going to happen with okay. all, all of the but things. But with the clarification on the housing one, didn't we have about eight, eight or $10 million unallocated that it's there? In the in the cloud for us <laughs> to catch. So um, the administration is working on on a proposal to allocate that money. It's about twelve million dollars. Okay. Some of that money has have more strings on it and are not eligible to be used for some of these ideas. Other parts of that money are eligible to be used. So that's what we're working on with the administration right now to make sure we don't accidentally spend one of the pieces in the cloud that have more strings. Okay. All right. Is it fair to say though that- But that, but that items, is potentially a funding source. Okay. Is it fair to say that the items in the housing category of your list may have more options for funding than some of the other options? Yes. The, yes. the other categories. So okay. potentially Definitely. we could find, we could find the I think whole the housing ones may be easier to find funding for than- Than the rest. Compensate. And, and on, on this, on this, particular one what would what does the administration or or believe the average cost of a repair for a, a nofa house can we can we no, we don't know we and, don't know okay all this up. yeah okay well and i think that um, I don't it's get worth it we, we, I, I think yeah i think for today if we can mm -hmm. You can table that question. Table yeah. that question. Yeah. And I think the other thing to remember is a lot of times when the council funds these sort of policy goals, we ask the administration to come back with a recommendation to say yeah. what would make sense as a right. threshold, okay. you know, from their perspective. Yeah. So the council could fund a pot of money with a policy goal and have the administration yeah. come back with the details. Um, the next item is based on uh, the council's legislative intent when the council adopted the citywide ADU ordinance of funding a million dollars um, for a citywide ADU incentive program. There is funding in the RDA budget from the nine line area um, to do ADU incentives in the nine line area to the extent that their um, affordability is restricted. Some of those funds could be used citywide. Um, but I think that some council members had an interest in dramatically in expanding that program. We, I think we discussed it a little bit during the RDA board discussion, budget discussion. The next item is uh, funding for a partnership with NeighborWorks for an equity sharing housing project. I'm not sure if that's the right way to characterize it, but feel free to. Yeah, this in. one was one that I suggested. This arose from conversations that several of us shared around the ADU conversation. It arose from the need to increase home ownership and it arose from consultation with former council member James Rogers as to what he intended 
for the West Side Community Initiative money to be used for when he advocated for it so fervently during the early stages of the port. And so this matches almost exactly all of the criteria that he set forth. It meets a huge need in our neighborhood. It's technically in District 2, but it is definitely a West Side project that deserves support. Um, Maria's track record alone at NeighborWorks is literally my entire lifespan. She has been doing my life worth of work in this. And so she's a known entity. There's of course a lot of details to be worked out in a very strong MOU. I do not think we should be a property management company as the city. And so there needs to be a strong MOU for how it's delegated, but I find it hard to believe there's a lot better use at this point on such a shovel ready project as this one. And the project is townhomes and it's how yep. many units? It's uh, 40, I believe it's 47 units, she said. And it would be workforce housing. It would investment. be te teachers this, and those sorts of people. This investment would put 100% of those units in the community land trust? Yes. Great. Yeah. We would essentially be purchasing the soil. They would be doing all the improvements. And this could be coming from the uh, West Side Community Initiative. Uh, and, right? Yes. Correct. So, and this, I think this is one of the most amazing projects we can actually. Yeah. Do. So th they would own the, they would own the, the, the townhouse. It's basically the traditional shared like, most the, basic the most basic community shared equity model. land trust model. Okay. So we would own the land. We would own the land. Okay. Or neighbor works would, but it would be restricted in some way. Okay. Yeah. I would envision that we would stay invested and. In right. So that's how you build, they're building their equity, but they don't have to pay for the, they don't have to buy the land. Correct. The equity, the value of the home increases and the person, I, I there's a million ways to do it. Yeah. Community lunches, but the most basic way is that the person purchases the improvement, but not the land. Yeah. And that way and they take it always stays at a below market rate right. ownership opportunity, but the appreciation does partially go to them to roll into their next. Right. Purchase. Exactly. Their, okay. their equity development is proportional to their initial investment. And there's not uh, quite sufficient funds in the West Side Community Initiative in the fiscal year 24 budget proposal, but that's why we um, highlighted the other funding source, potential funding source of the excess North Temple Viaduct CRA funds. Um, the board had had a discussion about um, where those uh, where those funds should be spent. The mayor's proposed budget recommends including those in the overall NOFA that's released, but as Danny mentioned during the RDA budget overview that you guys did a couple weeks ago, um, that budget proposal was put together before the council or indicated that that was a preference. So um, you could have some of those funds to make up the difference or all of those funds. It's about 1.7 million in the North Temple Viaduct. I, uh, this is, uh, again, I cannot reiterate how much I love this, but not only that, and I want to add to to this point, this is no, wouldn't be a new program. Uh, is uh, a trusted partner versus, you know, a different program that we just talked about creating some other, you know, unknown, uh, trying to solve this. You know, this is a trusted partner that has a track record and knows how to do this. And we all know that they can do this on the West side. So I, you know, I, I tend to be more biased towards, uh, towards this uh, project. Um, so yeah, I want to put it on the record there. Okay, great. Okay. Um, the next item is uh, the the dollar amount is to be determined, but it would what be yellow funding highlighted means. Sorry, say that again. Is that what highlighted in yellow? So means? I, yes, I had I put I wanted to get a ballpark figure. So the yellow highlighted ones I just plugged in my guess for a number, but if you look on the um, staff report, it just says TBD. Um, sorry, I didn't have time to delete the That's numbers. Okay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Funding for a partnership with Salt Lake County to add housing to the Sunday Anderson Senior Center reconstruction. And um, this is one where um, in conversations with the administration, there is a portion of the dormant HUD funds that do have a string in terms of when they have to be spent by that this may be a good candidate for because I believe the county also has a deadline for the funds that they're using for this project. So um, go ahead, Council Member, please. Yes, yeah, so I, you know, I've been working on on this idea for a little while now since I learned that the county was uh, setting aside some funds to remodel the current uh, Sunday Anderson Senior Center on the 9th and 9th, my 9th and 9th on the west side, which is a key and a community nod and business nod. But the county was uh, with limited funds 
uh, only allocated a certain amount of money to remodel the interior of the building and do nothing else. Uh, and they uh, even acknowledge that could be a missed opportunity. So uh, with if we actually are able to pitch in, they might be able to also pitch in some of their housing funds, but potentially, obviously there's some unknowns there, but the county is willing, it seems like. We are already talked to pretty much everybody on the on their side. Uh, I talked to, I, this is in an RDA district too. So, I mean, it, it feels like it's a missed opportunity. If we let this opportunity happen, uh, no go. That means probably another 20 years of this building being there and nothing else happening in that intersection. So the county is going to spend those $7 million no matter what. So might as well leverage some of our money in it uh, to get some housing, some amenities. And we even talk about like some commercial uh, around that building to actually have a starting the business nod on top of housing for seniors. So it will be a perfect deal. They love the idea too, uh, but we might need to just push a little more and put our, a little some of my money in there. Would this be something that is, we just put a placeholder in now, Councilman Pui, or would it be something that we get more information on what that looks like and then look at it at a budget amendment or something? Because uh, I think that this is, since we don't know what the number to put in is, yeah, I think that there are multiple ways to go about. I just don't want us to punt it too much that, you know, then we need to open open up uh, a budget amendment for something that big uh, when there's already many deadlines happening. So I will let, you know, the smart people here to, to, to tell me how they think it's best. Um, but I'm open to, obviously, I'm open to any possibilities. Uh, but, you know, there are multiple possible funding sources for this, uh, including obviously the RDA, uh, some housing money. But I, um, but yes, I again, I'm open to anything. I just wish that we don't let this go uh, because if not, we're stuck with that building, and it's not a pretty building. I don't I, lie. What I what I don't understand is what are we doing? Like, what do you mean ad adding housing? Are we like? demolishing the building right there and building new housing or are we adding on the top on the house so the the again the county is going to remove the insides of They're the going building, to but remodel. They, they don't necessarily want to do that i mean i'm paraphrasing and reading between so many of the meetings and lines that are, you know reading mm -hmm. between the lines it is ideal the county will maybe will prefer to have a different building so might as well just leverage the land that they have in a perfect place where we need housing so uh, senior centers are not, they don't have housing. Senior centers, the county doesn't offer housing on senior centers, it's a day service. So uh, it's for us to pitch in to add housing to this corner. Uh, and so then we meet our goals of adding more housing, uh, housing for seniors, which is a, a rarity, unfortunately, in our, in, in our city and our county. Um, so we basically partner up with them. We leverage their money. We leverage our money. We get, you know, everybody's happy, I guess, I guess. Okay. This also has the opportunity to be the HUD funding, so it'd be a different, different pot of money. It just totally depends on what the project turns into, right? right? For what? Yes, and, for. and in this particular case with the funding that um, the administrative staff was thinking that could fit for this, it depends on the deadline, it depends on the timeline of construction whether or not those funds are eligible. I should have added one that's not on the staff report. I'm adding it now. The staff report was written while the meeting was going on. <laughs> so apologies. We're going to make lots of edits on the fly here. Um, the other eligible funding source for this is um, project area housing funds. So the RDA has a, an account for housing dollars in project areas, housing project in project areas. And I think there was like two, uh, two million, I'll have to confirm. Um, allocated in that um, in that budget. So if if the dormant HUD funds or if or if some of the HUD funds are are complicated to figure out, there are alternative funding sources. Okay. Right. Talking about that project, we have a similar project on uh, by the Centro Civico, the Mexican Civic Center. Did we participate on that one? Because I did senior housing and it was brand new. It's Casa Milagro. Yeah, is that something that we participated on that we can? I, I don't think copy. Did. No. No, they they leveraged their land. I remember when they were talking about this what, five years ago. It's yeah. for seniors only. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's brand okay. new. Anyway, okay. I um I'll just say I think this is a great idea, and I think the goals that you're stating make sense, and I uh, align with those goals. 
what I don't want to do is earmark funding out of our housing dollars for a project that's going to that's going to take two to three years, like just because I know how long it takes to design a project is going to take two years before we can actually use those dollars when that could go to a project now because we know housing dollars keep coming. We have a minimum of 10% from every RDA project area. We have the inland port funds for housing. So we're going to get housing dollars every year. So it might be something that is ready in two years, but I love the idea and I would support our staff working with the county to figure out what it could be. Let's say this, if, if that's okay with you, um, that um, again, I that is a very legitimate concern because we might have projects right now that are ready to go and we're not starting a new project. Yeah. Like th this, what I, I know that the county council has allocated the money and they need to spend it. And they're, you know, they have to go. So if we actually start giving them like the right signals, to, you know, that we are invested in on this idea, then they're going to say, okay, we don't have to like spend our money right now. So that's what I'm like. I don't want us to like to go all the way that they're going to be like, no, okay, don't worry, don't worry about it. We're gonna remodel the building. You do your thing. Okay. Uh, so that's where I don't want us to go. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's go to the next item. Um, the next item is funding for uh, we understand to be a gap at the Switch Point Permanent Supportive Housing Project along North Temple. Um, the proposal is about $500,000 to go towards their gap. Um, there's a couple of options, um, including um, fund balance and some of the flexible dormant HUD funds if they're not fully spent on another item. Um, sorry, really quickly, I should have mentioned that um, one thing that might be good to uh, remember is that there are essentially two fund balances in the city now because of funding our future. And so um, what we have put in the sheet is um, the total amount in fund balance for the general fund and the total amount in fund balance for funding our future, because to the extent that um, the council is proposing to fund projects that are eligible for or appropriate for funding our future like housing, um, that's, an, that's a funding option source, so. This one was suggested by me uh, because uh, out of the six million in grants that we gave out, this is the only one that has opened. And it has taken three vulnerable women who I know personally and given them a safe place to live, women who are really active on our community Facebook pages, who are known quantities. It's this service is actually doing what they say they're doing, which is making sure that our river trail and our communities are livable and that there's dignity for our neighbors. That said, we have done our part and we have done it well. If there is something that needs wiggle room and flex room, I'm a-okay. At my, As far as I know, and we are verifying this because it was communicated to me in a casual conversation, the gap is $2 million. And so I completely arbitrarily picked the 500,000, just saying, you know, another 25% towards that would be helpful. Um, if we could give a hundred thousand, I would be fine with it. But also if it's not the time for us to, I'm happy to go and use my private sector skills alongside them to do a capital campaign and help close this gap since they're serving so well. This is this the fair park point. This is this is the new one that they expanded to that's next to Sabor Latino. Isn't that what they're calling Fair Park Point, even though it's not in Fair Yeah, I think one of them's, no, that's Bill 1659. No, I think you're right. I think it's Fair Park Point and Airport Point. Is that what Yeah, it's Point. So there's two. It's yes. on the other, yeah, it's the old airport in is the more established one that they've had. Yeah. The former um, medical housing that's right. behind Sabor Latino is the yeah, new. This trip. is the one we just opened up last week. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I literally called her and said, I have a friend here who is sleeping in her car. And she said, send her to me. And my friend drove down and had an application submitted within the hour. The woman is doing the work and I'm really thankful to her for being the only one out of those three recipients who is absolutely able to make good on timelines and promises. Okay. But we also, this would also, is, could be the HUD, could be used for the HUD funding? Um, in our discussions, because um, we're not clear, we're not clear on the exact uh, final use of that money, it would probably need to come from the most flexible of those dormant HUD funds, which mm -hmm. 
um, is a limited pool. And to the extent that you spend it on other things, it's not available for this. And so that'll be a discussion among right. council members. Okay. And hopefully we'll have more information from the um, administration on what the extent of that pool is and what other programs they're recommending with that money. Well, and is it reasonable for us to get more information on what the actual gap is and what the final use would be before budget yeah. adoption or... Yeah, and what's the yeah what's it's, the gap? It, it was two million dollars. The it gap was, it was for their, their center inside their. As the it building. was communicated to yeah, me, exactly. it was capital. There is the possibility that she was referencing a programming gap, in which case my sense of urgency goes way down. You know how I feel about it. Was it. For, it was for a capital for a building inside that to provide the services to the residents in the. Uh, From what I understand, it was right. for the capital improvements to open on time. Yeah. Okay. If Let's, I'm wrong, can we then we can we ask the council members' interest in this or staff to, to clarify what the gap is for? Okay. And let's move on to the other item. Um, the next would be a grant fund um, to supplement the state and county efforts on um, sanctioned camping. And I could speak a little bit about this. I, uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I wanted to. I put, you know, I've been talking to the to the to the council uh, staff about this. Obviously, recently I went to we went visited the Denver one, the Denver site. Uh, this is one of the biggest, uh, you know, issues that we all hear about is about camping uh, in our in our city, uh, you know, and I, the, the, the Denver model is fantastic. And I feel like, you know, if we can actually help on uh, on this uh, as a grant fund, uh, that those funds be leveraged with state or county funds. So you can only access the funds uh, with certain limitations, right? Uh, but only if you also get some county and state funds. So then we are, you know, then we actually push those uh, organizations and providers into having a solution for uh, for the the sanction the the camping that is happening in our city. So again, like we heard in this meeting recently, is we need all sorts of ki different kinds of housing uh, and solutions. And I very strongly believe that uh, you know sanctioned camping is one of those. Uh, it works. It works if it's done well. Uh, I feel like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars per the Denver model will allow uh, an organization to start a small camp, um, but it could allow multiple organizations to start smaller camps. Um, so that's what I I wish we can actually uh, go that direction. I'm, I I agree to this uh, that we need to look at uh, all the models of camping, and this one is one of them. And I know the state is looking at it. Um, I'm would be holding this back as like the last resort because I want to push the state to make make a, they should be paying for most of it. They should be paying for all of it. And uh, also looking at someplace outside of the city. So if it's not in the city, I don't think we, we should probably be providing that. And if the state should be, we should be pushing the state to fund the whole thing. But I can I can see the, the need for it because I agree with that part, but I want to push hard for the state to be funding funding that. And, and how I will envision this is you leverage the funds like you only access the, you know, if you get, if you want $10,000 from this grant, you need to get either 10,000 from the state or 10,000 from the county, right? And it's try to, you know, at the end of the day, we, I see it as we need to to, to do something. Um, and uh, there is a sense of urgency. So thank you. I'd like to go along with council member Pui and I agree, council member Dugan. We need to participate in whatever way is most organic to our statutory and capacity related um, mandates. However, our neighborhood is already a different place than it was when there was snow on the ground and the emergency shelters were open. And the people I'm seeing increasingly, it's not just my house neighbors who are already going. There's people camping on the 10th green telling me where they're... I'm noticing a, a sense of desperation and frustration in our unsheltered people that we have got to communicate as vibrantly as possible, a sense of urgency. We know that in the state money talks. And so if that's the carrot that, that signals to people that we are full in and this is what we need to do. Oh, okay. Let's do that. But I mean, if, if land use is what we do too, let's find we have got to see movement on this we cannot spend another summer studying it yeah i'm not disagreeing with any of the comments here i'm just saying that i'm, I'm pushing hard for the state that you know wayne's got to do something with state land and yeah okay let's let, that brings us to the end of the housing ideas mm -hmm. um let's move up on to compensation 
Thanks. So this is where I will probably switch back to the staff report because I think there's one item that didn't make it on this that I will make sure to add. Um, so in the staff report, it has it, just not on the Excel sheet. So the first item is um, firefighter pay increases. Um, different council members have suggested different amounts and at different points in the year. And so um, finance um, thankfully calculated for each 1% how much it costs for a full year and for each 1% how much it costs for a half year. So depending on the amount and scope, um, the council, we, we could calculate how much the council would need to find in the budget. Just to point out, this would be an ongoing expense. And so if you funded it with fund balance, you would be increasing the structural deficit for next year. And just to context on that, next year, uh there will be a full negotiation to, yes. uh, you know, so, I mean, even if you ended up doing it now, um, we are, you know, it, it will be part of the conversation, right, next year with the negotiation. So it's not like we're putting ourselves in a hole, uh, you know, next year there is going to likely maybe uh, be races uh, expected. So what, when I am hoping that we accomplish is that we, uh, we move a little closer to where they need to be, in my can opinion. I, can I clarify? There's already 5% in the mayor's recommended budget. Should have clarified that. That 5%, firefighters are getting the same 5% the rest of the city is getting. Right. And these are above and beyond the, the 5%. 5%. Right. And I should have added that when we negotiated with the fire department or fire uh, union last year, what they were expecting for this year, because there was a three-year chart, was 3%. And so I think um, the administration has had the viewpoint that 5% was already exceeding kind of expectations leading into next year's negotiations, but obviously inflation is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so the 5% for the full year, like say we were to fund that, that's actually a 10% increase this year. Because the five that's already in the MRB plus if I number 34. Oh, um, right. That was, that was just there for illustrative. For illustrative. Purposes. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if people were suggesting 5% or uh, if people okay. were suggesting 1%. I've heard different ideas. And so maybe that's another. Okay. Item maybe a better way to say that is if we fund 1% for the full year, that's a 4% or a 6%. 6%. Increase. Yeah. Right. And I was requesting these numbers. Uh, so we have an idea of, you know, maybe, maybe we can do uh, a 1%. Or if we don't get there, uh, or you know, if we don't get there, we can do a half a percent. So we do a percent by starting at the beginning of the year, right? Uh, okay. So you know, it's just so we have some context. Got it. And when okay. you get into these uh, to the pay plans of the different um, union groups and non-represented, the um, percentages don't equate to each person. So because of the way the pay plans are structured, some people will be would be getting. A much more significant raise and others would be getting a less so just so that you know um there's not a way to equate to exact percentage per person let me okay. message her all right okay so firefighters was number one and the firefighter part really quick what does it mean for each one percent for a full year for each one percent for a half year so if you were to, if you wanted, if the council decided that you wanted to have a firefighter salary increases at 6% for the full fiscal year, you would have to find 376,624 to add to the budget. If you, if you wanted to, which is sometimes what the city does when you can't find the total amount, if you wanted to just start it in January, instead of at the beginning of the fiscal year, you would have to find 188,000 to add to the budget. Okay, but what's the 5% for a full year? That's in addition to the 5% the mayor's recommending? Are you looking at this? Yeah, so th that was just for illustrative purposes because uh -oh. um, one council member asked about what would a 5% increase on top of the mayor's recommended budget be? A 10% increase? For a total of 10%. Okay. Can I remind us of that? I'm not yeah. suggesting that. But this is just illustration. Okay. Okay. Illustration. So did you have something related to this or can we move on a to quick the just a very quick um, point uh, to keep aware of, and that is that because the um, wages are negotiated uh, and we have a labor bargaining agreement, it is very unusual for them to approach the council directly. And it probably 
um, has an effect long term on the willingness of the unions to negotiate with the administration mm -hmm. if they view that it's easier to come to the council or if they negotiate their best deal with them. So it's just one of those tug and pull things to keep in mind. Okay. Right. Right. The next item would be, um, I, and again, I'm looking at the staff report, so let me just make sure they're the same here. Um, increased funding for, uh, I think this maybe all goes under the category of, in, uh, of an intent for pay equity for prosecutors, for the prosecutors funded by the city and the legal defenders. Um, those are two distinct items. I don't know which one you want to talk about first, but I'll just go in the order of the staff report in the uh, the word document that you guys have in front of you. So the first item would be the prosecutors. The um, attorney's office has a two hundred thousand dollar placeholder in the budget for for salary increases for the prosecutors right now. Um, uh, different conversations have been going on, and so this is sort of similar to the firefighter increases of how much would it be to get them to a hundred percent of what the county um, prosecutors are funded at, and how much would it be to get them to ninety five percent of what the county prosecutors are funded at? And so those are those. Um, numbers that are in the staff report right there. So if the council, excuse me, if the council wanted to increase funding for the prosecutors, it would be 322,000 more than um, the mayor's recommended budget if you wanted to get them to 100%. Um, Katie and, and her office have provided some information about the pay scale for all, I'm looking at Katie so she can agree with me, for all attorneys, whether they are in the civil division or uh, in the county. And so, um, because obviously one pay change affects other pay changes, as we've seen with the state change their pay, and that had a whole trickle down effect. So um, I haven't had a chance to look at that. Haiti, I don't know if you have information to share, or we can just forward it to the council leader. One, one thing to add is that information also includes, as Council Member Wharton requested, the salaries for the LDA attorneys. Uh, so you'll have a comparison of the civil attorneys in the city attorney's office, the prosecutors that are city employees and our city prosecutors that are managed by the district attorney and LDA, which we pay through a contract. So you'll have all three of those. Do the prosecutors, the city prosecutors managed by the district attorney receive city benefits? Yes, they are city employees. City employees with city benefits and then the county ones may have a different salary, but they also have county benefits which do we know the difference between county and city benefits? They're pretty significant. Um, the Meaning county- Ours are better or worse? Uh, it depends on your perspective. Okay. They're just very different. Um, okay. I think one of the biggest ways is the um, health insurance. We have an entirely different health insurance plan than the okay. county does. Um, that's just off the top of my head one way. The okay. Utah state retirement system is the same for both county and city okay. employees. Um, but insurance benefits are separately managed. Got it. Let me reiterate something very quickly with Councilman Warren mentioned earlier. This is, you know, I also been pushing for this on, on to be added to this list. I used to work for the legal defender associations. I know how much they do to solve and help us with the issue of mental health, substance abuse, and connecting uh, those that are enter the criminal system with services and housing. I mean, they are really probably one of the biggest places where we can actually change and find solutions for those that are, uh, uh, you know, in our streets. So uh, the amount of work that an LDA attorney does and the workload, not to talk about the prosecutors, but it is significantly much larger than a prosecutor. Um, I, uh, and uh, so it, it, I believe that we need to be in parity with between those two branches. Uh, so, yeah. Okay. Um, Okay, so we will include that additional information from Katie in your packets for Thursday. <laughs> I did forward it to the council if you feel like looking at it. We haven't had a chance to look at it, but thank you so much to Katie for providing that so quickly. Um, so the next item is the legal defenders. Um, I, I don't know if we need to go over that again. The only um, item I guess I should uh, mention is that um, we've included a related legislative intent based on um, feedback from Council Member Fowler, who was interested in. Um, expanding the funding for legal defenders to come out of funding our future. 
um, on the um, theory. I, th I believe Councilmember Wharton was getting to this, that the role that they play in the justice system is very similar to um, the role social workers play of getting con them connected to services and um, na helping navigate systems. Is that what you were saying? Sorry, I maybe I'm no. misheard. <laughs> um, anyway, if if you do uh, view it as funding our future eligible, then that expands the potential funding source if you wanted to increase that contract. The other um, item that Councilmember Fowler was interested in related to this topic was um, potentially evaluating, this would be a longer term evaluation of whether it makes sense to contract with the county overall for legal defense services rather than have kind of two separate contracts within LDA for that service. Um, so it would be more akin to like animal services where the county just provides the service and we pay them for that, if that would be more efficient. So instead of our money going directly to LDA, our money goes to the county and then to LDA or whomever the county contracts with to provide that service? I believe so. But again, it's I, it's a very, it was a very brief conversation. And so, um, and she okay. mentioned that it would be a longer term kind of study item. Okay. And so there's one more item in compensation. Um, one council member asked about seasonal workers and if they were getting a wage increase. And I don't believe, I think we heard back from public lands that they are not. So if you wanted to increase wages for seasonal workers, you'd have to find money in the budget. We don't have a dollar figure for that yet, but. Okay. I, I would be interested in knowing what the dollar figure is. We don't that. see it in the list here. Oh, it's, I, on the, it's on this It's list. on the it's staff on report. List. That was the one. This is what happens when you write during a meeting. And yes. thank, <laughs> thank I wasn't. Thank you for doing it, though, because it is really helpful to see this. Oh, I know. And I've added it. And maybe what I'll, I've added it to the list on my computer. And so maybe before you guys leave tonight, if you want to hang out for five minutes, I can reprint it with hopefully more correct information. I just wrote seasonal workers on my. Okay. That, no okay. Wrote it down. Yeah. That, okay. That works. You're fine. <laughs> Thanks. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, the general streets. Yep, the general category of transportation and streets. Um, I, Council, Mem Council Member Dugan raised this during the non-departmental discussion, um, adding funding so that parents and guardians of school children could be eligible for the Hive passes. Um, the estimate, when assuming that or when um, factoring in the school foundation's contribution, would be that the city would add 114 648 to the budget, and I would say that that would be funding our future eligible. And Hive passes. The, any student is eligible for high pass, regardless of income. This, this pass, I believe so. This pass, this pass was all the students, K all K through 12 students. This would be all the students, K through 12, uh, a parent, uh, teachers, and the staff. We did it this past year, we just did not have a parent included. Okay, it was for local, so buses, uh, tracks, on demand, streetcar. All right. Then um, Council Member Pui raised uh, an idea of uh, funding for train crossing safety signs. And sorry, I haven't been mentioning which things are ongoing or one time. All of the salary stuff is ongoing. The hive passes, I believe, would also be ongoing because I think once you have an expectation. And, and then we could look at multi-year because that's what they're discussing with the, with the UTA. Right. Um, and then the train crossing safety signs, we need a little clarification. I believe it is ongoing also. Yes. Right. Uh, and I can sp speak very uh, briefly about this. And I mentioned it in the retreat uh, earlier this year. This is a priority of mine. Um, it is not, I mean, it is a lot of money, but it, it certainly wouldn't change significantly the West side and how it connects with the rest of the city. Uh, this is the, uh, a system uh, that will allow drivers, uh, pedestrians, and uh, any other form of transportation to know uh, if the train is coming and, and uh, you know, potentially for how long it's going to, the crossing is going to be cut out. Uh, this technology exists, is being used in some other cities. It will really allow us to plan better. Obviously, potentially, uh, we, we know when we can get to work. We, you know, the emergency knows to take alternative routes. You can actually check on your phone if the crossing uh, is going to be crossed when you travel. I mean, there is a multitude of options. I'm hoping that we can put that money into a, a, a bucket and uh, allow the administration to work through the kinks of this. this. And if it doesn't end up handing out because of whatever reason, 
uh, obviously, uh, you know, that money can come back to this to to the general fund for all the projects. But I believe that we can make it happen. It really is. I was stuck on behind the train for 30 minutes the other day. I didn't know if I needed to take an alternate route. I would love to know if I needed, to, you know, the, it was going to take me 30 minutes. I ended up giving up um, after 30 minutes and took an alternate route. So this is something that I, it would really change everything for the West Side. Why is it ongoing? It's a service that you pay a company to give you a subscription. Okay. Sorry, I should have started. That's okay. Um, I'm not, I am fully in support of this program as well, because I share your horror stories multiple times a day. Um, but I do want to also suggest that this is something worth bringing up. It might be a great, um, a great community impact thing for the port um, with that tax increment to ask them to take on. I, I brought it up to, um, I think I, you know, probably six months ago to Ben Hart, and uh, but I mean, sure. I think you're demonstrating one of those community needs that wouldn't be raised if one of us weren't in the room, and I think you should definitely raise it there, even if we end up funding it. All right. Okay. Um, the next item. On. The next item is an idea to increase the street meal overlay pilot program. And this is one of the items that I'll ask you to edit, um, delete to address potholes. Cause I, I, I think it was clarified in the um, public services briefing that really this is a new kind of service level to provide to hopefully reduce the number of potholes in the future, but not necessarily to fill potholes. So the um, one council member asked, what would a million dollars get us? I think that public services answered that they wouldn't have the staffing capacity to spend that money. And so um, any addition you have to that program would probably need to include staffing. Um, so. And I think the idea, I, I like the idea of the pilot and I was, I kind of threw out the carrot of, hey, if 750 gets you some equipment, if you got, you know, two sets of that equipment later on, after you feel like it's uh, proving itself, you know, for 1.5, let's find that other 750 for the second, second, second set of equipment, so you can run 24/7 on the equipment, and then get through this 50% of uh, the streets that need the fair and the poor side. So, but can't you run 24/7 on equip on this one set of equipment? You just need twice the number of people. No, no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying that if you have a do we, do we have we have the, the personnel for the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars equipment that's in the CIP? If we if we were to say hey if that works, would it be wise to get personnel later on? is not in CIP. That's to buy the equipment. That's to buy the equipment exactly. And they have the personnel to use that equipment right now. If they want, if we think that equipment's good and we can run it twenty four seven, or we could use an extra set of equipment. Let's look at additional equipment and maybe additional FTEs okay. at a future time. Based on the conversation today, do you still want to pursue this? This I don't think they have the they don't have the resources. To that, spend that's it, what but, I heard. Yeah, but okay, yeah, exactly. so. <laughs> that's a long. Uh, okay. See you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, also, based on the conversation earlier. Um, Sorry, just deleting this before I forget. Does this next one go? Is the also? additional hundred thousand dollars for um, what I'm calling oh. rapid traffic calming, but we can figure out a better name for that. But um, I do want to, Ben. Isn't there money in the CIP for? They have some uh, some intersections, ten major intersections, and other CIP funding for traffic calming. There is CIP money for that. Yes. Yeah, the project you're thinking of is specific to Main Street. It's 10 locations, 10 crossings on Main Street from just downtown Main Street. to city limits just for Main Street. Gotcha. That is separate from the $1.3 million proposed to continue the livable streets traffic calming program. Right, which is separate from this. Correct. This <laughs> is, uh, I think, temporary would be the word for right. temporary yeah, so traffic I'm, calming. Uh, yes, so definitely more money here. So, and we asked today during the briefing for them to give us information about what an extra $100,000 could do, right? Did we ask that? If not, I'm asking that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think we asked, but yeah, I would the like 100000 do. Okay. Okay. Then um, in what I'm calling the other category, because it's sort of like our non-departmental for ideas. <laughs> Um, they're in various departments. One is um, an idea that was raised that um, 
uh, Unified Police has, which is a text messaging system for people calling 911, um, that they auto they get an automatic text message record of their um, uh, case number. I don't think we've had a chance to um, raise this with dispatch to see what they're looking at or if they're looking at anything similar. So I'll just throw that out there that this is a new idea that we haven't run by the administration yet. There's some dispatch I can, can you can Yes, text. Council Member Pui. Okay. So this is, I mean, again, this happened just because I went on it right along the other day and uh, the officers were telling me about this amazing thing that the UPD is doing. So if you call either 911 or the just dispatch, you get an automatic text message that tells you this is your case number. When um, when uh, officers uh, ended the visiting the the call, you get a text message saying, "Hey, the officers, you know, were there." So basically, there's a little tra track record. Uh, I think this will. I talked to the sheriff uh, and the under sheriff, and then the IT department of the UPD. Uh, they are able to send surveys after the call saying how was the interaction with the officers. Mm -hmm. They are getting an incredible amount of feedback, positive feedback. Um, it, it will it will help us with the idea that the officer that we need to do more with policing. It keeps a track record receipts. Um, I really believe that it will help a lot this on this idea that we're we, you know that we so let me short or we make sure I more. understand that I call dispatch. I have some issue that's a lower priority it takes them four hours to get to that they go there and realize the issue's cleared up i will then get a, a push notification to my phone that says here's what happened uh, whereas right now there's you don't know i mean you need to call in and you'd have to call in to or, get um a update um the that's interesting that it created with the upd and it created and they implemented about six months ago and they are just raving about it and they're sending me more documents i Wanted to flag it in there. It it I didn't. This is not a secret. I just learned about it and I started spinning all over it, trying to find more information. Okay. So, so I put a hundred thousand dollars as a guess. <laughs> that's the, what, no, that's so. one of the yellow. But we have absolutely no idea. Okay. I think um, what Ben is going to do is follow up with dispatch to see one if they are looking at something like this. It's possible that they're looking at something similar. The agencies tend to sometimes t communicate, um, and then if not, maybe they can help us with a cost estimate for what that might look like in Salt Lake City. Okay. Um, and that would likely be an ongoing cost, just those items tend to be um, ongoing. Then um, the next item was raised by a council member. Um, also, this is a ballpark um, funding amount. I don't, we asked economic development for feedback on um, if we gave economic development funding to partner with local nonprofits, would that extend the reach of the economic development department? Thinking that those local nonprofits already um, have interactions with um, different different uh, aspects of the community, um, I haven't had a chance to go through my email yet to see if Lorena responded though. So right now this is just a placeholder. But the goal is Council Member I, I, I don't think I understand I the goal. Well, Council Member yeah, the goal is to we our, our economic development group has so much capacity at the moment, and I feel like we're underutilizing certain nonprofits that work work with um, so small businesses out there that they have the capacity to do some of the work, but they might not have funding or additional funding to, to do certain things. Maybe it's an event, maybe it's um, education. Um, the, end, the end goal is still, still to support small businesses, right. but to do it through like Swazo or- Right, or even, okay. or even smaller groups, organizations like the Black Chamber is the newer Chamber. one or the Utah independent business one, it's it's kind of reactivated again. They've been dormant for a while, but these are smaller ones that have a lot of reach, but not as much funding. So are you thinking like a grant program? They apply for a certain amount yeah. for a certain program. And, mm -hmm. and we've had conversations with the economic development and nonprofit organization that kind of, so I said, uh, heard all the cats and, and provide services for all the different nonprofits that don't maybe no understand how to work through the system and how to work through the city. So it's like the uh, Utah Nonprofit uh, Association or something of that nature. Yeah, but this and we've is, met with them a couple of times. But to be clear, this is not funding to help. The end goal is to not help nonprofits get created. It's to give to nonprofits to help businesses. Yeah, yeah. And okay. it's not a competitive grant. It's like Roberta's out and she learns about this little group and she says, oh my gosh, you have a constituency. I have $5,000 and it's like a slush fund for them. 
to use. Right. I know you're not supposed that, to say those that words in governmental, me. but but I mean, at thirty thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, and thirty thousand is a number I plucked out of the air. I don't know if thirty thousand would. We're not going to have much more than that by the time we get through this list. So, <laughs> number to start and see if, if we can do. But that's you know, but that's the idea. Some... It's not meant to be a competitive grant because mm -hmm. the execution of a grant program requires capacity, and I don't want to no. put that on. I am worried about any amount of money that is going to a city staff member that they can just allocate without any oversight. As much as I trust what Roberta's doing, she could. That's a point of audit. Though. She could move on and go to some other place, and we get someone that we don't trust. And I would be worried about that. All right, I think that there's a legal issue with that. You'd have to have a system established. Okay. I, think I mean, okay. Okay, more information needed on that, but I I understand the goal now. Um, uh, one council member raised the idea of adding $50,000 for a facade grant. Um, since that idea was raised, um, council staff has clarified that, um, fiscal year 24 CDBG included $925,000 for a facade grant program, which is actually the most it's received ever, I think. Yeah. Um, and so, um, maybe council member could give us, um, some additional information on. No, this is outdated now. Okay, great. So, so this, this was your, this was your email that had all kinds of notes and ideas. So <laughs> great. <laughs> but, but it sounded so good. It sounded like a good idea and good thing it's funded in CDBG. Okay, so we'll delete that. Um, then additional funding for Love Your Block. Um, just to note, the mayor's recommended budget does include two FTEs. Let's see, let me make sure it's two FTEs in the mayor's office for this program. Um, and so uh, maybe... Okay. This one's also crossed off. Okay. Great. Hey, we're doing so good. Okay. It, this is this came from an email uh I sent with uh budget requests, but also a lot of notes little notes <laughs> that I was going to present on a community council and I hit send uh okay. instead of saving the email. Um, so oh I wanted to make sure we weren't missing anything. So and I didn't have time to get back with you about it. So thank you. Sorry about that. Next one, 48, 49 is a thing that is okay. part of that. List. The black water tank yeah. voucher program. What does that mean? No, this is like a Dan Dugan item. <laughs> this is not a Dan Dugan oh, item. It does uh, sound militaristic, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, it's, it's RV. You don't want to capture black water. <laughs> you want to capture RV dumping. You, yes. <laughs> You want it? No, no. <laughs> Blackwater means sewage. <laughs> so this worse than gray. So uh, I I keep hearing about uh, you know sewage uh, trailer water going into the Jordan River. I wanted us to put ten thousand dollars into a voucher uh, to go dump. So those that are in RVs can solicit a voucher through the you know all the many different organizations that are on the streets. Um, to go pay for the fees to dump your black water instead of don't going to the river. Um, so I'm hoping that we can uh, test it out and see if they're taking the if they're taking the vouchers and actually using the the two different places that in Salt Lake County you can actually in Salt Lake City you can actually dump your your water. Have we negotiated with any of those places to accept the vouchers? Yeah, I mean, we basically would need to like repay okay. them or something. Yeah, but there's ways to do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and are there any, this also sounds something like it could, we could find grants out there. Have you heard of any grants from EPA or some reclamation? Okay. Okay. And there, okay, that, that's there. That's not good. Alejandro, is your microphone on? Oh, no, sorry, we were getting soft. notes. <laughs> and okay. we have to, we have to admit that this is a much more urgent way to protect the watershed and the river, and which empties into the lake, than some of. The other ideas that we've been hearing lately and i think it's really great that you brought up something that we know because we live there thank yeah. you 
So oh. I, again, if we, I, I'm willing to, you know, again, I know that no, no, all of these are going to get funded or, or through the same level, but you know, even if we end up doing something small, I hope that we can move that direction. So did you want to keep the 30, the, it sounded like 10,000. 10, 10. Okay. 10. So I'm, I'm cross that out and put 10. I mean, we, I obviously don't want that going into the. Then the next river. item is, um, one council member asked about um, fully funding the park rangers program. Um, the public lands division or department, sorry, gave us uh, some information about what it would cost to add one additional crew to the park ranger staff. Although I think it's um, in terms of expectation setting, I think adding one additional crew would not necessarily mean that there would be a park ranger at every park and trail all the time. So um, just from a ballpark perspective, it would be about $600,000 for one additional crew. And, and right, Is it you no, requested right, it? No, right this year, they're already adding uh, a ditch one crew right now for, for park rangers this year, right? We're not adding, in the proposed budget. Not in the proposed budget. So the proposed budget does not add- Last one we had, they added one. Yeah, right. it, was, it was fiscal year 23. This year keeps it um, flat. Right. And we're also probably looking for some metrics too. We were asking for metrics on the park rangers. So I'm, I wanted to see the, I'd like to see the metrics and okay. maybe we need some more time. I would, I suggest we have that metrics before we just, because we're all, we're adding some other things here. Yeah. And I think that would be nice to have first. That's what I was going to say. I'm not sure who suggested it, but we do need to, to hear it's very, like it's a brand new program basically. So we're waiting for, okay. We're waiting for the park rangers like report and also from, um, our fire department report with the other the other group. Yep. Uh, the internal response model. So, so we'll thanks. remove that. Um, the next item is um, I probably didn't word it the right way, but um, funding to uh, scope a program to evaluate um, zoning efficiency in the city. Maybe Council I, Member Mono can help me with language. <laughs> so based on what we talked about with Nick Norris today, I'm trusting him that he'll <laughs> have some really amazing thing to talk about in 60 days like he mentioned so i'm hoping that that's the case um i i think i'm okay not funding it in the budget okay. given the conversation today right but but i I'm not going to forget that I want this to happen <laughs> as quickly I, as possible. I wanted to clarify. I, I had some convert. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Can we, can, I would like to add that to a legislative intent. Yeah. Okay. I would like it to be at the forefront next year. Yeah. So yeah. that we don't forget it's $500,000. Remember half, half a mil, 5k, 500k. It's decent alleys that make it for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think, oh, I, I drafted a legislative intent. Um, Council member Mono, um, if you look in the staff report, Page four has a bunch of drafts of legislative intents based on your guys' okay. conversation. So I'll look if, at that. yeah, look at that and then let me know kind of language because <laughs> it was just placeholder language based on your discussion. Um, the next several items um, I want to, I, I think we could classify as budget cleanup items. Um, there are always a handful of things in the budget that we discover like, um, money is going to drop to fund balance unless we reappropriate it in the next year because we put it in a general fund department and not a capital account. So, um, or one, I, one item we clarified is that the lifestyle savings account, unless it's funded, unless the funding is increased, it would not be eligible for all city employees or it would be a first come first serve essentially um, for that program. So, I don't know if you want me to go through these. These are these are items that staff has identified as we've been talking so, with the administration about the budget. I think we should. So okay. number 55, line item 55 is, there was how much in the budget? There was $500,000 in the budget. And I actually have an increased, I actually have a clarified amount. Um, let's see, it's even different than that, isn't it? Um, well, I'll just say, uh, the increased amount would be 670,000 for the general fund and 757,000 for enterprise funds in addition to what's in the mayor's recommended budget. If you wanted to have the program eligible for all um, employees. So the current Hold proposal on, so is not even eligible for all employees or it's just eligible the first 
like one third of the employees right. that ask for it, get it, and then the rest would not be able to. Right. And I think the intention was that it would be a pilot program and they're, you know, figuring it out. But I think the administration's intention was to have it be so that every employee could access it. Just Michael. over 1 million. Okay. Just so, over 1 million for the general fund and then just under 1 million for enterprise funds. Oh, okay. That's, that's um, total. The increased cost is 670 and 750. Right. Okay. Um, wow. So, and this is keeping it at a $500 level, not increasing it. So. I know that you're saying this 600,000 is in addition to. It is. Right. The 670 and 750. Just to get it so that if 100% of our employees apply, the funding is available. Uh, right now, if 100% of the employees apply, only the first 40% will get it, and then the money's gone. Yeah. Okay. So, Jen, it would be a total of $2 million, then that would be if if it was all of the employees. 600 plus six. Right. So, it would be, it would be just under $2 million. Oh. But for everything between general fund and enterprise funds. Okay. And typically we don't um, add the enterprise fund and general funds together to make a total. We deal with them separately. I think the, the issue is that the enterprise funds were not included in the initial. I understand, but the council can appropriate money in their budgets. Right. Uh, from their resources. Right. It would have to, we have to talk to them more because it's, so we would have it to, would have to be included in their operational budgets, which I, I think would be a surprise. Okay. So the mayor. Right now, the enterprise funds won't, e employees of enter, like golf employees won't even be eligible for this at all. I think the intention was to have it available to all employees, including enterprise funds, but the general fund was the only one providing the funding. So while the general fund, the addition to the general fund is only $670,000, in order to have the enterprise funds fund the program, they'll have to add the full 100% of the program because previously okay. the general fund was essentially subsidizing the enterprise funds for that. And I think this, this can happen um, when things um, are, you know, wrapping up quickly with the budget. And so there are always some loose ends that, and this is this year's loose end. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would be interested in hearing the administration's take on the intention for that program and, and what, I don't know if you, are, if you already have an answer or if not, I'd be interested in hearing whether this is, whether the proposed, the current $500,000 meets the intent, or if we do need to add this money to meet the intent that the original intent for the program. Do you already know? I guess what I'm saying is, does 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 the mayor want us to do this too? Mm -hmm. All right. I believe the intent was five hundred thousand for every individual. Um, the calculation was calculated incorrectly as we were doing the budget, okay. um, and that's the reason it was only five hundred thousand instead of the million dollars. Okay, so we do the intent to meet the intent. We need to increase this. We need a million yes. dollars. Okay. okay. Okay, that's helpful to know. All right, uh, Jennifer, number okay. Downtown street activation. Yes, that's okay. one where um, it's essentially budget neutral because um, let's see. Sorry, first let's go to the security money, oh. building security. So um, both of these actually are, I think of the same um, issue, which is that because the money was appropriated in fiscal year 23 um, into a general fund account and not a capital account, that money will fall the fund balance and not be usable unless the council reappropriates it. And I, I believe the council's intention is to continue those items, uh, both the building security line item. So of the million dollars that was originally set aside, there's 400,000 left. That's in addition to a million that was set aside in budget amendment number five for building security. Um, and then for downtown street activation, you added $500,000 in budget amendment number five. Because that event 
will, those events will likely not happen until the end of the fall or sorry, the, the fall ish end of summer fall ish area. Um, it would technically be in the next fiscal year. And so in order for those monies to be available in fiscal year 24, you would have to reappropriate those. So those are more, it's more of a technicality, but it's important to include it in the council's adopted budget so that those funds are available. So, Okay. This makes sense. Okay. We don't need to find, you don't need to find this. the money. I should have, I should have started with that. <laughs> it's free. At the, at the budget. At the... Don't, we well, I guess I, I should say this. Um, sometimes, sometimes when money is falling to fund balance, that's an opportunity for the council to reevaluate if that program is something you wanted to do in the okay. first place, or if you overfunded it in the first place. Okay. So is this the, this is the bulletproofing of the glass and that's that this is not the exterior ballot ballards and all that. Well, I think what it would do is if you combined this money with the million that you guys appropriated in the last budget amendment, that would provide a pool of $1.4 million. And I think, um, one option is that that uh, if you approve the building security um, manager position, um, that that position could recommend how to spend it. The council could also say we want to spend one point four million dollars on bollards, but that's up to you guys. Okay. Um, right. Okay. They're bollards. 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 Not ballards. Bollards. <laughs> potato, potato. <laughs> um, in asking about the status of the police substations on in downtown and North Temple, um, uh, staff discovered that there is not sufficient funding in the coming year for full build out and utilities costs. It's close, but not quite. So, um, I've heard from the council that you're very interested in those opening and not having any hiccups. And so in order to ensure that um, you would add five thousand dollars to camp. Five thousand. That's like because they said 130 in the budget book, it says about 130,000. So really they're only a five thousand dollar gap. And it it's actually two hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars total. Okay. It's a hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the budget book. Okay. There's ninety thousand dollars from this fiscal year that is expected to be encumbered once the lease is signed, okay. but you still need $5,000 more to get to the 225,000 total. Okay, and that's a year that's ongoing. That's, that's for year. one year. Seems it real. may be a little more in okay. the next annual budget because of the ongoing? escalators. It's it's, this is lease, but this is yeah. paying the lease? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, for the North Temple Police yeah. Substation and the Downtown Central Precinct. We spend the whole free year not substationing. <laughs> Is that what's happening? Is that why there's the increase? Uh, the the increase in future years was built into the lease agreements, okay. like a rent escalator, mm -hmm. uh, probably two or three percent. The last I heard, the North Temple substation, they were still waiting on some uh, furnishings. Um, we can okay. ask what the current status of those operations are. This isn't fully No, no, no. It's no. going forward. The, yeah. the council fully funded. Okay, and this is just one-time funding. No, wait, it's oh. ongoing. It's ongoing. Five grand. Okay, it's five thousand it dollars. Yeah. <laughs> this is a rounding. The rounding error. error. Okay. Okay. Number. Next item. This is music. Yeah. <laughs> music licensing. <laughs> <laughs> the next item <laughs> is music licensing. Just kidding. Um, the next item uh, is uh, was inadvertently included in the budget. So maybe I should start this by saying this is good news. It's only $35,000 in good news, but something was accidentally included in the budget as um, ongoing money that is one time. And so you could, the council could choose to take that money and distribute it among all the other ideas. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> Yay. That's going to fund all of our goals. Okay. Um, the next several dozen um, line items are all the new positions proposed in the fiscal year 24 budget by department and the amount. Um, we added the clarification that was made in the um, public services, um, uh, sorry, the public services department briefing 
Um, and I will update that amount right now that um, if you did not elect to go forward with the building administrator, the savings would not be 129,000. It would be 129,000 minus 80. Well, I'm sorry, line. Line up 101. Yeah. Why are the new positions listed as unresolved? Because so, somebody asked for a list of every single new position. But there, it, these are these are resolved. They're resolved. Everything is resolved in the mayor's budget. Right. What is unresolved is is if one person wanted to suggest cutting one gotcha. or more of them. Okay. Yeah. But the yes. But all of these are funded positions. All of these are funded. The mayor's, in the mayor's recommended. recommended budget. We don't need to find it. money for any of these. No. These are all in the MRB. But I but think they there was somebody or there for people that suggested funding something by cutting something. Gotcha. Understood. And these are 10 months, right? Almost all of them are. Every now and then they're not. Um, I have another chart with the exact amounts, but I would say 90% of them are. These, these numbers are all the budget numbers. These are all the budget okay, numbers. That's yeah. fine. So this is, if you're trying to balance, these are the numbers that we have. Now, um, on that same note with the building administrator, I'm guessing with the there's... exception of the building administrator. Sorry, that was the one exception. I'm guessing there's going to be some others that might fall into that same category where if we cut this FTE, there's funding that needs to come back. Do we know that or we don't? Um, any, sorry, I should have, I probably should back out any fund, any FTEs that are funded for the airport come with offsetting um, airport revenues. Let's see. So that would be several in the fire department. Oh, and the six in PD. Yeah. The other kind of caveat to know is that wherever you see FOF funding our future, if you cut it, it you would need to be for... used for another FOF use and not just general fund use. I mean, oh. you could technically, but we'd have to um, track that for transparencies. Okay. Sake. And with with all of these positions, there's a um, a chain reaction that happens. So mm -hmm. say, for example, um, you decided not to fund the building administrator position. In addition to the um, situation where you, you wouldn't be saving that whole amount, the other thing that's happening is that the um, uh, current people who are in the building uh, managing things are supposed to be oh, doing yeah. repairs and things that preserve the life of the building. Unfortunately, they're diverted to doing everyday tasks of moving desks and hanging pictures and all of those things because there's not a manager that's looking at that and saying, gee, we could hire somebody for $15 an hour to do those other things. So so there's a, a funny inefficiency that it, that is being addressed. Um, and so you'll probably hear a story behind each position right. the public lands ones are the ones we all we talked about today and that's from the most of them from the funding our future reallocation is that correct right but to that point and obviously this is very much hypothetical uh, and i'm realizing oh yeah those are all fof um so line 88 through yeah. 96 yes they're not indented on the printout for some But you reason. do have a heading. Yeah, on the heading line on line 87. <laughs> so, so, so I think you're covered. Okay. Thanks for reading. The, um, the funding our future categories, there's five of them, right? And so hypothetically, you could say, I don't want any of the parks maintenance FTEs. I want to spend all that money on streets. But that would or be I want to spend all that money on housing. We approved. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, we'd be cutting the fifth bucket that we approved. No, not, to, I mean, not necessarily because it wouldn't be 100% of it, oh, but okay. you know what I mean? I do have a question. I should have asked this during the police briefing, but civilian response, the four, I thought we already funded the civilian responders. They're asking for four more. Is that correct? And right. can you uh, just remind me why we need more, or What what's inadequate right now? The council funded 12 in the last annual budget. These additional four would be 16. Those are the civilian positions. There's also a sworn officer lieutenant that acts as the director of the program. The council's audit uh, in 2021 concluded that based on calls for service the prior year, so calls for service have gone up, but at that time, there were enough calls for service for 20 
civilian responders to take those calls, okay. which were estimated to be about 14,000 uh, 14, individual work hours. Um, and it was traffic enforcement and homelessness and older crime reports where there were no active leads. Mm -hmm. Are there, are those 12 already filled? I believe it's 10 or 11 of them are filled. I think one of them there, they had a candidate and they, they dropped out. So okay. mostly filled. They are operating. They began operating in March after going through training. And they do have... Right now, it's promising that the data that they have is promising of what their uh, the services they're providing. I mean, it's it's valuable for both the police side of the house, the homeless side of the house, the hospital side of the house, everything. So, but the promise it is promising service, and and, and I think this is a, a vital to our downtown. And this is goal. nine months of funding for those four. It's nine or ten months. I'm uh, ten months probably. Okay, probably ten. All right, that answers my question. Thank you. All right, council members, any other questions? Uh, I think the big question today is if there are things that are missing, it's probably the right time to add them in. Um, if not, well, I mean, of course we can do anything up until the last day, but we might drive these nice people crazy if we do. I think our next um, big discussion on this will probably be next not maybe maybe some discussion this Thursday. Thursday um most of the discussion next Thursday. Thursday okay and that might help actually to have some time between today and the next time we talk about it just so that Will we, we have know our like actual new growth numbers and stuff like that by then no. not until okay. June 8th which is okay. very frustrating <laughs> so all right dang it um okay uh, I guess what I'll say is, is thank you for, for this. It, it's helpful for me to see the breadth, the full scope of what council members have been interested in adding or subtracting. Um, I think what I'm going to be doing is looking at these and trying to prioritize which ones. I, I don't see any, hardly any of them, especially now that we've crossed a few off. I don't know that there's any that I think are bad ideas, but trying to figure out, okay, if I have to choose between one and two, I'm going to, I'm going to try and prioritize these. So uh, hopefully that'll be our next discussion is. And I can print out a few new versions since we've deleted some yeah, items that that would be helpful. So I'll do that. Oh, and they yeah. have a timestamp at the top. So, <laughs> okay. I think that's it for this item. Then we are, we have two written briefings. So take a look at those insurance and risk management budget and the finance department budget. Those are doing being done as written briefings this year because the changes are not huge. Um, report and chair, chair and vice chair. I do not have a report. Okay. We do have an announcement from executive director. Hey, very quickly. Um, this coming uh, Thursday, is it this week? No, this is next. This week. is next week. Sorry. Um, next week on Thursday, could the council please meet at 1 p.m.? We have several uh, scheduling conflicts, and so we would need to be done by um, before 6 p.m. So 5.30. 5.30. Okay. So we have two council members here who have said yes. Yes. Okay. Um, when I voted for this and when we were talking earlier i thought that i had a trial on this day that was going to get canceled but it's going so i won't be here that day at all but, oh at all yeah but in the but i'll i mean i'll come when the trial ends but i don't know when that will be but i don't have a problem with you ending it at one or starting it at one but i'll have we to make excuse sure... myself for 45 minutes for a meeting for work but it's virtual so. um so council members, could you look at the list of items scheduled? And if there's anything specific, then we can try and move that to the point in the agenda where you're most likely to be available. Can we do that? Um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's as we get toward the end of the budget, it's a little difficult to proceed without anyone because it's all starting to intertwine. I mean, Jennifer, I think definitely yeah. unresolved issues is going to be hard that day if we don't have most of us there. And I think the attorney's office will be difficult because it, that's where some of those funding requests are. Are 
it's too late to switch things between this Thursday and next Thursday, right? We've already, it's too late. It's too late for that. Yeah. There's also um, a few of the unresolved issues. We just don't have the information, information yet. yet. Yeah. So sorry. We, sorry. we can just maybe give us more information as you know it. So okay. we know that council member Wharton has a trial um, and then council member Petro, when you know your time. Uh, two to 2.45. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, Mr. Chair. Yes. Councilmember Pui is also online. If oh, Councilmember Pui, check this. If you, could, I am online. Yes. Can you make it at one p.m. on Thursday, June first, um, with the goal of ending by five or five thirty that day, for some conflicts? What else could I be doing? I don't know. You have a lot of things going on. I know I, I I blocked it already, so I'm ready. Okay, me okay. too. So I'm I'm fine starting that time. Okay. Dugan, you're fine. And Valdemoros, you're okay. What time do you need to be done that day, though? Five thirty would be okay. Okay. Starting at one p.m. One to five thirty on the June first. And maybe this is a good time to remind everyone to check their calendars for the next Thursday meeting, because that will also be important for June 8th. So we have the, the next three Thursdays, including two days from now, there will right. be council meetings. Although the Thursday, two days from now will be a very short one, a short or not one. a very short one, but a shorter one. Okay. Short meeting in two days. So the next three Thursdays, block your I calendar. get a note from council staff to all of my community councils. Yes. <laughs> All right, you a doctor's note. Yeah. <laughs> a doctor's note. <laughs> we hope to have the final property tax numbers on the 8th. So that would be a good day because if we want to adopt on the 13th, we need to finalize things on the 8th. That's why that Thursday. 13th is the following two. So theoretically, well, not theoretically, it's not theoretical. We have one, two, three, four, five meetings from today. We will be adopting this budget on the fifth meeting from today. The fifth yes. meeting from today. Okay. And and the eighth is also just a work session, right? Starting at one or two. The eighth is uh, the eighth is a Thursday. Um, the I think we could probably talk with the chair based on how the discussion the sixth is a formal meeting. The right? sixth is a full work session and formal meeting day. Maybe based on how the discussions go on the sixth, we could figure out how early we need to start on the eighth. Right now, but right now we're scheduled for the two, but we could start it early at one. Right. And, and that would calendars. just go until we have to. That's the that's the last day unless we want to adopt later. Yeah. Which is there is still that possibility. There is. Yeah. But we would like not to. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair. Yes. Just a, um, just a special announcement. I have cafecito with Anna tomorrow at the oh. Green Loop here on Second East and Fourth South. Thank you. For those that would like to come and ask me questions about budget or District Four or anything city related, I'll be there at six p.m. with coffee, lemonade, maybe something to eat. But come check it out because we need everybody's feedback on this green loop pilot project. Cool. I love that. What time? 6 p.m. tomorrow, okay. Wednesday. Thank All right. You. We're not done yet, council members. We are going to adjourn from work session and have a special limited formal meeting. I don't need a motion, do I? Do I need a different link? Sorry, Mr. Chair. I don't think we need a different link, do we? No, we're staying in this link. Okay. Thank you. So um work session is adjourned welcome to our special limited formal meeting if you're just tuning in this is a special limited formal meeting which means it is not a standard formal meeting which means there's no general comment and we only have one business one item on our agenda which is to adopt a consent agenda the next full public meeting will be on tuesday june 6 at 7 p.m and that will will have an opportunity for public comments on agenda item topics as well as general comment the council always welcomes public comments by mailing us at PO Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84114, or emailing council.comments at slcgov.com, or by calling our 24-hour comment line 801-535-7654. There is no public hearing, no potential action, no comments, no new business, and no unfinished business, which brings us to our consent agenda, and I will look for a motion. Move for approval. Second.
I I I think I heard Councilor Pui move motion and Council Member Valdemoro second. Any discussion to this motion? Seeing none, I uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That passes unanimously six to zero with Councilmember Fowler absent. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you. Bye.